still an even Stephen race, or is that something that he ends up having yeah. a double digit? So let's watch North Carolina. Okay. That's a poll close call. It's a poll closing state at 730. Okay. And let's just see as the vote comes in in North Carolina. Texas, as we've talked about earlier, it's going to be a state that I'm watching. I'm actually a native Texan. Oh, so this is personal as it well. Is, it is personal. <laughs> uh, but our NBC Marist poll that we ended up having showed Bernie Sanders with a double digit lead over Joe Biden okay. in the Lone Star State. If he holds on to that, maybe not a whole lot of momentum for Joe Biden. But all of a sudden, if that is a single digit race, you yeah. can see how the presidential contest in the span of a few days moved from a double digit lead for Bernie Sanders in the Lone Star State to maybe something in the single digit. So I'm are, watching. Those are the two states I'm watching. And there are a whole lot of delegates up for grabs in Texas. Absolutely. But it's also important to note, it's just not the number of delegates. It's actually how they're divided. Yes. You know, it's proportional. And so you might end up winning a race and, you know, getting winning a race 42 percent to 48 percent. You split up the delegates. Right. You end up accruing really big delegates by if you win a state by 20, 30, 40 points. Sure. As we saw Joe Biden in South Carolina, that's how you end up really yes. gaining a lot of delegates. And so it's all about the margins. And so watch that tonight. Too. On the flip side, you could be uh, sec in second place closely and do pretty OK as well. Right. And also, we're going to be watching to see Elizabeth Warren, Michael Bloomberg, after spending some $200 million in TV ads and radio ads in these Super Tuesday states. Is he able to hit 15 percent? threshold viability to be able to pick up super, uh, delegates. Same thing is true for Elizabeth Warren as well, too. And so that's one of going to be the storyline. We have to see with the vote coming in to see if they get threshold. But I, that's a, you know, we're talking about this Bernie versus Joe Biden race. But let's also watch to see what ends up happening to Elizabeth Warren and Mike Bloomberg, too. Oh, you, you bring it up, Mark. Of course, we've been talking so much about, you know, this being a two man race of sorts between Bernie and Biden. But if if anything has happened in the early voting states so far, we have seen a lot of surprises here. Certainly not off the table that we could see something unusual tonight. And at the end of the day, it's still about it, delegates. We might not be able to count them for a couple of weeks, and you can have me back on uh, March 17th <laughs> when we're actually in the uh, Florida primary time, but we'll still be counting the delegates from California and other places. But still, you know, when the dust has settled, to me, the most important thing is just to count up to see where we are when it comes to delegates, because those are the delegates going into the convention who would end up deciding the Democratic nominee. We saw so many, or not, I shouldn't say so many, but we saw couple of candidates dropping out before they even got to Super Tuesday. Uh a lot of people wondering if after Super Tuesday we could lose some candidates, but is it unlikely that we would see anyone making that kind of a decision in the next day or two, as you said, because we may not have the total delegate hall for a while? That's true, but I think the earlier we would be able to have is at least, are you hitting Indications. that 15% threshold? So you're getting nothing. And so for Elizabeth Warren and Mike Bloomberg, if you're not at 15% in the Super Tuesday states, but by the way, one-third of all delegates are up for grabs yeah. tonight. If you're not hitting in these states across the country, you're in pretty uh, deep trouble. All right. We'll keep an eye on that, Mark. Thank you so much for all of your insights tonight. It's been great. Th thanks, Alex. Great to see you. The most crowded Democratic field in modern American history now down to just five candidates. But right now it's looking like a two person race between Senator Bernie Sanders and former Vice President Joe Biden. They offer two starkly different visions for the party's future. President Trump weighing in on Biden and Bernie earlier today at the White House. The Democrat establishment is trying to take it away from Bernie Sanders. There's no question about that in my mind. Now, look, a lot's going to be learned tonight. We'll see how well Biden does. We'll see how well Sanders does. Our NBC team is all over the country tonight. Let's start with NBC News political reporter Shaquille Brewster. He is covering the Sanders campaign in Sanders' home state of Vermont. And Shaq, Sanders is the front runner, but Joe Biden is having a pretty strong week coming off of South Carolina. How is the Sanders campaign feeling tonight? That's right. You know, Vice President Biden had that bigger than expected win in South Carolina. And then since then, he's been raking up these big endorsements, three former uh, rivals. Uh, you have the congressional endorsements coming from uh, for Vice President Biden. So Vice President Biden is coming into this with some momentum. What you're hearing from the Sanders campaign is two different things. Number one, they say early voting, early voting in many of these states. You look at California, you look at Texas, you look at Minnesota, where early voting started before the Iowa caucuses. Even they believe that early voting helped 
lock in some of that support for Senator Sanders and help limit any rise or bump or surge that Vice President Biden would be able to have at this point. So they're, that's what they're looking at and saying, yes, he's had so, uh, Vice President Biden has some momentum at this point, but that surge is being limited because of the early voting, the significant and high early voting that you're seeing in many of these states. The second point that you're hearing from Senator Sanders is, while he knows he didn't get the endorsements of Amy Klobuchar, or Pete Buttigieg, or Beto O'Rourke, he is making a direct appeal to the supporters of those candidates. He was in uh, Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota, yesterday, where he said and started his comments, started this big rally with praise for those candidates and said, hey, we may have our differences, but if you support these candidates, you are welcome into our movement. He said, come on in. The door is open. He said, if you believe in a government that's about justice rather than greed, his movement is the one for you. And that is, has been the consistent message that you've been hearing from Senator Sanders since these endorsements. He's not engaging in the back and forth. I'll tell you behind the scenes, his aides and advisors are saying these are essentially politicians endorsing other politicians. This is not going to have the impact of uh, uh, that you've seen in with endorsements throughout the race or before in the months before uh, the Super Tuesday. But what you're seeing is the campaign and Senator Sanders himself trying his best to welcome in the supporters, hoping that at least some of them come to his campaign rather than that of Vice President Biden's. Allison. So Shaq, what does Bernie Sanders need to do tonight to cement that front runner status? Well, it's all about delegates. His mm -hmm. campaign believes tonight is a critical opportunity for them to establish a clear delegate lead. Right now, Senator Sanders has the delegate lead. He has had that lead since Iowa. It's a small lead right now. When you have one third of all uh, delegates available happening and coming out on one day, that's a big opportunity for Senator Sanders. And by the way, he's playing on turf that the campaign feels favorable about. Think about California. He spent a lot of time in California. Why is that? Because his coalition is based on Latino voters, is based on young voters, is based on progressive voters. California is full of those, full of voters who are considered his base. He feels very strong about a state like California, and polling has indicated he can do well. California has the most delegates awarded uh, in the country and will be rewarding or awarding the most delegates tonight. He feels good about that, and that's why you've been seeing him spend so much time in California. Remember, there was Nevada where he had that big win right before South Carolina. Where was he the day of the Nevada caucuses? He was in Texas trying to aim and target Latino voters there. His campaign feels like he can really have an opportunity to have a clear delegate lead that will then establish him as the clear front runner in this race. That's what their goal is tonight. I, I spoke to one advisor who said if they win more than half of the states, they feel like they'll be in a good position. So that's what we'll be watching for to see, uh, despite Vice President Biden's momentum, what actually happens with the votes and where these states land. Allison? All right, we'll see what happens tonight. Shaq Brewster in Burlington, Vermont. Thank you so much. Joe Biden going after the moderate vote on Super Tuesday. He came into today with endorsements from his former competition, NBC News correspondent Mike Memoli, live from Los Angeles. And Mike, those endorsements, Amy Klobuchar, Beto O'Rourke, Pete Buttigieg, they all threw their weight behind Joe Biden. Even former FBI Director James Comey endorsing Biden on Twitter to the Biden campaign's chagrin. But endorsements aren't delegates. Do these endorsements <laughs> matter? Well, these endorsements matter in this respect. It's symbolic of what's happening in the party right now. The Biden campaign was always at its strongest when he was owning the, the moderate lane of the party. If you remember, go back to early stages of this race when the field was much more crowded, it seemed that there were more candidates making a play for the Bernie Sanders wing, the more progressive wing of the party, than were doing that in the Joe Biden wing. As the race progressed, you saw the likes of Amy Klobuchar, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, uh, starting to gain momentum as they realized that there was a better path to the nomination in the Joe Biden lane. And so as we get to this stage in the primary where the African-American vote especially is so critical, Joe Biden is the one who has demonstrated he has the most support in that category. And as those other candidates in the moderate lane dropped out, they're throwing their weight around Joe Biden. That's a, that's a symbol of the consolidation mm -hmm. that's happening here as the party gets worried about Bernie Sanders as the potential nominee. And so I'm listening to my good friend Shaq, who's talking about how the, the Sanders campaign is raising expectations for tonight in some ways, talking a very confident game. The Biden campaign has been very happy to, to let the expectations be where they are, which is that Bernie Sanders is going to have a, a good night. They feel that the momentum that they've showed over the last few days as these uh, endorsements mm -hmm. are, are just a, a small part of uh, is putting them on, on tap for a good night after all. 
uh, endorsements. And then, of course, there's also money, Mike. And Biden says he's raised $33 million in the last month. Where is that money going to go? A lot of it on TV. That's <laughs> that's really the name of the game, especially as we move forward here. Uh, the Biden campaign is already putting some of that money to use in the next round of states. Sometimes I, I call it Super Tuesday, too. Uh, but the most the focus at this point are on three of those states, Michigan, Mississippi and Missouri. Mississippi is interesting, of course, uh, because it's another one of those states which has uh, a high concentration of African-American voters. Uh, you're, you see a number of them at play here on Super Tuesday tonight where the Biden campaign thinks they're going to do well. Of course, South Carolina, they feel like was a real example of what's going to happen uh, across the country among the African-American vote, where Biden really uh, trounced his rivals in that category. So that's one state they feel like they can really rack up a huge delegate margin. Michigan is an important one. Joe Biden has a real connection for, for Michigan. He's always styled himself as a working class, middle class guy, and Michigan is very much a state in that genre. He also uh, was a leading voice in the Obama administration for the auto industry bailout. So that's why they're putting money on the air in Detroit. I think that'll be a part of the message. The ad that we've already seen them put on the air includes President Obama in his own voice talking about how Joe Biden was a champion of that auto industry bailout. And then Missouri is just another interesting state where there is a, a good concentration both of rural vote uh, in the Missouri part of Missouri and <laughs> a strong African-American vote in Kansas City and St. Louis, the Missouri part of Missouri. Uh, and that's sort of their focus yeah. going forward and we're going to start seeing a lot of money pour in. Mike, Joe Biden's obviously trying to get the moderate vote here, but Bloomberg is still in the race. And today is the first time we'll see his name on the ballots. What kind of impact could he potentially have? Well, a few weeks ago, I think there was a much bigger concern on the Biden mm -hmm. team uh, part about the role Mike Bloomberg was playing in this race. Uh, but they're a little bit more confident about what's going to end up happening here. And it has to do with what happened to Tom Steyer in South Carolina. Uh, Mike Bloomberg wasn't on the ballot in South Carolina. I think Biden campaign probably is glad that he wasn't uh, because he was sort of peaking uh, in, among African-American voters at the time uh, leading into South Carolina, especially with those ads that showed him alongside Barack Obama, made it look like he was the one who was Barack Obama's vice president. But what happened to Tom Steyer, he spent a lot of money, more than $20 million in South Carolina, more than anybody else in the field. And what ended up happening on primary night? It could be because of the Clyburn endorsement or it could be just a natural uh, uh, progression back to the candidate that the African-American voters knew the best, which is Joe Biden. Uh, but Tom Steyer fell off the map. And so the Biden campaign feels much more confident that that's going to be what happens to Mike Bloomberg tonight. Mike Bloomberg today was a little bit defensive, if you heard him uh, at a news conference he held earlier. Yeah. You know, he was asked if some of the vote, if he's taking votes away from Biden, uh, it's actually, he said, I'm no, maybe he's taking votes away from me. <laughs> Biden laughed it off when he was asked about that today. So that shows the confidence in the Biden campaign right now. Yeah, when they're laughing, that means they're not all too stressed. Mike Memley in Los Angeles, thank you so much. Thanks, Elson. As we've been saying, Mike Bloomberg is on the ballots for the first time today, and he's admitting that a contested convention might be his only path forward. NBC News political reporter Gabe Gutierrez is in Florida covering the Bloomberg campaign. Allison, this is one of 16 Bloomberg field offices throughout the state of Florida, and the campaign is ramping up here in the Sunshine State. The primary here is just two weeks away, but the Bloomberg campaign is also banking on a strong showing on Super Tuesday, the first time that he will be on the ballot. Of course, he skipped several of the primaries up until now, but Bloomberg has been spending about half a billion dollars trying to make a dent in this race. Now, earlier today, I spoke with him at a campaign uh, office in Miami, and I asked him with Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar dropping out whether he would coalesce behind Joe Biden. He shot back and he says that it was time for Democrats to coalesce around him. He also admitted for the first time uh, today that there is no path uh, uh, to victory for him unless it's through a contested convention. Certain Democrats have uh, come back and criticized him for that, saying that that would fracture the party. But Bloomberg is defiant. He's saying that he's still staying in this race, that he's in it to win it. And that, frankly, we haven't seen any results from Super Tuesday yet. So in his view, uh, there's still a possibility that he could turn this around. But again, he is facing an uphill battle with Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg showing their, uh, throwing their support behind Joe Biden and Biden 
Biden's campaign surging in places, including here in Florida. Now, Bloomberg today also stopped by Orlando, where he uh, stopped by the uh, Pulse nightclub, the site of that deadly shooting that killed dozens of people uh, several years ago. Bloomberg uh, say, saying that... Um, uh, or mentioning an issue that is very close to his heart, gun restrictions, and something that uh, he certainly plans to talk about quite a bit throughout the next coming days here in Florida. Now, this morning in Miami, he also blasted Bernie Sanders, criticizing him for his recent comments that he had made about Fidel Castro, and saying that those type of comments it won't uh, make it possible for a Democrat like Bernie Sanders to carry the state of Florida. Of course, of course, a critical victory uh, that any Democrat would need in order to win the White House. But again, today, Allison, Michael Bloomberg admitting that um, a contested convention, that there's really no other way for him to win the nomination unless there's a contested convention. But he says that Joe Biden at this point is taking voters away from him. He is resisting calls to drop out of this race. Allison. Last year, North Carolina redrew its electoral map, so voting in the state looks a little bit different in 2020. One place that's especially feeling the impact, North Carolina A&T University. It's the largest historically black college in the country. NBC News Now correspondent Dasha Burns is on campus today talking to voters. Can I ask who you voted for? I voted for Bernie Sanders. Um, yes, I voted Bernie Sanders. Um, Bernie Sanders. My man Joe Biden. I had to, I had to choose him. I wanted somebody who's going to be for the people. I've seen the movement on campus, the Bernie 2020, and that's just seemed to be more relevant. Um, or the only candidate that has came and uh, just made a big impact on our campus. Yeah, having Medicare for all, I think that'd be a good idea. So that's why I kind of like Bernie, Bernie Sanders. So health care is a huge issue for you? Yes. And then bringing everything together, like with dental and eye care, bringing that all into medical as well is, is a big issue for me. Is there anything you want to see in a presidential candidate that you were thinking about when you were casting your ballot? Uh, well, a president that actually cares about the people and says what he's going to do, or she. I'm not, I'm not going to be sexist here. But, uh, yeah, those two things are the biggest things for me. Do you feel like... Bernie Sanders represents that at all? I feel like out of all of them, he does it the best. Why was Joe Biden your guy? I seen how he worked with Obama really well, and I was like, I kind of want somebody like that in office. He's like he's a guy who's going to be looking out for everybody's best interests. So. Joe Biden has seen a big surge recently. Is he a candidate you would consider? Um, no. Only because, like I said, he's a... Uh, I can't, I can't vote for somebody who, who's trying to run off of being somebody's right-hand man. Like, what, what are you doing for yourself to make yourself stand out besides being Obama's right-hand man? And Dasha's with me live now from a polling site on campus. Dasha, how's voting going there with these new electoral maps? Hey, Allison. Well, some quick history on those electoral maps. For about 10 years, this campus was split down the middle into two different districts, effectively diluting the student voice. And uh, students here fought that. And, and North Carolina A&T is now, with these new maps, back in the same congressional district. But that doesn't mean that voting challenges here on campus are over. For example, right now, you can basically see tumbleweeds on this campus. There is nobody around because the school is on spring break. So so spring break and Super Tuesday lining up, not really a great way uh, to get students out to vote. So some of the students we talked to actually fought really hard to get an early voting site here on campus. They were successful in that fight and it really worked. Um, there were over 1,600 early votes cast here on campus uh, before students went off to party on a beach somewhere for spring break. And and just for, for reference, back in 2016, between the two precincts that represent this campus, there were just about 580 ballots cast. So really huge early voting turnout uh, made that, that early voting site made a really big difference because today at this uh, this polling site in this room behind me here, only about 40 votes cast, but 1,600 plus um, in early voting. So that made a big difference. But Allison, although this campus is, is now in the same congressional district, it's still split into two different precincts, which means this is just one of two uh, uh, different polling sites for this campus, which also has made things a little bit more confusing for people. And one of the volunteers we were talking to said the early voting site, which was in a different building on campus, has also led to some confusion. A lot of people today going to that 
uh, building where the early voting site was instead of to the actual polling site for Super Tuesday for today. He said um, there were about 30 people that went there and never made their way here. So most likely just gave up after they couldn't find where the, the polling site actually was. So some things have changed and improved. The, the, the gerrymandering issue is, is no longer on this campus, but there are still some, some challenges to, to get students um, and these community members uh, to, to the right place and, and to, to get them to make their voice heard, Allison. So, Dasha, I know you've been there for a bit talking to people on campus. How do the students feel about the Democratic ballot, uh, candidates on the ballot today and about the general election overall coming up in November? Allison, I got to say, um, this is a very politically active campus, so people are yes. engaged, people are very knowledgeable, but they are not very enthusiastic about the options uh, in front of them. Some have gone so far as to say that they're pretty darn disappointed, actually. And there are a lot of Bernie supporters. The vast majority of students I've talked to um, have voted for Bernie Sanders, but even with him, some are excited about him, but others say, look, he's just sort of the best of the bunch. They're, they're not necessarily proud to be voting for him, but they feel like he does represent them maybe a little bit more so than the other candidates. And when it comes to the general election, uh, there's been a split opinion among students. Some say, look, we, we want to see a change in the White House, so we are going to vote for whoever that nominee is. But others, and, and maybe even I've heard, I've heard this opinion more, others say they will not be voting for a candidate that they do not believe in, which means if it's someone like Joe Biden, for example, students have told me if it's Biden versus Trump in November, they will come out to vote, but they will likely write in another name, likely Bernie Sanders, rather than cast their vote for someone who doesn't line up with their ideals. All right, Dasha Burns in North Carolina. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Colorado's first presidential primary in 16 years today, the state switching from a caucus. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz is in Denver, where some voters are having a last minute change of heart. Hey, Allison. Yeah, this is the lunch crowd here in Denver, Colorado. You've got the check-in right here. This is where people come in and check. Uh, this is where they get a number and they sit here. Now, if they already have their ballot and they just want to drop it off, there's a ballot box over there. But if they're waiting uh, for that ballot, they come here, they take a number, they go up to this desk, and then they're able to vote here. Now, a lot of people have questions. And some of the questions that we keep hearing over and over again is, what do you do if you voted for Amy Klobuchar or you voted for Pete Buttigieg on your ballot, and then you want to change your vote? today and we had this conversation a little bit a little bit ago outside we both had the the yeah. same kind of yeah. issue we, uh, we both yeah, voted I, for Pete th early yeah threw my vote away you know yeah <laughs> so you voted for Pete and you walked it in or you mailed it in I walked way it early in. Yeah. okay yeah. yeah just the day before and and you procrastinated, procrastinated a little bit procrastinated typical uh, young guy procrastinated a little <laughs> bit and I uh, brought my bound here and I was like can I still turn this in all ripped up now, here is what they're being told. If they've already sent out their ballot, that ballot is uh, gone and they're basically out of luck. But if they still have their ballot, they can either rip up their ballot or they can come over here and it says if you make a mistake, it's basically the same thing. So if you filled out for Amy Klobuchar, you would cross that out like they do here and then you would just fill it in for the candidate that you are uh, now supporting. So kind of an easy fix. Uh, a lot of people disappointed that already sent out their votes, uh, but it's just something that we're seeing out here in Denver. So far, the people that we've talked to, uh, like those two, said that they are voting for uh, Joe Biden. However, the support out here in Denver, Colorado, and Colorado in general, has Bernie Sanders as a frontrunner. Back to you, Allison. She hasn't done better than a third place finish in any of the early voting states so far, but Elizabeth Warren says she is staying in this race. NBC News political reporter Ali Vitali is covering the Warren campaign in Detroit. And Ali, we know Warren voted earlier today in her home state of Massachusetts. Now you're following her campaign in Detroit. Why Michigan tonight? Yeah, Michigan is not one of those Super Tuesday states, but Michigan is going to be a state that's going to the polls just a week from now on March 10th. And so Elizabeth Warren, when I caught up with her this morning, because she started her day, as I did, in Massachusetts, voting for herself at a polling place in Cambridge, I asked her, why Michigan tonight? What should we read into that? She said that's just where the schedule had her next. But there is a strategy to this. The Warren campaign has said that they're in this for the long haul. The way that her campaign manager phrased it is that Milwaukee, the Democratic National 
convention is their, quote, final play. And so tonight on Super Tuesday in those states that are voting, they're trying to pick up as many delegates as possible. But where we are here in Detroit, it's also about planting the flag and looking ahead and showing that they're in this for the long haul. Ali Warren has said she won't get out of the race before the convention. Is there any Super Tuesday outcome, though, that you think could change that? Look, Allison, I don't have my political crystal ball. I wish I did. But I think at this point in the mm -hmm. campaign, everything moves so quickly. Yeah. We watched even, take Pete Buttigieg, for example. He was on Meet the Press the morning that he dropped out, saying that he was going to be in this race through Super Tuesday. Right. And then just hours later, ended his campaign. That's what this season is in the political game. We're watching people start coalescing around Joe Biden. I asked Elizabeth Warren about that when I talked to her this morning. She said there were no surprises to her in the people who endorse Joe Biden. She's going to keep plugging along. But depending on what happens tonight, the big number for the Warren campaign is 15 percent across all of these Super Tuesday states. That's the number that they need to hit to be viable, to pick up delegates for their strategy to actually bear fruit. And so if that doesn't happen, there might be a reassessment in strategy. And if it does happen, then I think that the plan will be just to keep on keeping on, even as I know that there's pressure mounting for anyone not named Sanders or Biden to get out of this race, but the Elizabeth Warren campaign ignoring that, blinders on, full speed ahead with their strategy. Ali, speaking of Sanders, some Bernie Sanders supporters want Warren to drop out. What are they saying? They want her to drop out, of course, because the plan for the Bernie Sanders campaign is to try to coalesce that right. progressive wing of the party. Elizabeth Warren's plan has always been to sort of be a third option between that so-called moderate and so-called progressive lane. That's the role that she's trying to play, a bridge between those two lanes, if you will. But at the same time, if she's eating into Bernie Sanders' support, which they both do pull from that progressive pool of voters, it's also a good time to remember that voters don't necessarily decide by lane logic. Just because, for example, someone supported Amy Klobuchar or Pete Buttigieg, candidates who you and I would probably talk about as more moderate candidates right. in relation to Bernie Sanders and even Elizabeth Warren, it doesn't mean that those voters aren't considering Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. In fact, if you look at polling data, Elizabeth Warren frequently shows up as the top second choice option across the other candidates in the field. That's something her campaign points to often and something that they're hoping comes into play tonight because with those candidates now out of the race, right. they're hoping that she can be the second choice for people who originally support the Klobuchar's and the Buddha judges. Allie, we will wait to see if she ends up being that second choice for those people. Ali Vitale in Michigan, yeah. thank you so much. Thanks. NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki has the latest exit polls. He just ran through the numbers on MSNBC. Let's take a look. Here we go. We've got exit poll data that's starting to come in. It's starting to give us a sense of what that electorate out there today looks like. The folks going to the polls, what are some of their demographic characteristics? There's a lot we can show you. I want to start on this one, though, because last Saturday in South Carolina, this is a number that stood out at me. The share of the electorate, when you ask this question of Democratic voters, should the next president's policies be a return to Barack Obama's or should they be a change in either a more liberal or conservative direction? And why this stood out to me is last Saturday, when we had those dramatic developments in South Carolina, it was the highest number we had seen in the primaries to date. And that number was 53 in South Carolina. And you're seeing this is the southeast tonight. And the number you're seeing in the southeast on this question is 50. That is very close, obviously, to the number we saw in South Carolina over the weekend. And that gets to one of the biggest questions coming in tonight. Was South Carolina a harbinger for Joe Biden of what was to come in the broader South tonight? That's one of the key components he's going to need if he's going to have the kind of delegate night he's hoping for. So take a look. That's what we're seeing in the exit poll on this question. How would that translate? What would that mean when you start looking at the map tonight? So looking at this way, in yellow, you're going to see here, these are the states that are up tonight. This is sort of the southeast region right here. These are the states we're including in that exit poll. Biden tonight. If he could get South Carolina-like numbers in some of the areas around here, he could start racking up delegates here. That is something that was very much in question a few days ago. That would be one component he needs. The story, you mentioned this, before South Carolina, everybody in the world assumed that at the end of tonight, Bernie Sanders would have a big delegate lead, hundreds of delegates. But if Biden can run up numbers down here, if he can be close, if he can be about even in Texas, that would be one of his campaign's goals. If he can make 
The viability threshold, you'll hear about that a lot tonight in California, be over 15 percent in collecting delegates. And if he can do that in big states like Massachusetts and Minnesota as well, he has a chance to be competitive in that delegate race with Bernie Sanders at the end of tonight. And if you just think back to a week ago, when everybody would have guessed Biden is down 300 or 400, the question a week ago was, how big will Bernie Sanders' lead be after Super Tuesday tonight? The question coming in tonight is a new one. Will Bernie Sanders have a delegate lead after Super Tuesday? Steve, can I ask you... um a little bit of an extrapolation question on that delegate math. We've heard so much discussion, so much punditry, so much like, frankly, agita from Democrats <laughs> about the prospect that nobody's going to have a majority heading into the convention, that no candidate will have actually technically locked up the nomination. It might have to be decided at the convention. Those projections, that expectation, is that changing at all based on where we are in the delegate math tonight and on what the sort of revised expectations are for tonight? Yeah, well, that is a question we're going to see, and it very much has to do. When I mentioned the viability threshold a minute ago, we might as well put that out there right now. This number, 15. Every time I show you a result tonight, whether I'm showing you a statewide result, a congressional district result, pay attention to which candidates are above and below 15 percent. There's an assumption that Sanders is probably going to be over it pretty much everywhere. There's now an assumption that Biden's probably going to be pretty much over it elsewhere. But when it comes to Warren and when it comes to uh, to Bloomberg, are they running above 15 percent? If so, they're starting to collect delegates. Are they running above 15 in California? They can get a lot of delegates. Texas, they can get a lot of delegates. Is Warren winning her home state of Massachusetts? She can get a lot of delegates. If you want to talk about a brokered convention scenario coming out of tonight, it would depend on Warren and Bloomberg at the very least hitting that threshold in a lot of places and being able to collect hundreds of delegates rather than dozens of delegates. All right, and here to talk more about tonight's exit polls, NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. And Mark, we heard Steve there gone through a lot of the the viability threshold, Mm -hmm. the numbers, what it could look like for Joe Biden. But we're also in these exit polls learning a lot about what voters are thinking, about their ideologies, about the policies that they'd like to see in the next president. I'd love to talk to you a little bit about those things in terms of ideology of the voters uh, who are turning up tonight. What are we hearing? Yeah, so in the combined Super Tuesday states we have exit polls from, we know that six in 10 of Democratic primary voters say that they're liberal. But what's important to note is that there are different kinds of liberals. Yeah. We end up having 26% who say that they are very liberal. But then you have 36% who say that they're somewhat liberal. In 2016, when I ended up looking at the exit polls, mm-hmm. that somewhat liberal was a really nice battleground between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. Okay. And so far, what we've actually ended up seeing in the Iowa, New, uh, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina results mm-hmm. is, again, that very liberal is a good battleground. The poll also ends up showing that 37 percent are moderate or conservative. And so if this becomes a one versus one, one on one race between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, you can end up seeing how the very liberal versus the mm-hmm. moderate rack up and then them fighting over the somewhat liberals. But this is a liberal electorate. But it's important to note those differences there. Yeah, it's, it's curious to see where they shift because mm-hmm. that could tell you a whole lot. How about the kind of policies, the types of policies they're looking for in the next president? So when we actually end up looking at Bernie Sanders' signature Medicare for all, Mm -hmm. we end up seeing majorities who end up saying that they are fine with a government plan that replaces people's health insurance. Now, a lot of folks would often say the way that this exit poll is written is a very favorable one for Bernie Sanders and his supporters actually shows you how it's getting majority support. It's not saying if you take away someone's health care that they actually might answer answer a little bit differently. But Bernie Sanders supporters actually kind of look at that and say, say, hey, See, more than half of the Democratic electorate is fine with Bernie Sanders' idea. And so you're actually able to kind of, that's mm-hmm. something that I could say. What we're only seeing, though, is the responses from Democratic primary voters. We're not necessarily seeing general election voters and what they end up doing. Right. And normally the national polls that I've sh- seen show that the overall Medicare for all polls in the 40 to 45 percent mm-hmm. and that it doesn't get that that majority national support because Republicans and independents are down on it. All right. I keep asking you to tell us what you're looking for tonight because each time you have something a little bit different. But what should people be watching for tonight? Of course, as we uh, Steve reminded them, you definitely want to be looking at that viability threshold, which is 15 percent. If you're under that, you're not getting any delegates. Yeah, I'm going to go with something that Steve was talking about at the very beginning and that return to Obama policy. Okay. And he was showing in the southeast yes. only. And again, you know, that's only one part of the country. But what but, I'm going to be looking for is in all the different states. To me, that do you want to continue Barack Obama's policies? Do you want to go in a more liberal mm-hmm. direction? 
direction to me seems to be the epitomizes the Joe Biden versus yeah. Bernie Sanders divide on what they actually want to do. And so was, when I'm looking at each individual state and seeing how they're doing, that is a really good guide to be able to, to end up doing. So one other one other state that yeah. I am going to be interested in, and it's a relatively early poll close call, and that's Arkansas. And why why would we look at you Arkansas? You haven't brought this one up I yet. All right, I'm ready. I brought this up, but here's why. Michael Bloomberg spent $3 million wow. there, pretty much had the state all to himself. The New York Times ended up quoting the chair of the Arkansas Democratic Party mm -hmm. saying, Joe Biden hasn't even shown up. He has no organization here whatsoever. To me, it is the perfect test case. And if the Joe Biden momentum is real, yeah. the guy doesn't even step in Arkansas and he wins it. That to me that says tells you a whole lot. lot huh? On yeah. the other hand, it would actually show me a whole lot too if Michael Bloomberg is able to do pretty well in a state like Arkansas where he was advertising pretty much all to himself and having those airwaves. And so to be able to look at the strength of Bloomberg versus maybe the momentum of Joe Biden, let's look at Arkansas. What an interesting state to watch. Mark Murray, thank you so Thanks, much. Allison. Let me be very clear. I just want to be clear. It's clear. Let me be clear. Special coverage begins tonight at 7. Oh, we get to have our very own Today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. On the East Coast, the polls are about to close in Virginia. NBC News correspondent Jeff Bennett is there tracking voter turnout. Hey, Allison, I'm at George Marshall High School in Falls Church, Virginia. It's one of the busiest polling places in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Already, according to an election official, the turnout here, the voter turnout, has surpassed 60% of what this place saw back in 2016. And look, back in 2016, this is a region where Hillary Clinton handily beat Bernie Sanders. At this polling place, beat him 64 to 35 percent. Now this time around, Bernie Sanders is working hard to win the Virginia vote, but really not here in the Northern Virginia area, but further south. He had a rally a couple days ago in Virginia Beach. But this region could really be called the home to the Democratic establishment. You've got the White House, the Pentagon, Capitol Hill, about a half hour's drive from here. A lot of government workers, military servicemen and women, and African-American voters live in this area. And it's one of the reasons why Michael Bloomberg and Joe Biden have been spending a lot of time and money in this region, hoping that the centrist Democrats here, who've helped tilt this Commonwealth from red to blue, during the Trump era will give their centrist bids a big boost. You've got 99 delegates up for grabs. This is the fourth largest of all of the Super Tuesday states that the candidates are competing in. And so it's one of the reasons why that the outcome here could really spell 
a, a larger outcome, a larger result across the rest of the Super Tuesday state cells. Texas, home to the second largest group of delegates tonight. Joe Biden had a strong lead in the polls there, but lost some ground after his disappointing showing in Iowa and New Hampshire. MSNBC correspondent Garrett Haig joins us now from a polling place there in Houston. Garrett, before we talk specifically about the Biden campaign, how's turnout been there so far today? It's been brisk. About 1,100 people have voted at just this location. I'm told it's typically the busiest location in all of Harris County, uh, which encompasses all of Houston and its suburbs. And because the Democrats won here in 2018, they actually changed the voting rules where you can vote at any vote center in the county. So for folks who might be watching this, don't worry about the two hour long line behind me. You can find other polling places in Harris County where the lines are shorter, but people have been turning out all day long. There's been sort of a standing two hour wait to get into just this one vote center. All right, so let's talk now about the Biden campaign. They could really use a win in Texas tonight. What has their strategy been there? Their strategy in Texas is similar to what it's been in other places, to try to pump up the vote as much as they can in parts of the state that are heavily African-American. That includes places like the 18th district here in Houston. That's Sheila Jackson Lee's district. That's Dallas County. That's a couple of other counties around the state. They're also trying to target some of the sort of suburban, ex-Republican, more moderate voters in places like where I'm at right now, Northwest Houston, the Dallas suburbs, Tarrant County, Collin County, some of the places that are more typically purple or red-ish that might be more favorable to a Joe Biden or a Mike Bloomberg. And, you know, that's not an accident that they had that giant mega rally in Dallas last night collecting those endorsements in the state's second largest media market. But really the combined Dallas, Fort Worth, Tarrant County suburbs is like one giant mega city and a great rich place to mine for votes if you're a Democratic candidate in that center lane. Let's talk a little bit more about the Democratic Party overall there in Texas. Garrett, how is the fight at the top of the ticket really affecting more down ballot candidates in that state? It's interesting. I mean, there are candidates in the mold of Bernie Sanders running for even some of the local mm -hmm. offices here. Remember, there's a Senate primary that's happening now for the right to take on John Cornyn. You've got sort of MJ Hagar kind of drafting off of Joe Biden. There's a, 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 a candidate named Christina Ramirez who's based in Austin, who's um, uh, endorsed by Justice Democrats, the Bernie Sanders more wing of the party. There's a Harris County uh, DA candidate here who's running as a, as a Bernie Sanders acolyte who's vowed to fire more prosecutors here in Harris County should she take control of that office here. So though there are there is that, that same division we see at the top of the ticket happening in a lot of these offices, although I will say notably less so in some of these congressional districts. Where you've got you know, here in Harris County, one district over from where I'm standing now, one in the Dallas area. Some of those red to blue districts where Democrats have flipped, uh, they're remaining quite unified there. Texas uh, trying to hold on to the gains they have made nationally on the congressional, on the congressional map. Lastly, Garrett, before I let you go, uh, you know so much about this area, not only because you're great at what you do, but also because you grew up not so far from there. Any hometown insight, your expectations tonight, anything we should know, uh, kind of insider scoop you got there? Uh, the Hake family votes are all split, I will tell you that. Uh, <laughs> but I can also tell you uh, one thing that I've sort of picked up on here a little bit. I know some people here, uh, some of my friends, some family actually, who voted for Michael Bloomberg. All of them voted early. In the entire time I've been out here today, I've not met anybody voting for Michael Bloomberg today. Texas has a very robust early voting system. It's still kind of new to Texans, but people are getting more used to it. Um, and so the difference between the early vote for candidates like Bloomberg and the folks who today, who maybe watched this Biden surge over the last couple of days, or who feel like they've come home to Bernie Sanders, you know, I'll be very interested to see what that split is between the early voters and those who are deciding in the last, uh, you know, 48 hours or so. Garrett, speaking of early voters, have you caught up with any folks or heard from any folks who said, my gosh, I voted early and the candidate that I voted for isn't in the race anymore? No, I mean, but you got to think if you voted early and you know your candidate's out, at least you're not waiting in this line today. But those down <laughs> ballot solace, votes right? still count. I mean, I think that's an important thing, actually, right? It's not like if you voted early and you voted for Pete Buttigieg, your ballot doesn't get thrown in the trash. Right. Your presidential preference doesn't count. But all of those down ballot votes, and take a look at all these signs behind me. I mean, there are literally yeah. dozens of other races that yeah, are Yeah, lots here. of them. All of your votes for those other races do still count. Garrett, it's incredible you pointed that out. I can't see a single presidential name behind you. A lot of other races, very important there in Texas. Garrett Hake, thank you so much. Thanks, Allison.
In a border state like Texas, immigration is one of the top issues of 2020. How will that sway Latinx voters in the state? MSNBC anchor Alicia Menendez is in El Paso with more. Ellison, we're at a polling location here in El Paso County where about 85 percent of the local population is Latino. This is a community that just seven months ago was rocked when a white nationalist came here on a shooting spree aimed at Latinos and Mexicans specifically, leaving 22 dead and 24 wounded. It's also a border town. We're just a few miles from Juarez, where the humanitarian crisis at our border is in sharp focus. And so the question today is, will those issues, combined with health care and the economy, drive up voter turnout? We've already seen, looking at early vote numbers, an increase, about 62 percent overall from 2016 numbers and 85 percent among Democratic primary voters. Will those numbers continue to grow as the polls here close? Allison? In California, our exit polls show that most voters chose their candidate in February or even earlier. NBC News correspondent Morgan Radford is at a polling place just outside Sacramento with a look at voter turnout. We are here at a voting center in Citrus Heights, California, and people have been lining up here at this voting center since 7 o'clock this morning. The lines have moved pretty quickly. But what's interesting is that when you think of California, you typically think of a deep blue state. Here in Citrus Heights, not the case. Most of the precincts in this area voted for Donald Trump back in 2016. So think of an area that's conservative with a little c. You have a lot of moderate voters here who are registered with the Democratic Party. And those moderate voters, they faced some pretty tough decisions in the last 72 hours. With Buttigieg and Klobuchar both dropping out, where does their vote go? It's not a guarantee that it goes to Joe Biden because Sanders has run a really thorough ground game here in California. In Sacramento County, it's 23 percent like Latino, and he's focused a lot of his efforts on that community. Also, there's the Bloomberg factor. Bloomberg has already put in $70 million worth of ad spending here in California alone ahead of Super Tuesday. So we've been talking to voters all day here at this voting center, and they've been facing some really interesting choices. For example, we spoke to an African-American mother and her son, and she said that she understands uh, the African-American support of Joe Biden, but she says she's voting according to health care and education, and she feels like Sanders can do a better job of that. We also spoke to people who were planning to mail in their ballots. One voter said that he had his ballot all filled out for Pete Buttigieg, but he held on to it because he wasn't quite sure if something would change. And it did. So now he said he's going to vote for Joe Biden. You can see here where people are mailing in their ballots. If you look just behind me, the people who are here in yellow, they're dropping in. People are driving up in their cars and they're dropping in their their mail-in ballots here. So these voters are ready. It's looking interestingly, increasingly like more of a Sanders and Biden showdown as we talk to these voters here. And we'll learn more as the polls close at 11 p.m. In Alabama, black voters could be decisive in the Democratic presidential primary. MSNBC correspondent Tremaine Lee talked with voters in Bessemer, Alabama. That's a suburb of Birmingham that's more than 70 percent black. Hey, Allison, I'm here in Bessemer, which is a suburb of Birmingham, uh, and it's a big day today. As you know, the primary is here. Now, the big question is, will Joe Biden, coming out of his massive victory in South Carolina, carry that momentum into Alabama, another state that's uh, very diverse, with a high black population, with a huge black electorate? And so the big question, again, is whether coming out of South Carolina Joe Biden could take Alabama as well. Now, I've been talking to voters all day about what matters most to them, what issues were top of mind when they went in the voting booth, and quite frankly, who are they voting for? Now, let's take a listen to what uh, some of those voters had to say. Seeing him uh, sweep through South Carolina and win big there and the endorsements, how much of, of a role did that play in your thinking, or had you already kind of zeroed in on Biden? It did my heart good, and it made my decision a little bit easier because I was beginning to worry because when listening at the news, uh, it was like his campaign was dead. But that gave a, a jolt. I actually thought that Bloomberg would probably be a better person to go against Trump, but I thought Biden would be the better president. As we heard those voters say, uh, folks 
one, want to return to some sense of normalcy, uh, but also that there actually had been some decisions made. Uh, as the gentleman said, coming out of South Carolina and seeing the momentous victory that Joe Biden had, um, it inspired him, not only reinvigorated his campaign, but it gave him confidence in who he's voting for. Uh, but as the, the lady said, you know, she had a decision to make. Michael Bloomberg has put millions and millions of millions of dollars into ads all across this country, um, some aimed at black voters and Many of them have said they have to choose between a Joe Biden and a Michael Bloomberg or other candidates. But again, here we are on primary day. Alabama, which, again, looks a lot like South Carolina in some ways, a very diverse population. But folks have been trickling in. Uh, they're voting. And quite frankly, they say they're, they're happy to have a say. Back to you, Allison. NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki has the latest exit polls. He just ran through the numbers on MSNBC. Take a look. Well, we want to show you a little bit of the uh, demographic variance. We told you the last time we were here, it's a 14 percent black electorate nationally in, in the Super Tuesday states. But there are wide uh, geographic variances in that. So let me show you, because obviously you saw in South Carolina, the black vote uh, went one particular way. We'll see if that happens tonight. But if you call this the South, OK, Oklahoma and all these states in here, the yellow states, they're the Super Tuesday states here. The electorate in these states today collectively is 27 percent black. OK, and if you go next door here to Texas, 21% black. And if you go out to California, it's only 7% black. So some big differences there. That's one thing to keep in mind as you see returns come in from these different regions. There's a large Hispanic population uh, in Texas, obviously, and a very large Hispanic population in California, not so much in the Southeast. In Minnesota, Massachusetts, the big states up here, single digit, mid-low single digit number in terms of African Americans. So that's one to keep in mind. The other is ideology. We've also seen that. The moderate conservative conservative wing of the Democratic Party. That's a fairly big wing here. We showed you that nationally, but take a look here. Again, there is wide variance. If you look at the Southeast here, 45 percent of Democratic primary voters in these states tonight call themselves moderate or conservative. The number in Texas checks in at 42. The number out in California checks in at 32. Mm. And again, the number up here in Massachusetts and Minnesota, it's back there in the low mid 30s. So again, you're seeing some ideological differences between sort of the northern tier here, California versus Texas and the southeast. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose the sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now.
Good evening and welcome to NBC's special coverage of Super Tuesday, only on NBC News Now. I'm Chuck Todd at NBC election headquarters in New York, where we are just moments away from the first polls closing tonight in Virginia and Vermont. It happens in about less than three minutes. They are the first of 14 state contests tonight, including delegate rich prizes like California and Texas. They call it Super Tuesday for a reason. Roughly a third of all delegates that are up for grabs are up for grabs tonight in the Democratic contest to pick a presidential nominee to face President Trump. And this is a Democratic race that looks very different than it did just a few days ago as Joe Biden's campaign is rapidly consolidating support among moderate Democrats after this weekend's big win for him in South Carolina. Still, the progressive in the race, the self-described Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders remains the front runner. He's hoping to leave tonight with a delegate lead that is bigger than the one he has right now. But right now, some of the early results from the our NBC News, News exit polls are signaling that Biden's momentum is real. We're going to have more on that in a moment. Meanwhile, we've got two wild cards tonight, Michael Bloomberg and Elizabeth Warren. Both are facing pressure to exit the race, and both campaigns have now acknowledged or signaled they do not have a path to win this contest outright before the convention. So let's dive in before the first poll closing. We've got our reporters and road warriors standing by with the latest news inside these campaigns. We've also got reporters stationed in key polling places in some of the most important contests. Tonight with me in New York, founder of Voto Latino, Maria Teresa Kumar, NBC senior political editor Mark Murray, the Washington Post columnist, former Democratic congresswoman from Maryland, Donna Edwards, and MSNBC host Joshua Johnson. We are a minute and a half away. We can't get, get, give away any of the news here. We've got polls closing in Vermont <laughs> and in Virginia. And look, Virginia... Um, Donna, the Mid-Atlantic, it, it is, these are voters that probably are the best, they all think they're, they're professional pundits <laughs> in Virginia and Maryland, right? Well, they do, and especially where the votes really come from in Virginia. I mean, they come from the Washington metropolitan region. You have federal workers, people who are contractors. They're really steeped in uh, politics. Their favorite programming is on MSNBC. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, those voters are voters also who are very informed. I mean, they, they're paying they a lot pay of attention. attention. I feel like Mark Murray, in the same way, we learned a lot about the Virginia about Virginia Democrats during that Ralph Northam, during the gubernatorial primary, where suddenly out of nowhere, Republicans showed up and became Democrats. Yeah, and Chuck, you know, to me, when you look at today's modern Democratic Party, Virginia seems to epitomize that. You end up having a strong African-American base, a growing Latino population, a very affluent suburban Democratic vote, people who, some who might have been Republicans several years ago and who are now Democrats. And so when I'm watching the returns from Virginia mm -hmm. and the Democrats who can actually do well in Virginia typically have gone on to get the Democratic nomination. Very quickly before we roll out of the first results, what What's the, if you only had one, what's your desert island state tonight? If you only could have one result, one state result to understand what happened. I would tell you, but it's seven o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I say Texas. I would say Texas. I'm with you. I say Texas. 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 But it is seven o'clock, and I believe <laughs> I mean, we, we, have our, we, you know, we have our first poll closing. And here's the big one. It is Virginia. We are already, we're able to project at poll close that Joe Biden will win Virginia. It, it is why I set you up there, Donna, with that comment, because this is probably the best informed electorate you're going to have. And, and the, the, the electorate that was going to to be the, paying the most attention. Vermont, we are also calling. This is not a surprise. Bernie Sanders, we can call this at poll close, too. So it's one state each, but not but both states aren't equal, Maria Teresa. Absolutely. And I, I think I would actually argue it's something that you were saying, Mark, is that Virginia is the bellwether of the rest of the more moderate wing of the Democratic Party, which is the majority of the Democratic Party. You oftentimes have a conversation of, well, what, where's California going to go? California is leaps and bounds much more progressive than the rest of the country. So I think that Virginia is going to be that bellwether. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, I want you to pay attention to a couple things, because I think the most interesting thing in these exit polls we've seen so far is your time of decision. And it tells you how much our voters paying attention to what happened in South Carolina. Well, look at the time of decision in Virginia. Nearly half the electorate made their decision in the last few days, 48%, 52% um, earlier than that. Just to show you a comparison here so you can see, here's a state that a lot of people expect Bernie Sanders to do well, and that's California. Look at the time of decision here. In the last few days, just one in five voters earlier than that, 80% of voters. So the reason I put that out there tonight is I want people to realize this is telling us an interesting little story. The higher the, the, the last few days decision is, may very well correlate all night long, um, Donna Edwards, with success for Joe Biden. 
A lot of people were waiting to see who was coming out of South Carolina. Well, that's right. And I mean, look at what happened over the last several days. You had the uh, debate in South Carolina. Then you had the vote in South Carolina. And Joe Biden, it turns out, is peaking at exactly the moment that he needs to. Let me put in another thing that also is a not a good sign for Bernie Sanders in Virginia. Ideology, the very liberal number here. I think we have it up here. This very liberal number is under 20 percent, Maria Theresa Kumar. Um, in other states, he's in the, the very liberal number. If it's in the mid to high 20s, those are states Bernie does better. And this being below 20, it shows you this was an open primary state. Right. A, lot of, a lot of very moderate voters showed up. Right. And what's curious to see, how many folks voted for Amy Klobuchar in those states? How many folks actually took in the early vote? How many actually took some siphoned off for Buttigieg? And you could say that that is the coalition that Biden needs. So the longer that people waited to figure out who was going to drop out, the more likely that it actually goes as if it's going towards Biden. And Joshua Johnson, I want to break out. We, we, we can break out the African-American vote here. Nearly 27 percent of the electorate in Virginia was African-American. And, and here you're going to see it was a big, a big um, win here for Joe Biden. He got 63 percent of that vote. I want to look at the 18 percent for Bernie Sanders. This it, it was similar as we saw in South Carolina. He has not expanded his coalition to include African-Americans yet. He is not yet. No, he did very well with Latino voters, of course, in Nevada. We'll see how that carries over in states like California. Florida, I think, is going to be kind of a mixed bag with Latino voters. But no, that's not a coalition that he's built with. I find Virginia fascinating for a few other reasons, not the least of which is that it's kind of an evolving blue state. You know, it's <laughs> yes. gone from being purple. To I feel blue. like it changes every every year. Pretty slightly. much. Yeah. But then this kind of the shade of blue it's going to be, I think, is going to get even bluer. There are other demographic changes happening in Virginia. Virginia has had to deal with some social issues like the Confederate history of Richmond, a transgender member of the state assembly or the state legislature. There's also a new headquarters that Amazon is building in the Ar in Arlington and you know, Virginia Tech is building a new campus in Alexandria. So that's going to bring new people into Virginia that may yet make it bluer if they're coming, say, from S Seattle or San Francisco or Los Angeles to work in Washington. So I think over time, this blue marker might be a dot in a trend line of Virginia that might get even bluer. Joshua, let me underscore your point here. You're talking about how it's not, and we showed you it was not a very liberal. Mark Murray, look at the support for Medicare for All in Virginia. It is narrow. 40, 52, 46. We have not had an exit or entrance poll yet that hasn't had Medicare for all have a majority support among Democrats. However, nothing has been this low. Well, Chuck, one exception in South Carolina was at 49 yes. percent. So to me, what's really indicative here is that Virginia, the state of Virginia, looks a lot like the South Carolina electorate when it comes to this issue. I'd also note that a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters have actually been looking at the exit polls saying, see, a majority support True. Medicare for all. That is something they can talk about. However, it's also important to note the wording for this exit poll question. That is, would you be OK with a government plan that replaces your private insurance. It doesn't say anything about eliminating your insurance if you actually like it. So in some ways, it's a very favorable, the wording is very favorable to Medicare for All supporters. All right. I want everybody to sort of get your pen pads out. This is the time of decision. All right. We've got the breakout now up here of in Virginia. Those in the last few days, how did they break out here? How much did this Biden surge matter? Look at this. 52% oh. of the vote for Biden uh, among the half of the electorate that made their decision in the last few days. As you can see here, remember, we had a poll a week ago that basically had Sanders, Bloomberg, and Biden at 20-20 in some form or another. Clearly, the Bloomberg fade in particular uh, has, mattered, uh, has mattered a lot there. But I want people to see those last few days because here, just so you have it, time of decision in Massachusetts. That's very interesting. Look at that split, 46% in the last few days. I'm going to keep going here. Minnesota. Time of decision, a majority in the Amy Klobuchar dropping out state in the last few days. Just keep, in, keep that in mind. And then look at Texas, a huge state where Sanders did a big job on the early vote. Just 23 percent of the electorate made their decision in the last few days. The point is, as you can see, when that last few days number, the higher it is, likely the stronger a Biden state it is, the lower it is. There's California. Perhaps a better shot for your Bernie Sanders or the clutter, if you will, in all of this. It's just something 
one of the few trend lines that popped in very quickly in this in looking at all of the exit polls. I wonder if that has to do with the way that people view equivalent choices. You know, I mean, you've got Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg endorsing Joe Biden. They were all kind of going for that same strand of the party. I don't think Elizabeth Warren, at least in terms of the poll results, has substantiated herself as an equivalent Bernie Sanders. Like, they're not comparable choices. And she choices. doesn't want to be. I would no. actually, actually, I would say that she doesn't want to be. She wants to be the one that is able to, if she walks away with a threshold of delegates, she wants to be the one that says, you, now both candidates, you have to talk to me. I think it's very clear that she doesn't have a, a pathway, but she all of a sudden has, of all three, she has incredible leverage. Is she the perfect bridge? She, I think is, she the, is, she the, I think, is she the perfect bridge? I think the reason she's a perfect bridge is that Biden, in order to win, he needs to help grow that electoral base. He really does. Bernie needs her to basically wink at the women and say, come with me. She grows the electoral base and she is doing incredibly well with women, whether they're suburban moms, whether they're African-American, whether they're Latina or Asian, that she brings that to whichever candidate. And I think that is one of the reasons why she'll stay longer than perhaps knowing that she does not have a pathway, but that she does have leverage. Donna, how long can Elizabeth Warren sort of keep doing this? Is there a penalty? Among, uh, among, among Democratic um, elite? No, I mean, I think as long as she continues to win delegates, and frankly, de the Democratic elite don't believe that she's really taking votes away from uh, Joe Biden. Right now, they don't mind her in, do that's they? Right. If, you, if well, you're not a Bernie fan, you want but Elizabeth Warren that, in. But I think her point is that she can continue, you know, she'll get 15 percent in a couple of these states, and she will build her delegate base, and then she becomes kind of the consensus builder, mm -hmm. the bridge builder, the one who says, you know, we have to have a way to unite the entire party, and you can't just do that with the moderate Joe Biden. Right. I got some comment. I was chatting with some folks on social media tonight, just asking, like, what city are you in? Who did you vote for and why? There were a couple of people who commented, well, I really liked Pete Buttigieg, but he's out, so I picked Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got a few of those comments, so you may be right in that regard. Well, they have always been. It was interesting. that it, Buttigieg may have endorsed Biden, but we saw this a lot, Mark Murray. The Buttigieg Warren, they really kept eating. You know, when Buttigieg would rise, it came a lot more out of Warren than anybody else. You're, you're talking about a lot of college-educated whites. And yep. the polling it did show that a lot of Buttigieg supporters went not only to Joe Biden, but also Elizabeth Warren, but also to say, I think in a lot of ways that the longer Elizabeth Warren stays in does end up helping Joe Biden. And look at particularly the states tonight where you end up talking, if you're asking the Joe Biden campaign, what would they, what kind of outcome would they really like? They'd want Elizabeth Warren to be at viability in California yeah. and in Texas mm -hmm. to be able to kind of separate so Bernie Sanders can't get big delegate margins there. You know, I just, I, I'm, you guys brought up the Warren issue. We brought up white uh, college, white women college grads. Warren finished second ahead of Sanders. Mm -hmm. White women non-college grads, she finished a distant third, almost fourth with Bloomberg. That was something she's never been able to do, which is sort of unite women, non-college non white women and white college women. I think but most women behind closed doors, women like her. And they're afraid that, and it's, it goes back to the rest of the electorate, they're afraid to pick the wrong candidate. But if she is able to have some sort of surge, she is all of a sudden in the driver's seat of several different positions, whether it's for Bernie or whether it's for Biden. And African-American women embrace her, Latinas but embrace they, her. Okay, they do, but not enough. It, well, it hasn't no, no, been but, enough but, to win. Right, no, no, but I think, well, I think, well, part of the problem, I think, is that when folks came out of Iowa and they did not have a clear marking that she came in third, I think that's what actually started hindering her. Had she come in with a strong third, then Amy would not have surged and the others wouldn't have surged. Yeah, but I also think yeah. this is about, mm -hmm. um, if you look at all of the polls uh, across the board, people have always chosen Elizabeth Warren as their second choice. Right. And part of it is a belief factor. When people go and cast their votes, look, I've been a candidate, and people will tell you, I, want, I, would, vote, I would have voted for you if I thought you could win. And, um, and I think for some of these women, they have a lot at stake, and so they don't want to make a mistake. But I think Elizabeth Warren, again, she's not, you know, sort of where Bernie is, and I think the quote unquote establishment, whatever that is, would feel actually comfortable with her. Let's look at big picture here a little bit though, Mark, which is the question was whether does South Carolina, would it serve as an accelerant? Virginia for Joe Biden, particularly with consolidating the African American vote. Virginia says yes. If if South Carolina's result can make it up to Virginia, 
I'm guessing it doesn't skip over North Carolina. Mm. I'm guessing it uh, makes its way to Alabama. I'm guessing it makes its way to and Tennessee and Arkansas. Chuck, we've seen this in 2008 and 2016 when we actually look at all the exit polls on nights like tonight and that geography and demography start becoming destiny. That one candidate who ends up doing well in one particular region of the country replicates that in the other states that touch it by. You can also start plugging in the numbers on, tell me the uh, how, how many Latino voters, the percentage there, the very liberals. And all of a sudden, once you get halfway through this entire process, you can kind of say, well, I think I know what this kind of it's going to get in a one-on-one -on -one race. We're still not in that one-on-one -on -one race right now. Get close. But, but mm -hmm. the geography is destiny to me. Is a really we're, we're starting well, to see that. For the, and mm -hmm. for Bernie, he needs to do super well here because after Super Tuesday, he has a it's more harder. difficult path. Let's check in with this. Sanders uh, headquarters with Casey Hunt. Uh, Casey, the, the first two calls uh, have to be a little disconcerting. Number one, it looks like Biden's going to make threshold in Vermont. That does it. That means they don't get the clean sweep there. Number two, it's a poll close call in Virginia where a week ago this looked like a like a nail biter. That's right, Chuck. This is uh, potentially, I mean, there are some signs here in, in the data that, that we are able uh, to report at this hour that say that tonight could be a little tougher than Bernie Sanders anticipated and that perhaps that one-on-one -on -one contest with Joe Biden that they have, uh, if anything, been, uh, you know, looking toward over the course of the last couple of weeks could be tougher than they anticipated. And, and the reality is, you know, there are a lot of the same forces at work here in the party that were at work in 2016, particularly among voters of color. And, you know, it, it was those voters, particularly across the South, who gave Hillary Clinton her victory over Bernie Sanders in 2016. And it seems to be those same voters who are saying this time that they don't trust Bernie Sanders, uh, and in fact that they do uh, trust Joe Biden. And it seems as though the momentum uh, that Biden uh, managed to get in the last, uh, I guess it's really only the last 24, 48 hours, uh, really has made the kind of difference uh, for Biden uh, that could make Bernie Sanders' path a lot tougher uh, and his time as the front runner perhaps a lot shorter. Now, of course, uh, we still have so much out. They're really watching at California. The delegate math, as you know, is incredibly complicated, and that's after we managed to get all those votes counted, which is a project in and of itself uh, in California. Uh, but they're still pinning their hopes there, hoping that they can make this uh, a kind of long uh, slog to the nomination. But uh, Chuck, you know, one thing I think is, is interesting uh, about the last uh, couple of weeks as we've had this contested convention conversation, you know, everyone has sort of uh, been looking back at Hillary at Clinton, asking her, you know, uh, where was Bernie Sanders thinking a plurality was good enough uh, back in 2016. Uh, Sanders has answered that question now because he saw himself potentially going to this convention with a plurality. Uh, but he has now answered that that question. So if it's Biden that comes out with a lead, uh, that becomes a tougher, a tougher scenario for him. And we seem to already have him on the record on this, Chuck. It's true. And then that, well, who knows, maybe if he's behind in delegates tonight, he's um, going to be more interested in his 2016 position. Uh, so we shall see. Anyway, Casey Hunt at, at uh, Bernie headquarters. Thanks very much. Let's check in in Thank West you. Palm Beach. That's where we're going to find Josh Letterman. Again, he's with the Bloomberg campaign. There's an event tonight. Florida is not on the ballot. And Josh, I'm a Virginia resident. My mailbox was filled up with Bloomberg material. I didn't get material from anybody else. Um, and and it, it wasn't to me. I have somebody in my household is is a super voter. Uh, no other candidate targeted uh, Virginia, really, other than Virginia with paid media. And it doesn't look like Bloomberg's going to make threshold. Yeah, and if you would like to watch television, Chuck, you probably saw quite a bit of his television ads, too. A lot of spending upwards of half a billion dollars. He spent mostly focused on Super Tuesday states like Virginia, but uh, clearly a, a rough night for him as far as what we're seeing so far uh, in Virginia. And while the Bloomberg campaign publicly is projecting a lot of optimism uh, and confidence with his campaign manager, Kevin Sheeky, telling me here just a few minutes ago that they expect to be viable 
in nearly every state or every state tonight. Uh, clearly behind the scenes, they see some of the writing on the wall like everyone else. They've watched what's happened over the last 72 hours as the party really has started to unite behind uh, Joe Biden. Uh, and they're also aware that a lot of voters have been making up their minds uh, pretty close to Election Day, meaning that some of what's changed in the last few days with Pete Buttigieg dropping out, Amy Klobuchar uh, endorsing, uh, uh, endorsing Joe Biden really could affect the numbers that are coming in now. Uh, Bloomberg campaign officials acknowledging, Chuck, that they're going to have to take another look tomorrow once the data comes in. Mike, uh, you know, boasts of being a, a data-driven guy who is an engineer by training, looks at the numbers, uh, and they will take a look to see whether there's a reason uh, to continue with this uh, after tomorrow. But they're continuing to make the case that even if Bloomberg does not end up being the nominee, he's still committed to what he's been saying all along. He will be the most important person working to help elect whoever the Democratic nominee is, continuing to spend uh, no small fortune of his own personal funds to help the Democrat, whoever he or she may be. Chuck? Some important news right there that, that the Bloomberg folks are going to essentially reassess in the morning after they see all the data. That's an important development there. Josh Letterman with that news in West Palm. Thanks very much. Let me check in with Leanne Caldwell. She is in Raleigh, North Carolina. We're at a good old fashioned polling site that the polls haven't closed there. They're going to close very soon. Um, this was a state that looked like a tough, tight three way race with Bloomberg, Bernie and Biden just mm -hmm. a week ago. Uh, we saw what happened to Virginia. North Carolina border South Carolina. I got to think the Biden folks feel pretty good there. Yeah, it, it seems like it's pretty good for Biden on the ground here, based on what we're seeing, Chuck. But they're voting in this uh, polling boot, this um, space right behind me. Polls, as you mentioned, are going to close momentarily. We're in an affluent district, precinct in Raleigh. It's next to NC State. So we're getting a trickle of students. But I just want to step back big picture here. Joe Biden has only spent a quarter of a million dollars in North Carolina as far as advertising is concerned. Compare that to Bernie Sanders, who spent almost two million. And then Mike Bloomberg, who has spent more than 12 million dollars here. Now, despite the lack of money and organization for Joe Biden, sources are telling me that it looks like Joe Biden is riding that wave from South Carolina into North Carolina, that things are looking really good for him. And that's what we're seeing on the ground as well. This morning, we were in Durham, North Carolina, a predominantly African-American district, where we heard so many people say that they were supporting Joe Biden. And now we're in a fluent Raleigh district where we're hearing the same thing. The reason is because of his success in South Carolina and also the endorsements that he's received over the past couple of days has really helped him. We spoke to one woman named Leah. She actually voted for Trump in 2016. She regrets that vote. She was going to back Buttigieg, but since Buttigieg dropped out, and has endorsed Joe Biden, she decided to come into the voting booth and vote for Joe Biden. So as you said, polls are closing momentarily, so we could find out relatively soon uh, how well Joe Biden is going to do here. All right, Leanne Caldwell at a polling location in Raleigh, North Carolina. Leanne, thanks very much. Let me go north to a state that's not voting today. It's voting in a week, and that is in Michigan, uh, where Ali Vitale is with the Warren campaign. Elizabeth Warren rally getting ready there. Look, uh, I believe Arlington, Virginia was her first event after New Hampshire uh, and doesn't appear she's going to hit threshold uh, in Virginia. That's got to be a bit disappointing. And they're especially one of the campaigns who started early on the ground there, if not the earliest, in putting people on the ground, trying to get people organizing in Virginia. But in my conversations with people in the campaign and around the campaign, Virginia is not a state that I've heard come up consistently. Yes, it's a place that you mentioned she went to right after New Hampshire. She drew a big 4,000-person crowd there as well. At the same time, though, look at where she spent her time recently. She's been in Texas. She made sure to make a last-minute stop in California last night. Those are states that, if you look at where the candidate is going, it's clear that those are places that they think are integral to their delegate math and the way that they're looking at this map. But I think the other place that's on the map that's really got my attention, and frankly many of us out here, is Massachusetts. Not because of its 91 delegates. There are certainly states on the map that have more delegates than that. 
but because for Elizabeth Warren, it could mean winning or losing in her home state. That's crucial. She hasn't won a state outright yet, so that's important. But on the other hand, too, she needs to win in her home state, and Bernie Sanders is nipping at her heels there, or even in some polls, surpassing her. So when I asked her this morning, do you think that this is a state that you need to win? What happens if you don't win here? She was uncharacteristically curt with me, saying, why are you asking a question like that when people are going to the polls? She herself was walking to her polling place in Cambridge. So clearly the pressure building to do well in Massachusetts, a state where Elizabeth Warren has won statewide twice in both of her Senate runs, Chuck. We shouldn't assume that Joe Biden might not get a, get a bump either in those places as well. Looks like the candidate is coming. I'll let you go, Ali Vitale, in Michigan with Elizabeth Warren. Um, Maria Theresa, come on. I, 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 we're, I'm going to be careful here, and we're not going to give away the store on, on numbers. But I've been looking at something here, and, and I'm, I'm noticing a pattern, and that is I think there's going to be an interesting thing tonight. How many states does Bernie Sanders get north of 40 percent, and how many states does Joe Biden get north of 40 percent? And I would argue that does matter, because it will show you who can get a larger, who can start putting the party together. And if Sanders isn't expanding his base, if these numbers still are in the 20s, you're like, well, that's what you got in South Carolina. That's what you got in New Hampshire. This is starting to look like a familiar number. Exactly. And then the folks that have yet to decide, they're, they want to win. The Democrats want to win. And that's when, if they don't feel that Bernie is getting the momentum he needs to put him over, mm -hmm. they will go securely to a more moderate moderate part of the party and he's going to have to figure out how to do to do things differently and that is going to be trying to bring in the establishment right. trying to say that i am part of the democratic party to win this and i think that would be for him a very hard pill to we may be hearing from joe biden in a few minutes here so we're keeping an eye on that Mark. yeah chuck you know the good news for bernie sanders when you look at all this is his nevada numbers were great you know, they actually ended up getting more than 35 percent of the popular vote, nearly 50 percent when you actually look at the delegate allocation in, in Nevada. Let me just say, welcome, everybody. This is fun on news now. We can hear Joe Biden at events. The reason why we're here today is, is because a few years ago, Aaron Bass, we came if, uh, here with President Obama. She's in, I believe so he is in L.A. right now because there's still polls are still open in California. Vice President. Listen. Hey, team, how are you back there? We're really messing things up for you, aren't we? <laughs> We're also here with our mayor, Mayor Garcetti. Yeah. 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 All right, we're going to uh, sneak in a quick break. You're watching Super Tuesday coverage on NBC News Now. Basically, consider your pre show to our six hour extravaganza that begins at 8 p.m. on the broadcast network. Let's sneak in that break. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, and pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are going to winnow the field. They're probably going to create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. 
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway! It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Welcome back to NBC News Now, special coverage of Super Tuesday. You think we're doing six hours tonight? This is our sneaky seventh hour. We are just a few moments away from polls closing in North Carolina. 110 delegates. It's a big one. It's the third biggest prize tonight after California and Texas. Back with me, Marie Theresa Kumar, Mark Murray, Donna Edwards, Joshua Johnson. Uh, Donna Edwards, you just let us know this is your, your, your birth state. Uh, and birthday. where you went to school, Wake Forest alum, you and, uh, you and Tim Duncan. And Richard Barr. Burr. Richard Burr. <laughs> uh, but you know what? I mean, the thing about North Carolina is, especially in the Research Triangle area and Charlotte, it's really a growing and changing demographic, you know, very high. Kind of how he described Virginia, That's right? exactly that, right. Same thing and happening, just a little slower. That's right. And, you know, so I think you see in North Carolina what you saw in, in South Carolina. And I would not be surprised if we looked at the results in Charlotte and we saw what was, we knew what was going to happen because of what happened in those suburban South Carolina. Uh, Which are just suburbs of Charlotte. They're suburbs North of Charlotte. Yeah. And, um, you know, in an electorate that's highly educated and the fifth largest state in the country, people don't normally think about that. I know. Um, but that's why there are a lot it's of It's Mark Murray's, you're, it's one of the states you obsess over. You're like, the, you think, you, your bet, we've had this bet, you believe it'll be the single closest state in the general election. And also it could end up deciding the fate of the U.S. Senate and control of that. Look, I, you know, it doesn't get enough love. But, you know, <laughs> presidential battleground state, competitive Senate race that could control yeah. the Senate. A the gubernatorial, the gubernatorial yeah, is always going to be incredibly year. competitive, yeah. too. So it's got it all. And uh, I do think that a Democratic electorate is much different than the general election, but certainly want to see how the Democratic Party is in the state of North Carolina. Well, well in North Carolina, Carolina, in the last, in the actual presidential, North Carolina was called at 8 o'clock, and that's when we all knew that basically it was lost, right? Like, Oh, yeah, it was a Carolina. bigger deal right. when we were like, whoa. Yeah. That happened a lot that faster, a and that was a state that was much closer in 2012 and in 2008. Mm -hmm. I think that North Carolina, I'm all be interested to see why people picked the candidate they picked. I, the difference that I find between Virginia and North Carolina, and I spent some time there in the last few years, is that the people that I met in North Carolina had more... I'm not sure exactly how to articulate this, but their concerns politically had to do with their sense of place, mm. of like less North Carolinians. Less transient. Le much less yes, transient. North Virginia, Carolinians yeah. that I know yeah. love North Carolina. Well, I think we can, uh, I think we have a projection to make because it is just past 7.30, polls have closed. And if we're making a projection, that's good news for this guy, Joe Biden. Another poll closed call here. Winning North Carolina, look, we we practically gave it away there, Donna, as, as you were saying. Uh, it was hard to imagine that somehow the I-95 corridor was going to skip, you know, go from South Carolina to Virginia and skip over North Carolina. That's right. And I mean, you look at this and, you know, what you see is the reason that a top of the ticket can make a huge difference in a state. And so I see that, I mean, 
you know, Joe Biden is taking the mid-Atlantic and down through the South. Mm -hmm. um, that's a huge barrier to overcome if you're Bernie Sanders. Well, let's look. Uh, you guys wanted to see some of these, uh, these North Carolina numbers. We can do it by age first. Here it is. This is voters over 45. Biden just clobbered everybody. He has 50 percent of the vote of voters over 45. And as you say, Sanders in third uh, in this one, if you look at that. Now, if you look at voters under 45, well, this is where Sanders does well, 42 percent. But look at that number. Biden sitting at 31 percent there. Uh, Joshua Johnson, it shows that that essentially Biden doing better with younger voters than Bernie with older voters, which hadn't been the case in some previous uh, uh, polls. No, I mean, the trend is still, you know, Bernie skews younger and Biden skews older, which is why I think, at least from what a lot of people have been telling me online, what I think might also be kind of in not only Biden's back pocket, but right. maybe some of Bloomberg's strategy in Florida, which is to hope that older voters will want someone who's more practical as opposed to revolutionary. Let's jump to Mike Memoli. He's got a guy named Joe Biden with him as a, as a guest. So let's uh, Mike Memoli, take the mic. Uh, you got the vice president. Tell him he's live on NBC News now. <laughs> Gonna get to him here, buddy. Well, Chuck, uh, I'm a little bit of. Uh, Looks like you're not getting to him. That's all right. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm not getting to him, but we're in the middle of Roscoe's chicken and waffles. He's actually might be walking over here, here in just a second. He said, "You guys are good luck." He's been in Roscoe's chicken and waffles here for the last 20 or, or so minutes. Another endorsement for Joe Biden tonight, Keegan Michael Key. He had been a Buttigieg supporter. He's here with him as well. Uh, I asked the vice president as he walked in about the call in Virginia, what it said about. Uh, his chances here uh, to have a potentially a big night. He said he's feeling good, but he said he's not a pundit. So for now, he's eager to just let the results roll in. Uh, he might be walking in my direction here. We're being, you know, restrained just a little bit. Um, but listen, this is uh, a Joe Biden who I think, as, as I tweeted last night, seems to be having a lot more fun on the campaign trail now than he has uh, for it's most more, of the campaign. You really? You think it's more fun to win than lose, huh? <laughs> well, but I will say this, I think in, in Iowa and New Hampshire, he encountered a lot of audiences that were expecting him to impress them. Yeah. Uh, that there were, he had something to prove to them. And he obviously responds as much as any candidate I've ever covered. And of course I've covered him uh, more than most uh, to crowd energy. And since the calendar has turned to yeah. South Carolina, especially, and now to the Super Tuesday states, the energy is so different and he's having more fun because of it. He's better as a candidate because of it. All right. Uh, and you can see it on his face tonight, what, what victory adds to that as well. Well, we'll see. He obviously, he's hoping that he can get a jump start on his California campaign there. Mike Memoli with uh, the vice president. Thanks very much. All right, Joshua Johnson, you've been demanding more exit poll numbers. I'm going to give it to you. Absolutely. I wanted to show people the uh, time of decision the number. Again, let me remind you, this was the Virginia number, time of decision. A major, uh, 48 percent saying last few days. That turned out to be a big. This is why I, I care about it so much. Here's North Carolina, 31 percent in the last few days. And then here's some, uh, we can see some things starting to look very similar. Um, 27 percent of the African American uh, of the vote was African American. And then if you look in here, we can show you how well Biden did. And this sort of explains why Biden, why we were able to make a poll close call. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was 62 percent in Virginia, 63 percent North Carolina. We're so starting to see a pattern here, Joshua. Yeah, which makes sense for the southern states, for sure, which I think <clears throat> maybe chronologically, I don't know, turn out to be lucky for Joe Biden well, that it happened when a great it did. Time zone. I was just going to say the time zone sometimes matter. Yeah. 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 This, and not just the time zone, but the fact that South Carolina just happened. Yep. And then you have Amy Klobuchar drop out before Minnesota. Yeah. Like the clock just may have been on Joe Biden's side in a way. Plus the fact that you have all these states with a very large black electorate that are coming up right after South Carolina. I don't know how much that helps him when we get yeah. to Texas, California. California is mm -hmm. between four and seven percent black estimated to drop to 2% black right. over the next few decades. So unless he can build a larger coalition with, say, Latino voters in That's Texas and California, yeah. I, I don't know what this looks like later. However, this is the white vote in North Carolina, and this is where Sanders was hoping, particularly with young, younger voters, Maria Teresa Kumar, uh, and Biden won the white vote too. I mean, not by as big of a margin, 36% to 25 for Sanders. But this is why, again, we call this a poll close. Right. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that's interesting is that South Carolina, once again, the African-American vote has become the bellwether of where is the country going. And you have to give it to 
to, um, to Biden that he has been part of the African-American community for such a long time. He didn't decide that he was going to court them yesterday. It's part of who he is. And this is what happens when you actually invest time in your community, in that, those communities, is that they come back in spades. And I think that one of the challenges that people really have is that how does he expand that electorate? It, the Latino voter right now is anybody but Trump. And so he's going to have an easier time making that bridge than you could say perhaps in other communities. Uh, among younger voters, I think he's going to have to have a, hard charter, a harder time actually making those bridges. But among the Latino community, yeah. they're going to say anybody but Trump. One thing, one thing worth noting, if I could, out of the numbers from North Carolina with mm -hmm. regards to where people sit on the spectrum, yeah. you know, typically we see Bernie Sanders do really well with people who are farther left. But according to our exit poll, you know, more than half of the electorate in North Carolina describes itself as liberal, right. fewer as moderate and conservative. By Biden won with all of those groups. Right. But this, he beat the Bernie very Sanders liberal well. and somewhat liberal, and that's why we separate that out. Those right. very liberal is that is 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 that Bernie. But here's something else here, to, 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 and I think it's a huge issue for Bernie Sanders, um, Don Edwards. Only 35 percent of the electorate was under 45 in North Carolina. 65 percent was all. I mean, he is not. He he is correct when he says, if we have the largest voter turnout in history, we win these elections. He's not getting the turnout of his demographics. Well, and he particularly believes that if he has a really large turnout of young people. He's right. And that, but and they're he not is coming. right about yeah. that. And I think what we're seeing, too, is that, you know, I mean, this is consistent. Every cycle we're courting and courting uh, young voters, and they just come in drips and drabs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I think our, the winning coalition, you look at Joe Biden and you think about the states that were lost in the general election, Wisconsin and Michigan, which were lost because we didn't get the it's turnout that we needed. What you're saying is it was a youth voter voters. turnout, wasn't yeah. the issue. Right. And so um, and I think Biden then has a greater ability, obviously, to get the kind of 90 percent numbers mm -hmm. that you need. among. But, by the way, just just to give you among 65 and over 20 percent electorate, Biden got 55 percent. Maria Theresa Kumar. Sanders got eight. Mm -hmm. Among those 17 to 29, just 13 percent of the electorate, Sanders got 54. Biden got 21. I mean, the thing is, this could, Biden is doing better among young Initial voters voting, right. than Bernie is among I'll older voters, which is think, also not helpful to him. Right. Well, and I think something, to, for the very first time in the last midterm election, younger voters, Generation X, Y, and Z, voted outvoted older voters. And that, I would say, was because there was a coalition of individuals coming together and voting because of March for Our Lives when it came to choice. You had, whether it was immigrant, you had a coalition of folks. Biden is going to need to make sure that that coalition comes back and that they see themselves in a place for him. And the reason that you say, well, why do people care about Bernie Sanders so much among the young electorate, it has a lot to do with finances, with economics. When you talk about this idea of, well, who cares if you have tr a trillion dollars in student loans? Well, if I have trillion dollars in student loans as a young, you know, as a young generation, I can never buy a home. I can never find a pathway to the middle class. Biden is going to have to figure out how do you talk to this economically strapped individual that does not see himself better off than his parents? This has been, you know, Biden, it is one of the things that I think the Hunter Biden stuff hurt Joe. Um, the one place where you did see Bernie pick up ground has been, has been with working class, uh, not with non-white voters, has been working class non-white males, Latino and African-American. Mm -hmm. You've been telling me about this for, for, for months. And I think it's the perception, not that Biden did anything wrong, but if Hunter Biden's making all that money, then Joe Biden must be rich now. Yeah. He's not middle class Joe. I think he's got to figure out how to talk to that voter again. He lost. He's lost that specific voter, the Scranton voter. The other thing he's he needs to work on is the future. And actually, exactly one right. of the things that he and his campaign have even admitted to us is mm -hmm. we need to talk about how Joe Biden's policies are actually more progressive than Barack Obama's was in 2016. The on whole climate, climate has on, moved oh, left. Actually, but including yeah. Biden. Chuck, the other number that I'm really fired up about here in this poll, you know where I've been on this, is 55 percent in the North Carolina want to continue Barack Obama's policies. Just 28 percent want a more liberal party. Revolution me, versus th evolution. Th this <laughs> is the fault line of the Democratic Party and the essential question. We don't have to take a lot of breaks when we're on NBC News now, but we do have to take some. And I'm going to take one right now. So let's sneak one in. Hour one of our seven-hour marathon. Take a break. What's uh, our pace? White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to al-Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like 
something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, an open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway! It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Welcome back to NBC's special coverage of tonight's Super Tuesday contest in the Democratic presidential primary race. I'm Hallie Jackson in Washington, picking up our coverage from Chuck Todd only on NBC News Now. And you know we are counting it down to the top of the hour when polls are going to close in five more contests tonight, including some southern states seen as very important for Joe Biden's campaign. You've also got a must-win state for Elizabeth Warren, her home state of Massachusetts, Let's get you caught up on the action so far. Just moments ago, NBC News projected Joe Biden has won the Democratic primary in North Carolina. That comes, you can see it there, after NBC News projected at the top of the hour, Biden has also won the Democratic primary contest in Virginia. Both of those wins showing some strength, right, for Joe Biden in those Southern contests. We've got another call for you, too. NBC News also projecting Bernie Sanders has won the Democratic primary in his home state of Vermont. So those are the latest headlines on a night when 14 states are holding their primaries. You've got about a third of all these convention delegates up for grabs in a contest that's really been a roller coaster for Democrats. You have frontrunner Bernie Sanders battling this resurgent Biden campaign, all of it playing out tonight. And again, we are just now 15 minutes or so from the next round of polls closing. California doesn't close for a bit yet, right? West Coast, they got some time, but that state is the biggest prize. It may still be days before we know the final results there. Katie Turr is with me from a polling location in East L.A. Katie, what are you seeing? Uh, so, Hallie, here's what we're seeing here. The, this line doesn't look like it's long, but it is an hour long right now because inside this room, and we're not going to—we're going to respect their privacy in there, but inside this room— 
uh, five voting booths, only three of them work. One is down from a paper jam today and one has been down for four days. So there is some frustration here among some voters. That being said, people are not quitting. They're staying in line. They want to vote. And if they're not staying here, they're going to another polling place, which promises uh, not as long lines. They're, they're calling this their, their civic duty. Uh, Latino voters, especially here in East L.A., are seeing this election, uh, this primary, and then what we're when we go to vote in November, as do or die for not just their way of life, but their families. They, they, they've seen um, Donald Trump come in and make them enemies and, and demonize them. And, and they want to reset. They want to go back to a much fairer way of doing things. So when I when I talk to voters who are leaving here, I'm getting mostly two names. I'm getting Joe Biden and I'm getting Bernie Sanders. Joe Biden among some of the older voters, Bernie Sanders among some of the younger voters. But they're all saying similar things. Things. They're all saying we want health care, uh, we want housing, we want to address inequality. Los Angeles is dealing with a massive inequality problem, massive housing problem. In fact, the whole state is. You see people now living in tents on the side of the freeway. You see people living on overpasses. You see people living in tents in front of million dollar houses. It is a serious issue, and it's one that the candidates have come out here and address. I think it's really interesting that Joe Biden is here in Los Angeles, here in California. He's been polling second here, but he's hoping that with all of the dropouts and the endorsements, that the last minute voters here in California, the ones who didn't already mail in their ballots or come to a voting center a few days ago, will have taken a second look at him. And that and that will end up, he hopes, in a surge of voters that he didn't otherwise have. That being said, Bernie Sanders has been leading in the polls here for some time, especially among younger Latino voters. And part of the reason for that, Hallie, is that Bernie Sanders' campaign never left from four years ago. They have been here since 2016. They've been, there's been community leaders, local officials. They've maintained offices. They've maintained outreach. So the grassroots have been here, and the relationship has been built over the last four or five years. And they're hoping that that is going to pay off, especially especially among voters under the age of 45, younger voters who really want somebody to address issues that they are dealing with, specifically better jobs and health care, Hallie. Makes a lot of sense. Katie Turr out there in East L.A. for us. Katie, thank you. Uh, while Katie was delivering her report, we have another projection to share with you. NBC News projecting Michael Bloomberg is actually getting his first win at all of this entire season. We talk about 14 states in a U.S. territory, the territory American Samoa with Bloomberg notching a win there. Chris Jansing is who you're looking at now. She is in Texas, which is the second biggest delegate prize. 261 delegates at stake here, Chris. I know some of the polls close in just a couple of minutes. You've got more that'll stay open for another hour or so. But this is a place where you've seen a number of these candidates invest some resources. No, no doubt about it. Obviously, all I have to do is look at the delegate count. And the big story here in Travis County and in Austin is big turnout, Hallie. Uh, four years ago, 2016, 230,000 people approximately voted in this county, 238,000 already as of the top of the last hour. And we're told that lines at some of the polling places have been hour and a half, two hours. Here, it's been pretty steady, no longer than an hour. Look, big turnout, conventional wisdom would tell you, would favor Bernie Sanders because four years ago against Hillary Clinton, he outperformed here much better than he did in the rest of the state against Hillary Clinton. But, and there's a big asterisk, I've been talking to a lot of folks in this area who have been following this closely, and that asterisk obviously is what's happened over the last 72 hours, and in particularly the last 24 hours with these new endorsements. So, I did my own little poll for you, Hallie. 23 people online here, eight people, so a third of them, have changed their mind sometime over the last three days. They may have made up, one guy said he made up his mind three times. Two of them said they were making game time decisions. And I may have one more for you, Jessica, who has been waiting in line. Jessica, for how long? I honestly don't know. Maybe 20 minutes. 20 minutes, so not bad. No. And you still aren't sure who you're going to vote for? Uh, no, not entirely. So what's going through your mind right now? Um, honestly, my issue is with I'm not sure, like, whoever wins the nomination, I'm more worried about who will be able to win in the end. Who can beat Donald Trump? Right. Um, and 
For Elizabeth Warren, I'm concerned that people are still hung up on a woman, even though I, I voted for Hillary and I would obviously vote for a woman at any time. But I'm concerned that the country isn't at that point right now. I feel like we've regressed a little from even last time we voted. And then Bernie Sanders, I feel like it may be too liberal right now for to like come back from Trump. But um, and then Joe Biden, he's already been vice president. Um, he seems really great. It's just I know there's a lot of people of my generation that have an issue with some things that he said recently and how he's been. You are about genuinely this. conflicted with about, I'm going to say, having watched this line, we've come here three times, Sally. You've probably got about seven or eight minutes. So yeah. <laughs> good luck so with maybe that. We'll figure it out by then. But. Well, we hope so. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, one more little tidbit here. Uh, again, I said that the line has been as long as an hour, a little more than an hour. This is one of the places where. They got a slow start this morning. They were supposed to have in seven poll workers. Only three showed up. And I talked to Mary, who's in charge. She's the judge in there. And she said the other four, frankly, were worried about coronavirus. There have been no cases here, but they're, they are testing one person for coronavirus here in this county. And she said, look, a lot of us are retired. A lot of us are older people. So we're in a high risk group. She didn't think it was surprising at all. But right now, again, they're going to let this line continue. Anybody who's in line uh, up until the cutoff, which is what, about 10 minutes from now, will get yeah. to vote, Hallie. So, Chris, I didn't mean to step on you there, but I'm so struck by the by the woman that you just spoke with. With seven minutes to go, she's going to make her decision because <laughs> yes. that really is such an illustration of what we're seeing from the exit polling now out of these some of these Super Tuesday states that about a quarter of Super Tuesday voters are late deciders, right? And our exit polling is showing that those late deciders are actually breaking more for Joe Biden than for any other candidate, at least at this point. And and it's it's such an illustration that that the woman that you're talking about, she's naming three three different candidates in the span of 35 seconds, right? As she's trying to make her decision, uh, as she's literally walking into the polling place. Are you seeing that a lot? Yeah. So again, if I if I make her voter number 24, uh, that is 11 people who either have changed their mind in the last 24 hours or a total of three who are making a game time decision. And most of those, because I asked them what is going on. I didn't ask her, but I asked them whether or not they were being influenced by what we've seen with the endorsements. They said exactly what we heard from this young woman. Bottom line is it's not so much about who I might like the best. It's about who I think can beat Donald Trump. And for a lot of people, they're following this and they're confused. And that's what we're seeing online. When you have that many people, when you have more than a third of people who are either changing their minds or making a game time decision, uh, you know that there has been a lot of volatility over the course of the last three days, Hallie. That is going to be the word uh, of the hour here, Chris Jansing, as we wait for some of those polls to close. Chris Jansing live for us there in Austin, Texas. Chris, thank you. So we've been talking about these candidates. Joe Biden obviously getting that projected win, according to NBC News, in Virginia and North Carolina. Bernie Sanders getting his first win of the night in his home state of Vermont. That is where we find NBC Shaquille Brewster following the campaign from Essex Junction. Um, and Shaq, the crowd going nuts behind you. An interesting sort of non-rally type setup for, for Senator Sanders here. The interesting thing, too, they had been hoping it seems to have done better in some of these states, um, or at least to, to be looking at where the delegate count is, which we won't know for a little while yet. Without a doubt, Hallie. Let me first just set it up because I know there's a lot of background noise right going on. There's a band. This is a traditional rally, as it's been described. So there's a, a band performing right now, and the crowd is cheering because on another network they're uh, showing a reporter a report from here at this venue. But there's a band performing right now. The crowd is listening to that band as they've been watching the results, and you've been. It's been fish. It's fish. Exactly. The <laughs> band. Exactly. Uh, it's fish, so they're excited about that. It's actually funny right now, and I keep looking back because on one screen, the, there's two stages here. So the stage that you have behind me, that's where Senator Sanders will speak, but there's another stage to my left, and on that stage, that's where the band is performing, but then they're competing with what they're seeing on the TV screen, which is a reporter showing and reporting from this venue. So it's a little bit of uh, some distractions going on among the folks here. Uh, I will say, Hallie, though, based on the results that we've been seeing so far, starting with Virginia and then going to North Carolina, those are two 
headwinds that Vice President Biden picked up earlier than expected. You're hearing some uh, surprise within the campaign. I'll say Virginia. That was a state that Senator Sanders was in during the South Carolina primary. This campaign invested and thought they were going to be able to do pretty well in that state of Virginia. So the fact that it was called so early for Vice President Biden, that is not a good sign for them. Right. North Carolina, this is a state that there were ads up in North Carolina for Senator Sanders before the campaign put up ads in South Carolina. They thought that they had a real shot in North Carolina. And as Aide described it to me, North Carolina was a state that was, in 2016, it was Senator Sanders' best performing Southern state. Now, he still lost by about 14 percent back in 2016. But when you looked at what Secretary Hillary Clinton was doing in the Deep South, racking up really big wins with really big margins, North Carolina was a state where that margin was much closer. So you saw Senator Sanders investing a lot of time there and spending a lot of ad, uh, money on TV ads. So the fact that North Carolina and Virginia were called so quickly, I'm told by sourcing the campaign, it is a surprise for them. Allie? Chad Bruce with that great reporting from where Senator Sanders is tonight. Shaquille, thank you. I want to bring in now our panel, Maria Teresa Kumar, NBC's Carrie Dan, and Joshua Johnson with MSNBC as well. Uh, so let's pick up where Shaq left off, guys. And we just have time to kind of go around the horn here. And so, Carrie, let me start with you. When you're looking at where the results are so far, and we should note we expect potentially another round as polls start to close here in the next couple of minutes. What is standing out to you? It's your biggest takeaway so far. I think, Hallie, the biggest takeaway that I have is the fact that Joe Biden is building what looks a lot like the coalition that Hillary Clinton was building this time in 2016 against Bernie Sanders. The big, big margins with black voters, the big margins with college educated voters in some of the more affluent counties in places like Virginia and North Carolina. That's a big takeaway for me. One big question that remains, though, is the Latino vote. I think it's going to look a lot different yeah. now than it did four years ago. Um, but that is one thing. What, comparing the margins to 2016, it might be a little bit of deja vu for Bernie Sanders. Maria, how about you? I think that when you talk about the Latino vote, it's going to be very different than what you see in Texas versus California. So I think that's going to be one of the things. Mm. But what was most interesting and is most striking is that fundamentally voters today want to win. And so it will be interesting to see how those folks that are impacted by the early returns on the East will impact those folks still in line. Because they, at the end of the day, they want anybody but Trump. And, and you make the point, too. Uh, we're looking closely at California, where, by the way, polls don't close for another several hours. And it may look different, you're right, than, than Texas, the second biggest prize, as we talked about, with Chris Jansing. Joshua, what is standing out to you so far as you're looking at this tonight? And keeping in mind, we only have a few states in, right? We got... We got 10, 11 more to go here. Yeah, I was just about to say that, Hallie, is that yeah. we're only a few states in. And I'm, right. I'm, you know me, I'm not big on prognostication, especially not this early in the night. I think it makes sense that Joe Biden has been doing well in states like North Carolina. I think Virginia was very noteworthy because Virginia has be, been becoming more blue. And so it kind of gives us an inkling of what kind of shade of blue that Virginia is right now. As you said, the night's really early. I'm interested to see how Texas and California look. Like, that's the story for me tonight. Texas, California, Minnesota. Minnesota, what might have happened if Amy Klobuchar yeah. had stayed in, in the race, who knows? But, you know, if Joe Biden sweeps up in these early primary states, early in terms of East Coast time, and then Bernie Sanders rocks it in Texas and California, then what's the story going to be? Particularly what parts of California and what parts of Texas that each of them do well in. I don't think either of, the, either of them is going to just wash over Texas or California, but those might be indicative of what the rest of of the party is looking like, particularly more, very moderate places like Texas and very liberal places like California, I'm kind of waiting for later mm. in the night to see what the story of tonight turns out to be. I got about a minute left. And Carrie, I want to go to you on some new reporting from our team covering Mike Bloomberg. We've talked a lot about, rightfully, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, the two front runners in this race. Mike Bloomberg, according to our team, uh, are talking with sources, officials, acknowledging that he will reassess tomorrow, right, mm -hmm. after the data is in on whether to stay in this race, which is, frankly, a change of tone from what we've heard from Mike Bloomberg, even as recently as, gosh, just 24 hours ago, right, when he was saying he was he was in this till maybe a, a contested convention, if you will. Right. Well, and just looking at the amount of money that Bloomberg has spent up until now in states that we have now uh, called the polls, both in Virginia and North Carolina, he was outspending all of his rivals by something like yeah. 20, a, a factor of 20 to have poll closes that that are very definitive for Joe Biden really gives a sense of the fact that the entire rationale for his run was to be an alternative to Biden. If Biden is looking very strong, it is a, a, certainly a signal, and he's going to be coming under a lot of pressure from Democrats uh, for him to reassess, as, as our Close, reporters say. Closer and closer to a two-man race here, huh? Mm-hmm. 
That's for sure. Carrie Dan, Joshua Johnson, Maria Teresa Kumar, thanks to all you for being with us. Uh, and thanks to you for watching us here on NBC News Now, a very busy Super Tuesday night. we got a lot going on, and we're going to have much more for you with Lester Holt, Savannah Guthrie, Chuck Todd. Our special coverage continues right here, right now. Good evening, everyone. It is Super Tuesday in America with primary races across the country. I'm Lester Holt. Good evening, everybody. I'm Savannah Guthrie. And tonight it is all about the delegates, more than 1,300 delegates up for grabs tonight, a huge chunk of what's needed to clinch the Democratic nomination for president. And the candidates are fighting tonight for each and every one of them, already a night of surprises. It is. It's the uh, highest stakes night of this campaign so far with the potential to transform the political landscape. Can Bernie Sanders want widen his front-runner lead. Can Joe Biden capitalize on his big win in South Carolina and those endorsements by Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, and Beto O'Rourke? And can Michael Bloom Bloomberg, on the ballot tonight for the first time, turn all those dollars into delegates? And can Elizabeth Warren do well enough to stay in the race? Those are some of the questions we'll be questions. asking and answering tonight. Yes. We're going to get the answers in real time to some of them, we think. We've assembled a super team to help us navigate through the night. Moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd, senior Washington correspondent, and Andrea Mitchell and our correspondents and guests standing by across the country. That's right. But tonight is all about the numbers. So let's get to it, Lester. Here are the polls that have closed so far. Eight states of the 14 up for grabs tonight. Here are the results coming in so far. NBC News projecting Alabama will go to Joe Biden as he continues his sweep through the South. In North Carolina, and this is a biggie to be calling so early, Joe Biden, the projected winner. We'll talk more about what this means for the race at large. In a moment, Virginia, another early call and look at the margin right now for Joe Biden. This is going to be all about the delegates, but it's a strong start for Joe Biden. Let's get a check on Oklahoma right now. 37 delegates at stake. That one is too early to call. To uh, Massachusetts, uh, it is also too early to call. 91 delegates there. Uh, Vermont, uh, of course, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, let's, I'm sorry, Maine. Uh, too early to call, and we look at Vermont, the projected winner, Bernie Sanders, in his home state. All right, so it is all about the delegate math, even more than who wins or loses a state. And this is so far tonight of the 1,300 at stake. This is who has won what, and you see Biden off to an early commanding lead. But there is a big kahuna on Super Tuesday, the super state of California with 415 delegates, and Sanders is expected to perform well. So I think we are going to have some suspense tonight, Lester. Yeah, and one change that we have seen tonight comes as a result of those devastating tornadoes that hit the Nashville area earlier today, uh, leaving at least 25 uh, dead. Polls in Tennessee have been scheduled to close by now, but they will remain open until 9 o'clock Eastern time to give folks there a little more chance to vote. Let's turn now to our Super Tuesday colleagues, Chuck Todd and Andrew Mitchell, to see what they'll be watching for tonight. I asked you that on nightly. You had a list this long. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I'll narrow it down to three, or three M's, if you will, a little tribute to our that company there in Minnesota, momentum, money, and mechanics, right? And it seems to be it's Biden's got momentum, Bloomberg's got money, and Bernie's got the mechanics. And Super Tuesday, what is going to get rewarded the most? So far, early, we're seeing momentum is but, huge. This momentum that, that Biden's gotten has trumped Bloomberg's money so far in two states that a week ago, Bloomberg was Chuck, leading. you live and breathe this stuff. Have you ever seen a 72 hours in politics that so totally seems to have shifted the momentum and the dynamic of the race? The closest was the Republicans in 2008, when John McCain came from nowhere, won New Hampshire, comes in and wins South Carolina, and all of a sudden is able to do this. This seems more dramatic. I mean, this, in, but in similar ways. Look, McCain's campaign was thought to be done in 07. Biden's campaign at times looked like it was taking on a ton of water. It now, I mean, he, he is transformed. Look, but there's a lot of delegates to, to count tonight. Let's not get over our skis. But you look at that Virginia number. It's not just that he's winning Virginia. It's two to one. No one else is registering. And the Bernie Sanders number, by the way, is looking very familiar to me. It looks the same numbers that we've been seeing for Bernie all the time. But, but, it's somewhere between 25 Chuck, and 30 let's percent. Not, let's not forget, though, this Southern strategy didn't just come out of nowhere. I mean, no? they've been talking about this for months. This was 
his route, the, the Biden camp's route, they thought. Well, and, and when Michael Bloomberg got in, he would, the reason he got in is he thought Biden was going to blow this. Mm. And it was Michael Bloomberg who thought, OK, if he can't consolidate the African-American vote in the South, maybe I can. Uh, that didn't happen, and Biden did it. And Andrea, that, I mean, how, you can't discount that that moment yesterday with Biden and three Absolutely. of his, his former challengers. Well, that was the most consequential. It has been the most consequential 24 hours. But those moments with Amy Klobuchar, Beto O'Rourke, Pete Buttigieg, and the empathy that Joe Biden showed, the vigor, and their responses. These weren't just endorsements, routine endorsements of a team of rivals. These were people with a genuine, deep-rooted affection for the former vice president, and it showed. It seemed authentic, and what we're beginning to see in, in the exit polls in, in some of these states is that he is getting a vote from, from it potentially is getting a vote from late deciders, people who decided after these people jumped over to his side. Chuck, it's going to be a long night, so can we talk turkey for a moment mm -hmm. for those who have a, kind of a viewer's mm -hmm. guide? It's all about delegates. That's so, right. yes, of course, it matters if you win a state, but you only win delegates and you have to have 1,900 right. to win the Democratic nomination. You only win delegates in this race if you get to a threshold of 15 percent. You got to get up to 15 percent yeah. in each of these states to get any delegates. And what's interesting, how many candidates hit 15 percent? We it call that viability or the called, threshold. That's right. So let's take... California. If two candidates get 15 percent over, but Bernie Sanders wins by a two to one margin, he could net 200 delegates. But let's say a third candidate makes it to that 15 percent. All of a sudden, that 200 advantage gets cut right into half into 100. So it isn't it's it's interesting how the math works. It doesn't work like it takes away from both. The, it really hurts the winner of a primary if more candidates make viability. So, win so Bloomberg and Warren here tonight. What role do they play? Exactly. Any states they finish 15 or above in, Bloomberg, that's hurting Biden. Warren, that's hurting Bernie. If you think of it as pie, it's like they're taking a slice of there you that go. pie. Right. And the irony is that Bloomberg got into this race because he thought that Biden was too weak to take on Donald Trump. That was the whole rationale. Now, if he stays in, it would seem that he is hurting Biden. But if his vote turns out to be, if he's below viability, below 15 percent, that's helping Biden tonight. And I would say that despite denials, it would seem that he would have no rationale for continuing after tonight. Well, if it he continues this way, and he has said he will help whoever is going to be the nominee. Josh Letterman, by the way, is already reporting. Uh, he's with Bloomberg now. They're going to reassess in the morning. Well, they're data-driven. They're reassessing. They want to see all the numbers when they come in, and they're going to And I have talked to some of them, and they say that they're going to reassess, but I think the reassessment is going to be jumping to Biden because, as remember, he said that he would help whoever's the nominee, and Bernie said, I don't want the billionaire's help. So so be it. He's clearly going to be jumping We're in on the talk, Biden We're going to be talking side. a lot about thresholds and 15 percent because it's all about delegates tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our NBC teams are standing by across the country at campaign headquarters, polling locations, and tracking reaction from Democratic voters in real time. Well, let's go right to Kristen Welker. She's at Biden headquarters in Los Angeles this evening, and the former vice president has got to be feeling good about this turn of events and some of these early calls in these southern states that, as Lester points out, was part of the strategy, but I don't know if they expected these calls to come so early and be so decisive. The Biden campaign and Joe Biden himself likes what they see so far, Savannah. You guys are talking about momentum. Well, one campaign official told me all of this is a sign that Joe Mentum is very real. Another campaign official pointing to those wins in North Carolina and Virginia and making the case that it underscores that Biden is strong in these more diverse southern and also swing states, areas that they will argue Bernie Sanders struggles in. Now, our own Mike Memoli did catch up with Biden just a short time ago right here in Los Angeles. He's been doing a couple of retail stops, pressing the flesh. Memoli asked him, you see him there, crossing his fingers. That's in response to Mike Memoli asking him to respond to the win in North Carolina, highlighting the fact that Biden is optimistic, cautiously, and also bracing for what will undoubtedly be a long night. Now, this so-called Joe-mentum coming on the heels of what you all have been discussing, this remarkable coalescing of moderate candidates in the past 24 hours, Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, Beto O'Rourke, all endorsing the former vice president. The big question, though, for the Biden campaign and what they'll be watching for over the next several hours, what happens in these larger states like Texas and right here in California. Now, we expect to hear from Biden a little bit later on tonight, but they are feeling good right now, Savannah. All right, Kristen Welker with the Biden campaign in Los Angeles tonight. Yeah, Casey Hunt is at the Bernie Sanders headquarters in Essex, 
Junction, Vermont. Sanders, home state. Hey, Casey. Hi, Lester. Hi, Savannah. There is, uh, we're about to reach a capacity crowd here in Essex Junction. A couple of members of the band Fish are on stage playing. It's a pretty classic Bernie Sanders scene, but the beginning of this night is a little bit tougher for Bernie Sanders than many had anticipated. Those results in Virginia, not necessarily the Biden win, but the potentially overwhelming nature of it, seem to suggest he could have a tougher time across the map than maybe they expected. Now, one top Sanders advisor told me when I asked about this, he said, you got to eat your vegetables. Now, what did he mean by that? He meant that the map gets better for them as you move west. So as we uh, learn more information as the polls close, uh, they are hoping uh, that they will get some numbers and some uh, trends and narratives that are better for them. But, you know, a big challenge here is going to be California, which comes in incredibly late. It may be too late for their narrative. Savannah, Lester. All right, Casey Hunt, thank you so much. We've got uh, Mike Bloomberg in West Palm Beach, Florida, on this Super Tuesday. Not voting today, but he's got his eyes looking ahead. Gabe Gutierrez is there with him. Gabe, uh, what are you hearing from the headquarters there? Uh, hi there, Savannah. Well, the atmosphere behind me, as you can see, is very celebratory. The Bloomberg campaign publicly is preparing, it's projecting confidence, but privately is a different story. My colleague Josh Letterman is reporting that the campaign is looking at some data that says that there's been a surge and people who made up their minds last minute in many of the states today. And that almost surely means positive news for Joe Biden. And Josh Letterman is reporting that campaign officials tell him that Mike Bloomberg will reconsider tomorrow, will reassess tomorrow after the data is in whether or not to stay in the race. Now, that is a significant change from earlier in the day when I caught up with him in Miami and he was defiant. He said that despite the endorsements of Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg for Joe Biden, that the Democrats should coalesce around him. He did admit, however, for the first time that his path to victory would likely go through a contested convention, and that has drawn increasing criticism from Democrats who say that he could tear apart the party. Now, Lester and Savannah, of course, Mike Bloomberg, a very unusual campaign, skipped the first caucuses and primaries and spent more than half a billion dollars, many, in, uh, much of that in TV ads. He's open more than a dozen campaign offices here in Florida, and this state doesn't even have its primary for another two weeks. But again, privately tonight, the news is, is that the Bloomberg campaign is expressing some concern. But again, they say that they are looking to these states and they hope he can meet the 15 percent threshold for delegates in at least some of the states, the states tonight. Lester, it's a not, a, not a small development there in terms of that, uh, that notion that they're going to reconsider based on what these numbers no, are. No, and not a small investment than Michael Bloomberg. Bloomberg has made, just to, to put a fine point on it, he's poured almost a half a billion dollars into this Super Tuesday strategy. And so far tonight, it doesn't seem to be paying dividends, but we'll see if he can get some delegates and what that, uh, how that affects the race. And we have uh, armed Chuck Todd with lots of computers and, <laughs> and, and screens. They're today. all over the place. So, I love it. so let's get started. Break down what's happening in Virginia, especially in the area of well, race. Well, I want to talk about the eat your vegetables that the, Vermont, that the, the, the <laughs> folks in Vermont were talking about with Sanders. I want to tell you about four years ago, Bernie Sanders ran in Virginia and in North Carolina. His percentage of the African-American vote four years ago, 16 percent in Virginia, 19 percent in North Carolina. So keep those numbers in mind as I give you, as I show you these race numbers here, which I believe I have over here. So let's look at the African-American vote in Virginia. As you can see here, 27 percent of it. Let's show what the split was here. You can see how well Joe Biden did. And here's what I want to point out. So Biden gets 71 percent. Look at this number here with 16 percent. What did I tell you that he got four years ago? 16 percent. If Bernie Sanders doesn't win this nomination, guys, it is simply because he has never improved this number. He has added Latinos to his coalition, but his inability to do well to African-American voters is a huge problem. I'm going to show you that the, the numbers literally in North Carolina, you're going to think I've just put the same numbers up. Um, it's, it's basically the same splits here. As you can see, there it is, 16% there in North Carolina. A little less here for Biden because you saw that Bloomberg and, and Warren got a chunk here. But this is, they call it the eat your vegetables. But I'm sorry, a week ago, guys, 
the Sanders folks thought they could do well in Virginia, that they could do well in North Carolina. They thought the margins would be better in well, South they also Carolina thought, as well. Well, look, they also thought this guy here, <laughs> Mr. Bloomberg, was going to eat more into Biden, yeah. and he didn't do it. Take a bite out yeah. of that. But the, to your point, Sanders has worked hard to build a coalition of Latino voters, and mm -hmm. there's more fertile ground with Latino voters in some of the states as we'll we see later west. on tonight. As we move west. Mm -hmm. One other thing I want to point out to you tonight when you watch uh, these numbers about when did you decide? Look at this in Virginia. Half the electorate decided in the last few days. There's a pattern going on here. Alabama was the same. The, the places Biden's doing extraordinarily well in are places where a lot of voters waited to the last minute to decide. Uh, Bernie is doing better in places that that number is closer to 20. Yeah. Does that mean they didn't fall in love with anybody? Though? No, it means that you would have, I would look at it this way, is that these were people that were holding their ballot. Savannah and I were just talking about this earlier. There's a chunk of Democratic primary voters that are just tell me who the nominee is going to be. I'll vote for that person. I don't think Bernie <clears throat> Sanders is that person. But they didn't care who else it was. And, and that's what South Carolina did. It said, OK, I'm the, I'm the guy, Joe Biden. And everybody said, fine. And, and then you saw the coalescing of other candidates that's dropping right. out the winnowing right. of the field. But there's no question in your polls and NBC News, Wall Street Journal polls, this whole cycle, Andrea, you well know as well, that it, electability has been prized by Democratic voters over and above any policy issue. They want to win. Well, look, Joe Biden was the original front runner. Remember when he first got into the race and then it showed that he couldn't survive it. Now they've shown he's shown in South Carolina and with these endorsements that he could be a winner. And they came back to him. All right. There is a lot ahead tonight, including a look at the two biggest prizes of the evening. Hope you'll stay with us. We'll be right back. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, and pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this <laughs> time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we yeah. have our very own Today Family Getaway. Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? 
All right, we're back with our Super Tuesday coverage with close races in 14 states tonight. And polls have already closed in many of those states. Let's get to the results we can show you so far. Alabama, we're calling for Biden tonight with a big win down south. North Carolina, this call came in earlier than expected. It's for Biden as well. And its neighbor to the north, Virginia, also goes Biden's way. And as the votes come in, we'll be in a better position to count delegates. And that's what the name of the game is tonight, Lester. And right now, Biden with a 7 Four delegates won so far tonight. Uh, remember, we're going to be looking at that 15% threshold that uh, puts them in the, in the delegate hunt. But that's what it looks like right now. Biden uh, out distancing Sanders right now is 74 to 22. And we should mention Sanders won his home state of Vermont. We called that as well. What's interesting, yeah. guys, though, is that Biden and Bernie uh, may be the only two candidates to make threshold in every state. That is something to be thinking about, and that shows you why they're the commanding frontrunners. Nobody else. And the question is, I, the, the shock is that Joe Biden's making threshold in every state, including Vermont. And yeah. the, the other piece that Mike this, Bloomberg might not. And Mike Bloomberg might. How and many states? I, let's yes. see. I saw he was barely over threshold in Alabama there. Alabama was the state. He filed in first, the first place he hired people. Yeah. You know, to me, Alabama and Arkansas are the biggest tests of, of the Bloomberg money machine. He went there three times. Yep. He spent $7.2 million on television there. Big and investment. The big irony is that the reason we have these thresholds and these new rules was influenced from the Bernie camp on that commission after the 2016 campaign when they felt they had been robbed by the rules and denied the nomination by Hillary Clinton. Almost half of the delegates at stake tonight are in two key states where polls have not yet closed. Texas with 228 delegates, and the biggest prize, California with 415 delegates. But with early voting, more than 2.5 million people already voted in these two critical states alone, and they're going to be counting those the numbers they have slowly there. Yes, it's a, it is. That's one of the things. California is a big story, but the, the votes will get counted slowly there. Let's go to Texas now. Blaine Alexander's in El Paso. We've got Joe Fryer in Los Angeles. The polls are closing in Texas in less than an hour, so Blaine, let's go to you. A lot of action there. This looks like a, a real race is going on. Absolutely, Savannah. Like you said, we are about 40 minutes now away from seeing the polls close here in El Paso. Now, despite the fact that we have seen rain on and off throughout the day, we've also seen a steady stream of voters walking in and out of this poll. In fact, the county tells us here that the turnout is right on par with what they saw back in 2016. Now, talking to voters throughout the day, guys, we have seen this interesting split between those who have been long decided as to who they're supporting and those who really made up their mind just within the past few hours or so we talked to one woman who said that she's been watching all of these endorsements pouring in for Joe Biden, including one from El Paso's own Beto O'Rourke. But she says in the end, she still voted for Bernie Sanders today. Why? Because she believes that he has the best chance of winning in November because of his strong showing early on. Now, we just spoke with another gentleman who said up until about 48 hours ago, he was all in for Pete Buttigieg. So obviously he had to make a game time decision because of that endorsement. He's going for Biden. So lots of decisions here in Texas, guys. All right. Thank you, Blaine. And California, the big prize with one in 10 of all Democratic convention delegates. Polls there close at 11 Eastern time. Let's check in with Joe Fryer now to get a sense of what's happening on the ground there. Joe? Yeah, well, Lester, think about it. Just four years ago, the California primary was in June. There wasn't a lot of drama then. This year, it's Super Tuesday, so there is a lot more drama and a lot of excitement and turnout here. Here in L.A. County, there are a couple major changes for voters this year. We want to show you what one of them is, and that's these voting machines here. This year, there are touchscreen voting machines, which means you come in, you select your choices on the touchscreen, then a paper ballot is actually printed out so you can review your choices, make sure they're okay before the ballot is turned in and we can see what's happening right in front of us right here there are 15 machines here one of them is obviously being looked at by some of the workers we're not sure what the reason is right now but there have been reports of a few malfunctions happening throughout LA County we've heard of a few happening here so when that happens obviously workers have to step in to help people out to make sure that their votes are counted but we have talked with a lot of people here who say that they like the new system they say it's fast they say it's easy they have been able to get through okay so there are some mixed reviews so far for the new system. The line here, we've got about 45, 50 people waiting in line here right now. It's going to take them about an hour to cast their votes. Western Savannah. Yeah, and it's not only about delegates, it's about the narrative of the night. And with all those delegates at stake in California, Chuck, that won't be likely counted by tomorrow morning, 
it will affect the narrative one way or the other. Well, it is. I mean, you know, it, we might be able to say who's going to carry the state, but my goodness, they're going to be congressional district um, results that we won't get for a week, maybe even two weeks before we know the exact numbers here. Um, but look, there's a, you know, the other thing that we're, we're seeing here with, I think, Bernie Sanders and why he appears to be hitting a wall tonight is he's also not doing what he says he needs to do, which is turn out young voters. Young voters, he's winning them big, but they're coming, they're not coming out In at the number states? he needs. This is everywhere across the board. That number is anywhere between 11 and 16% so far in all of these places. He's winning them big, but older voters are dominating, and Biden does better with older voters than Bernie does with younger voters, and, and that's a huge It's thing. early yet, but we have yet to see him expand the electorate not the way he place. has said he can. And that was one of the big rationales for his running, that he is the one who had the movement behind him and who could bring out more voters of, of all ages and descriptions. And this is why his opponents have been hammering this electability issue. And that and that is essentially a cause this realignment we've witnessed. Well, and, we, and we've been talking about it and we'll talk about it again. But one of the things I think is interesting is that early voting, which of course has been such a factor in these last few cycles, was actually down in some of the states, which meant voters were waiting. They're waiting to they see. They were watching. Who's going to be the horse that can go the distance? Look, the Virginia electorate was always the most that was, they're the most obsessive, right? Because this is the people that do it for a living. And for Northern Virginia, company town. But we're seeing that was all over the, so far all over the East Coast and then the Southeast. Voters held their ballots. Yeah. Voters held their ballots. That's a big thing, big deal for Joe Biden. It is. We've got a lot more ahead. It's going to be a long night. We've got another poll closing coming up in just a few minutes after the break. We'll be back more with Super Tuesday results right after this. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, and pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are going to winnow the field. They're probably going to create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now.
Las Vegas, from Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we got our very own Today family getaway! Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Good evening, everyone. Breaking news tonight. Lester Holt. From Washington, from Las Vegas, we begin tonight with the most trusted TV news anchor in America. That's Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt. We are back. It is 8.30 in the east, and polls have just closed in Arkansas, where 31 delegates are at stake tonight. That's right. We uh, have a race to call right here. Or not to call. It's too early too to call. Early. Yep, that's uh, Arkansas. And then uh, in Oklahoma, Oklahoma, we've got too early to call. And then we can go on to Maine, also too early to call, and in Massachusetts, too early to call. So we we'll told you, you there'd be some suspense yeah, tonight. Yeah, let's show you the delegate hall as we as we know it to be right now. And you can see Joe Biden now with 90 delegates on the night. Uh, Bernie Sanders uh, distance away at 30. And then Bloomberg and uh, Tulsi hey, Gabbard. Can we tease the viewer here a little bit? Massachusetts, guys, if you believe our exit polls, since we can now say we don't have to we can say the hard numbers, it's going to be a three-way race. We've been talking Warren's about it as Bernie and Warren. Yes. But Joe Biden is the surge hit mess, the base state yeah. as well, folks. So this is... This is, uh, it, it's, look, these numbers are very tiny, but we're going to be following Massachusetts. Yeah. They could all be above line. the threshold. They all, all three are going to likely be above threshold here, but what if Warren finishes third in her home state? Well, it, it, and then she'll you know, be, Mike Bloomberg was, was born in Brooklyn, Massachusetts, so it's his real home <laughs> state. Actually, it's his real home state, yeah. Her <laughs> real home state is Oklahoma. Oklahoma, right. which is also voting also tonight. Thing, yeah. uh, let's talk about Texas, one of the, the big prizes tonight. This The second most uh, delegates going to be awarded tonight. Uh, Garrett Hake is there talking about the Biden campaign and the, um, the, the ground game. He's visited there a few times. I think it's five visits. And then in Dallas uh, just last night, Garrett obviously having that huge moment where the moderate lane of the party, Klobuchar, Buttigieg, really coalescing, Beto O'Rourke, around Biden. Yeah, Savannah, that's right. And if you thought South Carolina was Joe Biden's early state firewall, you could think of Texas as a state that has the potential to be his Super Tuesday firewall. It's the bulwark against a potentially really good night for Bernie Sanders further west in California. Joe Biden has spent some significant time here, and he's been targeting African-American congressional districts, parts of the state where he thinks he might be able to juice turnout and perform particularly well. That includes Harris County, where I am now, Houston, Texas, and the suburbs around it, which have been trending away from Republicans for the last 10 years or so and towards Democrats, downtown Houston, districts like the 18th of Sheila Jackson Lee, and also Dallas and the Dallas suburbs. It's no accident that that uh, moderate endorsement palooza last night happened in Dallas, Texas. Dallas County, Tarrant County, Collin County, all the suburbs around Dallas linking it to Fort Worth are going to be huge battlegrounds and are potentially uh, vote rich places for a moderate like Joe Biden, particularly if he can continue to appeal in the same way he has to African-American voters and to Latino voters who make up about 40 percent of this county here tonight who will have their voices heard before it's all said and done. Yeah. We, we got a, a real tight race so far down there. We'll see how it plays out. A lot at stake there. Yeah. Thank you, Garrett. David Pluff was uh, Barack Obama's campaign manager in 2008. He joins us now with a look at how tonight is shaping up for Biden, Sanders and the race for delegates. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Uh, give us a sense of what's been happening behind the scenes in the last 24 hours in this, in this what did he call it, the moderate palooza? The, you know, yeah. Moderate palooza last night. What about night? the Avengers? Yeah. I like that one, oh, too. Yeah. That one's well, out there. Yeah. Joe Biden on Saturday, before we saw South Carolina, was down to his last political life. Uh, and now he's having an absolute dream night. Uh, he's going to walk out of the South and the eastern part of tonight uh, with a lot of delegates. Uh, and so the question is, can Bernie Sanders catch up in California? Um, and again, I think even last week, we thought Sanders might leave tonight with a delegate lead of 150, 200 or 250. I think that's off the table now. So dramatic change. And the other thing I'd say is this is all in momentum. Joe Biden hasn't spent money in these states. He has very little presence in these states. He was the national poll leader last year. And as he struggled in debates in Iowa, New Hampshire, a lot of his support left him. But it didn't go to other candidates. It went undecided. 
And when he had one good night and started to perform better, it all came back. And I think it's important to look, when you look at that map, Virginia, North Carolina, African-American vote driving his vote share and his delegate hall tonight so far, but also doing really well with suburban voters. Uh, and I think we have to watch that as we get uh, the rest of the results in tonight. But David, doesn't it also, that, that for Biden to have a successful night as so far it's shaping up to be it also, it, it, there had to be a somewhat of a Bloomberg collapse, Bloomberg not reaching viability because Bloomberg was really nipping at his heels a couple weeks ago in some of the states that tonight we've already called for Joe Biden, North Carolina, Virginia, for example. Well, Bloomberg was moving, but I think Bloomberg had to have a bunch of things happen that were really out of his control to give him a chance to be the nominee. And the most important was, was Biden losing South Carolina. And so once Biden became viable again to people, looked like a winner, all that support came back to him. Uh, and so now, if you're Joe Biden, though, you're still hoping that Elizabeth Warren and or Mike Bloomberg might be viable in California, because Bernie Sanders almost certainly will win California. So that's what's interesting about this. In Virginia and North Carolina, Biden is rooting for Bloomberg and Warren not to be viable, because he wants all those delegates, because he's on top. Yeah. So David, I love Texas as our storyline yeah. of the night, because it does feel as if these are two evenly matched coalitions. African-American, older voters, sort of traditional Democrats with Biden, um, these sort of the, the progressive independents, younger voters, Latinos with, with Bernie. What are we learning tonight? Uh, you know, I was curious, Bernie added Latinos. He's not improved by a single percentage point among African-Americans from four years ago. Can he win the nomination without doing that? No. So if you're Bernie Sanders, if you look at we're on Super Tuesday, but next Tuesday we have a lot of primaries and caucuses, and the next Tuesday after that in Georgia on March 24th. For Sanders to become the Democratic nominee, he's got to grow his suburban vote, and he's got to break into the African-American vote. So if you're Biden, you have a good night, where can you improve? With Latino voters, where Sanders has done quite well. And we do have some big states coming up, New York, Florida and Arizona with Latino population. The other thing Sanders has said all along, Chuck and Andrea, is that he will get voters who don't traditionally go to the polls to come to the polls. Often that means the young voter. We used to hear Barack Obama talk about turning out youth voters in record numbers. Are we seeing tonight whether those young voters are, are showing up for Sanders? Well, look, he's right that he wins them, and he wins them big, and he's right that he wins but people that don't normally sleep, but they're not coming in the same numbers as older voters or basically traditional Democratic voters. Mm. Yeah, so for, for the electability argument, Biden now, amazingly, because again, he was on life support just a few <laughs> days ago, can make a strong electability argument, which is I can drive African-American turnout. And the suburban women voters in particular, who voters. fueled the Democratic big night in 18, and, and will be there again. What about Elizabeth Warren? As, as Chuck pointed out a moment ago, we could be seeing a three-way race in Massachusetts. She, she could end up in, in third place in her own state. But where does this leave her at the end of the night? I think with some tough decisions. It's interesting to me because she's campaigned really well, had strong debates, but she hasn't been able to break out of the low to mid-teens. And so she's going to end tonight with very few delegates in all likelihood. And she's ending in Michigan, which is the next week's primary, to try to signal that she's staying in. But she, as David says, has a decision to make. Yeah. And she has money, though, and she has an organization. It is, but it was very interesting. You know, her super PAC, Mark Murray pointed this out, strategically seemed to spend money that doesn't hurt Joe Biden, but could hurt Bernie Sanders. So there is a... It, it seems as even Elizabeth Warren's campaign was trying not to harm the establishment. Is that, do you buy, do you buy that, that that's what this is about? Possibly. Okay. Uh, it's interesting. But, you know. The ad buys were very, it was funny. He looked at it, it was like, wow. They were very careful where they went. Right. So what's fascinating for me as you look ahead on the rest of the calendar, if Joe Biden can put together money and organization and good performance with the momentum, um, he may be able to grow his vote share in some areas where Bernie Sanders has been the leader. Well, David, thanks for stopping by. Great, great chatting with you. I think Chuck has got another breakdown for us. Chuck's well, we're going to, I want to stick to this age thing. We were talking about it a little bit, and I want to just show it to you where we have the most complete um, issue. Basically, very simple. North Carolina, we'll show you 45 and above. First of all, this was 65% of the electorate. And as you can see here, Biden clobbered it. More importantly, look at the Sanders numbers here sitting at 13%. So you've seen that. Well, let's go under 45. Sanders wins it, but it's 31% for Biden. He's doing, and it's only 35% of the electorate. So he's just not turned out his coalition in these greater numbers that they need. And then more importantly, particularly in these southern states, um, younger African-Americans are very comfortable with Joe Biden. I think that's, and, and that's, that is something, he is not winning younger, uh, David, African-Americans yet. Right, and I do think, you know, Savannah, you mentioned 
Yeah, Barack Obama used to talk about turning out young voters. We actually turned them out. Uh, and it's the only reason he was the Democratic nominee. And quite frankly, they fueled our tough re-election win against Mitt Romney. So Bernie Sanders' chief talking point right now, I don't think is holding up. Now, we'll see. We've got more vote to count. Uh, and again, it's amazing that Bo Joe Biden probably can make the strongest general election case right now, uh, where, again, we were literally writing his political obituary maybe five or six days ago. But he got saved by the African-American community in South Carolina. But he is doing really well in blue-collar and suburban areas tonight. I but laugh, David, because it's always 2008 with us, right? Back to the <laughs> Obama campaign. Say, hey, we actually turned out those voters. <laughs> What's interesting is, though, Joe Biden's African-American support is stronger in the South than it is in the Midwest. Uh, there's a, a geographic disparity there, and may, maybe it's age, but he's got more strength in the in the South and the, the Southern states. Well, this is, I mean, this has happened. Hillary Clinton basically put Sanders away in the South. You guys took the delegate lead in 08 in the South. I mean, there's a, Bill Clinton put, it, put his nomination away in the South. I, I mean, we've seen it, frankly, my entire adult lifetime. Super Tuesday Democratic yeah. nominations have basically whoever wins the South wins the nomination. But Sanders is not unaware of this history and tried to create a new coalition yeah. of Latino voters, of young voters, and you know, presumably is going to have some success. So I think the expectation is that he will win California. The question is by what margin? Well, and I and I guess the question is, is the Latino vote inside the Democratic Party starting to mature? As a, as a major part of the electorate and becoming a rank-and-file traditional part of the Democratic electorate the way African-American voters are. And, David, I, it, what it looks like to me is that's not yet. Not yet. Bernie Sanders is running a really smart campaign. They knew they had to do better with the African-American community nationwide, but particularly in the South, they weren't able to do it. The other thing I'd say, two massive southern states have not voted yet and won't vote tonight. They're coming up later in March, Florida and Georgia. How is where that, the delegate good, for, how is that good for Bernie? It's not. Okay. So if you're looking at these numbers and predicting what they may mean later in the calendar, Joe Biden could walk out of those two states with triple-digit delegate yields. Well, this is not the conversation I think most pundits thought that we would be having tonight. Everyone thought it was going to be Sanders' night. The night is not over. The night is young. There's a lot of vote to count, but uh, we will continue to watch it. And when we come back, what one key county could tell us about one of the most important swing states of this and, frankly, every election year. That's just ahead. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Oh we got God. our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now.
we're back and one of the ways we hope to help you understand tonight's results at the key battlegrounds is something we're calling county to county. And Chuck, this is the way you look at an election <laughs> map. And, and, and why do these counties matter? Well, look, we have five counties that we're watching in the five states we think are going to decide this presidential election. Florida, your home, my home state, Florida, your home state, Arizona, <laughs> Michigan, Pennsylvania. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here uh, on, on um, Michigan, yeah. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, ah. of course, Florida, and Arizona. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's counties in each of these states that help tell the story of the larger electorate. So in Florida, it's Miami-Dade. We're talking about, will those Latino voters, are they comfortable with the S-word, socialism? Maricopa County, the biggest essentially swing county now in America, in your home state of Arizona. Uh, in M Milwaukee County, it's going to be a Democratic county, but African-American turnout has to be high for Democrats to do well there. Beaver County in Pennsylvania, a big former Democratic county that went big for Trump. That's one of his big counties. And then there's Kent County that I think is the single swingiest county in America. Grand Rapids, Gerald Ford, home of the moderate Republicans who don't feel like they have a home in Trump and not sure if they have a home with the Democrats. Their member of Congress is an independent, Justin Amash, who left the Republican Party. I can't think of a better place for us to go check out what swing voters think of this Democratic primary than where we're going so to this is County. a bellwether not just for the Democratic primary, but for the whole general election. These should be voters that care about electability, mm -hmm. first and foremost. They're not big Trump fans, but they're not comfortable with liberal Democrats either. And in and, fact, and four years ago, Hillary Clinton was really criticized for not going to this county, to Grand Rapids. Uh, until days before the election, and they said she could have won Michigan if she'd gone. And remember, yeah. the Michigan primary is a week from today. Our own uh, Kate Snow is in one of those bellwether uh, battlegrounds tonight, Kent County, Michigan, which you just mentioned, where voters go to the polls in one week, yep. and they are keeping a close eye on what happens tonight. Kate? Yeah, Lister, they sure they sure are. And by the way, there are some liberal Democrats here too. Let me take you. Let me show you the room a little bit. Um, a lot of folks here were Pete Buttigieg supporters. Raise your hands, guys. And now. You have to make another choice. What are you thinking? Biden. And why? Two reasons. Pete asked us to vote for Biden, Biden. and to he support him. him, endorsed him. And um, I was kind of for Biden before, um, but then I met Pete. And is it the electability thing? Because that's getting a lot of talk tonight, especially yes. in this in yes. this area in Kent yes. County. Yes. Electability. Okay, Patsy, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Let me uh, swing over here. This is Dane. Dane, you're a Bernie Sanders supporter, die hard. All in. All in. You've been doing it for years now, since, since the last election. That's correct. What about the electability thing, though? What if, and tonight he's not having the best night so far. And that's fine. I'm not discouraged. It's not over until it's over. And like Bernie, I'm relying on the people to make the decision of who will be the Democratic nominee. And, uh, and of course, I will clearly say rigging isn't winning and so when this plays out we will see what happens in November and who will be the nominee. Dane thank you very much I want to make one last stop because this is kind of what it's going to come down to tonight. You're an Elizabeth Warren fan. Yes. And it's sort of becoming a two-person race right now. It is right now. So what are you going to do? Um, I'm still going to hold out hope for the rest of the night on Warren. Um, I think she articulates her plans very well. And then we'll see how it turns out tomorrow morning, whether what or not if, I... What, who do you switch to if not Warren? Oh, it'll definitely be Bernie um, come next uh, Tuesday when Michigan votes if Warren doesn't make it through tonight. All right. Uh, guys, they are playing close attention here, as you said. They've got one week from tonight is the vote here in Michigan, which could be pivotal depending on what happens tonight. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. And a moment of humility for everyone who's in this line of work that we're yeah. in tonight. A week ago, I don't think there's anybody who would have said it's going to be Biden's night. He's going to run away with it. So there's, you know, Elizabeth Warren. Yes, she's not having the night she hoped to have so far, but who this, knows this what race will happen. Has Why would so you know? right. It's changed every week in the last three weeks. Yeah. We're back in a moment with a look at one of the key groups of voters making a difference in this campaign. Stay with us. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al-Qaeda or ISIS. 
It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway! It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Welcome back to Super Tuesday coverage on NBC News as we watch the results come in tonight. One big voting block we're watching closely, Latinos who have the potential to make a huge difference in this contest. That was certainly the case in Nevada a few weeks ago, and it is also true of Texas and Colorado voting tonight. Polls closing just a few moments from now. Let's get right to Jose diaz Velarde. He's the anchor at Telemundo as well as the Saturday edition of NBC Nightly News, and he's been looking at this crucial block of voters. We've been talking, Jose, about how Bernie Sanders has really got a lot riding on this particular community of voters coming out in force for him. And, and Savannah, Bernie Sanders has been working the Latino community very hard for months now. And what we saw in, in Nevada was his really persistent hard work to reach the Latino community in that state for those uh, caucuses. It's going to be interesting to see what happens in Texas. The polls are going to close in just about six, six minutes or so. But what we've been able to see so far, as far as how the state of Texas is voting on tonight's Super Tuesday, it looks like about 32% of the voters that today went to the polls are Latinos. We're talking about a huge amount. Uh, Texas is a very Latino-centric state. And if you look at there, you have 32% Latino, 44% white, African-American 20%, Asian 2%, and other 2%. And some of the polls that we've been taking as exit polls on what are the issues, the number one issue that Latino voters were concerned about. And this is fascinating. Take a look at this. It's such a lopsided number. 53%, their main important issue is health care. And then race relations down at 16%, income inequality at 14%, and climate change 
at 12 percent. Healthcare, an important issue for Latino voters in the state of Texas. Both Biden and Sanders have been very clear on how they see the importance of health care. Each has a different perspective and solution to it. Let's see how they do tonight. All right. Well, we appreciate that, Jose Diaz Billard, down in Miami for us. He'll be along with us tonight as we continue to watch and as we move west and the polls start to close. We're going to have more polls closing we at the top of Texas next hour. Coming up, yeah. We will see some of those western states that do have a more significant Latino population. So we will continue to watch that. Much more of our Super Tuesday coverage, including a look ahead to those poll closings that are coming up just a few minutes from now. Colorado, Minnesota, Tennessee, moments away. Stay with us. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. There's the countdown to the top of the hour. We're going to take a breath here, if we, if we, as we will, to prepare for the next wave of poll closings at the top of the hour. We're looking at Colorado, Minnesota, Tennessee. We'll be getting our first results to report from Texas. And a look ahead to the biggest prize of the night, California. So it's a big hour ahead. Yeah, we've got a lot to get to. And already Texas is shaping up to be a real grudge match into the, the wee hours. Look, I, I don't want to tease out too much, but... But if, if our exit poll is as accurate as, as it appears to be and we're seeing early returns and all this stuff, we may not know who actually wins Texas tonight. But keep an eye on if anybody other than Bernie or Biden make threshold. Because if no one else does and this race is as close as it looks, they'll split the delegates in half. And then it's a net zero for both of them. Yeah. A huge haul um, and threshold, of course, for those keeping track at home. You've got to reach 15 percent if you right. want to get any delegates. All right, we'll be back with those poll closings to the top of the hour in a moment. You're watching election coverage on NBC Decision 2020.
like we've got this fundamental thing about human beings and we've got the way that we constitute our politics and the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal they grow excessively tribal then we'll lose this sort of way of talking why is this happening with chris hayes subscribe now more americans watch nbc news than any other news organization in the world Good evening and welcome back to our special Super Tuesday coverage. Before this night is over, more voters will have cast votes for a presidential candidate today, today than on any day this year other than Election Day itself. They call it Super Tuesday for a reason, and these votes are going to determine how delegates are allocated. So tonight's result, really crucial. More than 1,300 delegates on the line. That's a third of the convention delegates needed to clinch the nomination. A lot on the line, Lester. Yeah, polls just closed in three states. Let's take a look at the results so far. All the polls now closed across the state of Texas. Here's what it looks like with 20% in. Too early to call. Too early to call in Texas. The uh, Colorado uh, polls are closed, also too early to call, no results in here. Let's go to Tennessee. Of course, there's a, a tornado overnight there that, because of the damage there. They received an extra hour to vote polling location staying open, and so now they've just closed, and we're calling that too early to have a result. In Massachusetts, and this is interesting, we're calling it too early to call. We don't know, but that is Senator Elizabeth Warren's home state. And look how tight it is right now, looking like it could be a three-way race for delegates. And in Oklahoma, too early to call. Let's take a look at Maine right now and show you that it is also 3% in. Uh, it has been called too early to call. And look at the delegates that we know of so far as they've been allocated. Uh, Joe Biden with 114. Sanders far behind with 46. Bloomberg picks up four. Gabbard uh, with one. Well, we've got correspondence from sea to shining sea tonight. Let's go right to Casey Hunt, who is with the Sanders campaign just outside Burlington, Vermont. What's the mood there, Casey? Savannah, we are actually waiting for Bernie Sanders to come out here any minute, expecting a speech earlier in the evening, even though they are looking to the West to try and turn this night uh, into their favor a little bit more than we have seen so far. They really need California to come through for them in a big way, considering just how commanding Joe Biden's performance has been in some of those East Coast states. One advisor said, OK, we've got to eat our vegetables and then hopefully we'll get uh, to those states out west. Uh, but the reality here, Savannah, and Chuck has touched on this throughout the night, the test here was could Sanders broaden out his coalition? Could he appeal in particular to the black voters that are so critical to the Democratic Party? And so far, we just haven't seen evidence that he has. There is evidence he has a new appeal with Latino voters, and there is going to be tests in Texas and in California where there are large Latino populations to see if he can uh, expand there. But the reality is the momentum uh, that Joe Biden has seen the last couple of days, that consolidation uh, has really set Bernie's campaign, Bernie Sanders' campaign back on its heels a little bit more uh, than perhaps we had expected. So, uh, you know, I think we want to be careful because we need to see these delegate allegations in California. Uh, we know that Sanders has committed to staying in this race through the end, exactly how you uh, define it, I think is going to be a, a question here uh, in the coming days. But this is shaping up, uh, at least at this point, to be a, a pretty uh, clear one-on-one -on -one fight between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. I think you're going to see Sanders really leaning in to those contrasts with Biden. He frames it as a question of judgment. He argues his judgment on issues like trade and the Iraq war are what Democratic voters are looking for. Savannah. All right. Casey Sanders at Sanders headquarters. She says he's about to speak. When he does, we'll, of course, bring it to well, you live. certainly will. Kristen Welker is in Los Angeles at Biden headquarters, where there are likely big smiles tonight. A lot of smiles, Lester. I am here at this recreation center in Los Angeles. You can see the crowds behind me starting to gather. They are energized. You can feel the excitement here. They are feeling the momentum from these early wins that Biden has picked up. Biden himself telling reporters that he feels optimistic, although also noting that it is a long night. Now, one campaign official spoke to the point that Casey was just making. 
This campaign official trying to make the case of these early wins in states like Virginia and North Carolina underscore how competitive and how strong Biden is in these more diverse states where you do have larger swaths of African-American voters. So, of course, we've talked about that southern firewall. Will it deliver the big wins that they were hoping for? That's what the campaign will be watching for tonight as we await Joe Biden. Right. Lester? Kristen, thank you. All right, let's go to Gabe Gutierrez. He's in West Palm Beach, Florida tonight, headquarters of Mike Bloomberg for the evening. Uh, Gabe, obviously Michael Bloomberg on the ballot for the first time tonight, made a huge half a billion dollar bet on Super Tuesday, and so far it's not paying off in the way he had hoped. Yeah, that's right, Savannah. A huge, very expensive bet. And just a few minutes ago, Mike Bloomberg finished up his speech here in front of a crowd of several hundred people that has mostly cleared out at this point. But in that speech, Bloomberg gave no indication that he was dropping out or anything. He said that no matter how many delegates we win tonight, we have done something no one else thought was possible. In just three months, we've gone from 1% in the polls to being a contender. So publicly, Savannah, the Bloomberg campaign is trying to project confidence, but privately is a different story. So campaign officials tell my uh, colleague Josh Letterman that Bloomberg will now reassess the campaign, and as, once the data comes in, internally they've seen a lot of data come back that voters made up their minds last minute and that that could be uh, very positive for Joe Biden. So Lester and Savannah, again, here, Bloomberg wrapping his speech. I'm going to send it back to you. All right, Gabe, thanks. And, and, and the money will always be the story. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but money can't buy momentum, and that seems to be one of the storylines tonight. Joining us now, two of our favorites, former Senator Claire McCaskill, Democrat of Missouri, Washington Post columnist Eugene Robinson. Good to see both of you. Claire McCaskill, if I had said to you a week ago that this is how Super Tuesday was going to shake out, I'm giving you truth serum. Would you have, uh, would you have thought that, that it could happen? No. And by the way, Paul McCartney, money can't buy you love. <laughs> um, or many and, delegates. And, or many <laughs> delegates, as it turns out. You know, two things I would say about tonight. The heart of the Democratic Party in terms of winning the presidency has been black vote and the women vote. And tonight, I mean, in Virginia, where Joe Biden had one field office, a 20-point margin with women over Bernie Sanders. And obviously wiping the floor in terms of African-American support in these states that are more diverse. Uh, that probably shows the strength going forward of the Biden campaign as, as long as he stays on his game. And Eugene, what happened, what happened to the Sanders coalition? I think well, Chuck has been looking at the exit polls. The, the youth numbers yeah. aren't there. And not only that, Eugene, the African-American support he got against Hillary? Yeah. It, the numbers are identical four years later. Yeah, I, right. Identical in Virginia, 16% among African-Americans last time. And Iota. Iota, he didn't expand so, a slick. So we saw what happened to the African-American vote. Uh, you know, Jim Clyburn, South Carolina, the sort of mushrooming uh, effect that we've seen in the other southern states. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that I think the Biden campaign should be really happy about is their performance um, uh, in, in mostly white white suburbs around Washington, around Charlotte, places like that, um, uh, where Sanders is not doing well. Um, and so the big question to me for the rest of the night is we saw Sanders do very well with Latino voters in Nevada. You know, does, he has to replicate that in spades if he's going to have, if he's going to salvage this night, basically. I mean, if he's going to have... You know, a in firewall in he, he, California, he is, comparable to the firewall that Biden I had mean, in the South. Claire McCaskill, what if Texas is dead even on delegates? Like, that, that, is, that is not what Bernie Sanders was counting on. No. And, you know, his narrative for this whole campaign, Chuck, has been, I'm going to bring out these new voters. We're going to have, this has been his narrative. This is the reason we should nominate him. This probably does as much damage to the Bernie campaign blowing up the narrative as, frankly, the delegate count might. Um, just because if he can't show that these younger voters are turning out and these newer voters are turning out. Because we're seeing big uh, turnout. We've, we've, we've got a, I'm going to interrupt for a second. We've got another call. Oh, Tennessee, oh, uh, uh, NBC News predicts, predicts, Tennessee. projects that Joe Biden wins the state of Tennessee. T didn't go to Tennessee. Never that, once. That's I don't think he went once. Went. Michael Bloomberg li did multiple events there, spent right, yes, all this did. money. This was an early vote, too. If there was ever going to be a place that he's going to win some delegates, and look, he is above threshold, Michael Bloomberg yeah. there right now. But this shows you 
Look, I said momentum, mechanics, and, and money were the yeah. three M's tonight of the three candidates. Momentum is trumping mechanics and yeah, money. And money. Well, you know, okay. they always yeah. talk about the bounce. You know, will there be a bounce in the swell of support after Iowa or after New Hampshire? South Carolina not only gave a huge bounce to Joe Biden, it seems to be perfectly timed because Super Tuesday is 72 hours later. So sometimes the bounce might last three oh. days or so, but the next election is not for a did week. Did something turn this race, or is this the Southern strategy that he laid out? I think that I think the timing was just exquisite. It was just perfect for Biden, right? Yeah, the, like he the, timed it. He like had the free fall and well, all exactly. of that stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 This one of those I'd rather I got be lucky right. than good. I got this as he as he sort of you know, disintegrates, and then he and then he's you know he's like the phoenix. I mean he's he's back. But the, but the but the Clyburn endorsement. Followed by South Carolina, followed immediately by Super but Tuesday, he, which turns out to have been a good thing rather than a problem for him. He couldn't put ads up. He couldn't raise money. By the way, just got to confirm, Joe Biden never visited Tennessee. But he did he not. Never but visited Jill Biden once. was in Memphis the other day. So God she's the go-road getter. <laughs> the importance of South Carolina was that it showed that those other candidates had no path to the nomination without an African-American vote. Yeah. And so it's not just that he won it, but that he yeah. got them out of the race by South Carolina. And let's Earth. not forget that Joe Biden started doing better. I mean, that also mattered. All of a sudden in the debates, he was there. He was aggressive. His speech in South Carolina was strong. But and last the night in Dallas, Dallas. Senator, has been better. True. And also Mike Bloomberg, who in those early polls was taking a big bite out of Biden, right. yeah. falls apart on a debate stage. Right. And suddenly you've got a different race. Uh, we will keep watching it. We're going to be back in a moment with the man that Joe Biden says saved his campaign. You just mentioned him, South Carolina Congressman James Clyburn, the kingmaker in South Carolina and beyond. We'll check in with him next. You know, it's interesting. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway. Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Oh. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now.
Welcome back. It was just three nights ago that Joe Biden stood on a South Carolina stage with our next guest and thanked him for reviving his campaign. South Carolina Congressman James Clyburn's endorsement was critical to Biden's success there, and it put him in the, put him in the game in a big way. Congressman Clyburn joins us now from Washington. Congressman, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks very much for having me. You strike me as a modest guy. Still, uh, give me your thoughts on what Joe Biden has managed to do in the South. Were you a part of it? Well, I think so. Um, I made some calculations based upon the history I've had with Joe Biden, the history of, of our party, the condition of our country as it currently stands, and the dreams and aspirations that people uh, were sharing with me. And so when I visited a little church there, St. John's Baptist Church, right outside of Columbia, South Carolina, and an elderly lady said to me, she wanted to hear from me as to who I thought uh, should be the next president. And she told me, if you don't want anybody else to know, just whisper in my ear. <laughs> and I leaned down, and I did. I whispered in her ear. But then she said this, this community needs to hear from you. And I decided then that I would not just endorse uh, Joe Biden, but that I would give a speech to share with the whole country, with the world, if you please, why I thought Joe Biden should be the next president. So I was not planned. That speech was not written. Not a single word was planned. It was just that experience with that lady uh, sitting on the pew in St. John's Baptist Church. Uh, Fair just, to say it resonated, what certainly. Me. Well, Congressman Clyburn, Joe Biden will be sending you flowers, not just on your birthday, but every month, for, <laughs> perhaps for the rest of your life. But did you really think, I mean, obviously you had a huge impact in South Carolina. It was a massive victory there. Did you imagine that it would translate to what we've seen so far in Super Tuesday in places like Virginia and North Carolina? Well, no, I didn't. I didn't. You know, it, it's a little bit of a surprise. Um, but I said at the time that what I was trying to do with my speech was to create a surge, not just to win in South Carolina, but to create a surge. And so I was speaking beyond the shores of South Carolina uh, when I spoke. And I went up to uh, Goldsboro and, uh, and Fayetteville, North Carolina the next day. And I realized on Sunday afternoon that people beyond uh, the borders of South Carolina heard my speech. And, and Congressman, I'm going to interrupt for a second with some news you, you'll probably like. We've got a call now in Oklahoma. Joe Biden, the projected winner in the state of Oklahoma tonight. Uh, three delegates allocated uh, to him. Another state he didn't visit. Congressman, you were also quite blunt the other day when you said that you felt like, now that you were all in with the Biden campaign, that you thought they had some work to do, some retooling. Obviously, uh, they've, they've got the momentum and the wind at their back now, but do you still feel like there are things that need to change within the campaign structure, uh, and are you confident that they will? Well, I don't know about the structure. I just knew uh, that, that a different output needed to be had, uh, and I think we saw some of that. That rollout yesterday was professionalism at its best. The way those endorsements came from Amy and Pete uh, and uh, uh, Beto, that was masterful. And that's the kind of thing I needed to see. And Joe Biden's speech, uh, just in South Carolina, uh, the next night he did a town hall meeting, and last night in Texas, that's what I wanted to hear, not just words, to be able to feel the speech. Right. I've been told time and time again by my constituents when they say to me, I hear you, but I need to feel you. And that's what I wanted uh, Joe Biden to do, get people to feel him the way I feel him when I talk with him. Well, his presence certainly being felt in a lot of these contests tonight, as you can see, that uh, it's great success in the South. Congressman Clyburn, thank you for taking a few moments and speaking with us tonight. We appreciate thank it, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for having me. All right, have a good evening. We're going to be back in a moment with the latest results, some delegate math. Get out your calculator, Chuck, when our Super Tuesday coverage continues in just a moment.
everyone. Breaking news tonight. Lester Holt. From Washington, from Las Vegas, we begin tonight with the most trusted TV news anchor in America. That's Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al-Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, and pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Vegas, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we get to have our very own Today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Welcome back, everybody. Chuck has been sifting through all the data that's been pouring in tonight. There's a lot of it from every part of the country. Vote counts, delegate math, exit poll. It's really, it's, it's your happiest day, isn't it? And we're going to make... It's the happiest a, day on earth. Yes, yeah, yeah. so we're going to make some sense of it come, uh, coming up in a moment. Um, let's... We, uh, let's yeah, Evan Smith is here. We were going to talk about Texas, um, which obviously is a, a too early to call right now. He's with the Texas Tribune. So you got a big story there tonight, Evan. Oh, oh, sure. Well, you know, Texas likes to do everything bigger than every place else. And we have a massive election, massive number of delegates to be allocated. And honestly, for the first time, Savannah, in a long time, sitting here at this hour on primary day, I can't tell you who's going to win. We typically know hours ago who's going to win this race. I don't know. Hey, Evan, we don't know. It's I'll give you a fun call. stat. Hey, Chuck. I'll give you a fun stat. Yeah. Uh, according to our, our, our numbers, in the early vote, Sanders led by 11 points. In the same day vote, Biden led by 11 points. <laughs> Go do the right. math. I think yeah. we have a feeling it's too close to call. I think the South Carolina result was absolutely important for the decisions of people who are going to vote on 
uh, election day, we had an early vote of uh, more than a, a million uh, Democrats uh, voted early, but we're expecting massive turnout today. And when those numbers shake out, I think South Carolina, Chuck, is going to be decisive, as it's apparently been in other places. What, what is, I mean, could, you could argue the, the, the Biden moment with his, his competitors coming around. Was that the moment that shifted the momentum? Yeah. Um, I think to some degree it was. Look, you also had endorsements from some key elected officials in Texas who came off the sidelines at a very good moment for Vice President Biden. Veronica Escobar, the congresswoman from El Paso. You had uh, in Austin, the mayor of Austin, Steve Adler, switched when Buttigieg got out uh, to Biden. You had State Senator Carol Alvarado in Houston. You, I mean, you, you had people who mattered in those communities, who came off the sidelines, rallied around the vice president. And... Um, you know, Harris County and, and Dallas County represent a significant amount of the turnout in Texas. And actually, as much as I thought Sanders would lead in the early vote in those places, Biden edged Sanders. All right. Evan Smith, thank you so much for spending some time with us. We're going to take a quick break and look at some more of these numbers and results in just a moment. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Oh, we got to have our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. As we've been saying, Joe Biden have a, to, having a terrific night. Let's put up very quickly the states he has won so far, and his southern uh, firewall seems to be quite effective there. That sea of blue there, starting uh, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, working his way uh, into Oklahoma. So that's the story of the night. You know what strikes me is that before Saturday, when he had that commanding win in South Carolina, Joe Biden, in three runs for president, had not ever won a state. And now he's having the night of his life on Super Tuesday. But... This is a good time to remind everybody, yeah. Chuck, it's not about the states you win, it's about the delegates you get. Can you just explain that it for is. everybody Look, as they watch with us tonight? 15 the magic number, that 15% total. And what's been interesting is in how many states only two people are making threshold. You know, Bernie and Biden. You don't are get getting delegates unless you can get 15%, 15 of the vote. either in a congressional district or statewide. And, and we're seeing it is really turning into a two person race before our eyes. All right, we'll take a quick break here and be back with more Super Tuesday results right after this.
we've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. It has already been a consequential and exciting Super Tuesday. We're just getting started. Let's take a quick look at where things stand right now. Polls have closed in all but two of the 14 states that will be voting on this Super Tuesday. Let's start in Texas. It's too early to call this race. Boy, did the candidates pour a lot of money and a lot of time into this state, and it is going to go down to the wire. Chuck this thinks vote, we could be voting still tomorrow. But just so you tomorrow. know, the vote you're seeing now is more mostly early vote. As this goes in, expect Biden and Sanders to tight. Yeah, and you were saying things, Sanders things, things did flipped. well. And Bloomberg, uh, all, his numbers all sink in these early vote states. As yeah, the but one quick come. point. Biden did not spend time there. He was locked down in South Carolina. The others all did. It, Biden did go to Texas, just, however. Just for that last... Big, big and he was crowd. there Monday night in Dallas right. where he had that big moment. Absolutely. Okay, let's get to Colorado. Um, too early to call here. Another interesting race shaping up. And uh, in Tennessee, uh, the projected winner is Joe Biden. And, uh, of course, uh, Sanders also will make the, uh, the 15 percent. Oklahoma projected winner is Biden. And let's show you where the delegates stand for the night right now. Biden right now has allocated 130 delegates to Sanders 62. Uh, Bloomberg has picked up four. Okay, but it's 930 in the east and at 10 o'clock eastern time we'll have poll closings. Utah, state of Utah votes tonight. And here is the big one. California, a lot riding on this for the candidates, in particular Bernie Sanders, who has been far ahead in the polls there. But Joe Biden obviously um, hoping to achieve viability looking like he in, will uh, mail-in factor of uh, early voting yes in California early vote well. going on since February 3rd in California yeah let's turn to Gotti Shorts in Denver with Colorado still too early to call tonight Gotti uh, yeah, Lester, if there was ever a night to compare a primary with a caucus, it is tonight and what happened here in Colorado. You remember, Colorado hasn't had a primary in 20 years. Uh, they had one for the first time, and they used to caucus back in 2016. Now, back in 2016, there were only like uh, 120,000 people that participated. Well over a million people participated so far. And we don't have uh, this race to call just yet, but from what we've seen today, uh, the support for Bernie Sanders. Uh, from the people we've talked to has been overwhelming. However, there has been something that is uh, very surprising. A, a lot of this had to do with the early ballots, and these were the early ballots that people would bring in. It was a very simple process. A lot of people were driving up, dropping these off, dropping them off in uh, ballot boxes. But a lot of people came in here, and the reason why is because they had already filled out their ballots, and Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar dropped out. So they were, uh, they were wondering what to do about these ballots. They didn't want to send those in. Uh, some people were hoping that they could get their ballots back. The ones that already went out had already gone out. Uh, but for the most part, all they had to do was cross that out or get a new ballot. We saw that happen over and over again. A lot of those people saying that they are voting for Biden. Back so, to you guys. So, Gotti, people were in some cases allowed to change? Uh, they, if the ballot had already gone off, if they had already mailed it off, there was no way to retract that vote. But if they held on to it and they were coming to, to drop it off, they could cross this off or they could request a new ballot. And that's what we saw them do uh, several times. Today. Actually, that's a good point to, to bring up with Chuck, right. because I'm sure there are people who are wondering, well, first of all, Pete Buttigieg had, had won some delegates. What about those who win delegates tonight or already have? What happens to those delegates when they drop out of the race or suspend their race? Well, look. Uh, technically, they are encouraged to vote. Supposedly, on the first ballot, you vote to who you're pledged to. So maybe those Pete Buttigieg Iowa delegates at the convention, end up saying, at they the vote convention. for Pete in the first ballot. But if you actually read the rules carefully, they become essentially free agents. They become okay. super delegates if you want. Now, the assumption would be in a place like Iowa, they haven't actually picked the delegates. Maybe in two months at their state convention, Buttigieg or whoever gets a say, and there will be more Biden. But they they become the the, the candidate. Even if the candidate endorses. So Buttigieg has endorsed Biden. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean all his delegates have to support Biden in this case. So it, it is, a, and in fact, the statewide reality. I'm going to interrupt you. A new uh, call, Colorado. Bernie Sanders, the projected winner in the state of Colorado. Well, this is important, by the way, um, uh, why he was able to hang on here. This was an all mail in <laughs> primary, okay? All of it was in the mail. Only there was, you know, there was not a lot of same day vote. We got some of it because people held onto their ballots. But look at these numbers. Wherever 
Uh, Bloomberg, we've seen in these early votes, has done pretty well, and he's made threshold in the early vote if the vote stopped then. Well, Colorado is one of the few states that was essentially all early vote, yeah. which is why he made threshold. And in Sanders, Colorado. it was a caucus. And it allows this him is to the, win. the first time they've had a primary, and they had a, a caucus four years ago, and Sanders crushed it. But combine, go back to our vote totals there in Colorado and add up Biden plus Bloomberg, and, and you see this is a case where Bernie benefited from Bloomberg. This is what he was counting mm -hmm. on all throughout tonight. Had Bloomberg been as strong today as he was in this early vote a week ago, again, this is what it could have done. This is why some people a week ago thought Sanders was going to crush it because, again, Bloomberg was taken Biden. And Colorado's the one example where you see, because, again, the all, the, it was all male vote. It was basically the vote count stopped a week ago. A week ago, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And w before, for example, the debate and some of these consequential Correct. things that joining, happened. Joining us now is former press secretary to President Barack Obama, Robert Gibbs, and it's playing out just like you predicted, right? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe yeah, I'm giving I'd you be, too much credit. I'd be a rich man if I knew uh, if I could have predicted this. Just to build off though that last point, I think what's interesting tonight is in places where Biden needed Bloomberg not to be viable. All in those southeastern states, he hasn't been. In the states that Bernie was probably favored in, places like Colorado, uh, maybe even when we get to deeper results in Minnesota and other places, he's needed Bloomberg to be viable and help split those delegates and make sure that that wasn't a big haul for Bernie. And that's, you, you certainly could have ever hoped that all of that would go like that, but it certainly has for the vice president. And we don't know what's going to happen in California when we get more more vote in from there. But in Sacramento, for instance, where I think we're going to take a look, it's all mail-in. Robert, what is the hidden hand of Barack Obama here? <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, Robert. I mean, it, look, it, there is only one person in the Democratic Party that you would assume an Amy Klobuchar would listen to, uh, a Pete Buttigieg would respect and listen to, and no, no, this is no personal offense to Tom Perez, the chairman of the party, Speaker Pelosi, Senator Chuck Schumer, all these yeah. folks. Barack Obama has a lot of sway. Well, and I don't know that he's quite frankly weighed in on that, but I do think um, I, I do think you have seen candidates make decisions about their viability maybe earlier than we thought, right? I don't think we sat here a few days ago and thought that uh, Klobuchar, Buttigieg would get out before this. We thought maybe they would go through and just see how they did. Not that they were going to be viable, and I think they decided with their campaigns they weren't going to be, and they didn't want to stand but in the way. But what a different night, actually, Robert, and you may raise a, good, a really good point. What a different night for Biden if Klobuchar and Buttigieg had stayed in. Not because Absolutely. they would have gotten any delegates at all, but they could have drawn mightily from Biden, and it, we'd be talking about Bernie Sanders as the runaway frontrunner. Undoubtedly, these numbers that he has run up in places like North Carolina and Virginia would have been tempered. And if you think about it, he's picking up a lot of those voters that Buttigieg and Klobuchar and even Warren were doing well with. I think that one of the big stories, particularly in those southeastern states tonight, is the strength of Joe Biden in those suburban counties. He's winning white college graduates uh, two to one in Virginia and North Carolina. And that was, we saw the preview of that in Charleston and Greenville in South Carolina, but it's come to fruition tonight in a big and way. And if that continues, that would bode well, potentially, if he does run these numbers and ends up with the nomination in the general election. Just That's right, exactly where Hillary Clinton is. briefly to point out that in Arkansas, Biden is now leading. You can see 29% uh, uh, to uh, Sanders 21. That's with 21% of the voting. The only campaign that had an operation was Bloomberg in the state of Arkansas. I believe that's another state. Um, he had the he endorsement of the Little Rock mayor yeah. in Arkansas. He spent it, big it, in Arkansas. It, it is. It, Joe Biden is, is going to sweep states he didn't visit. Oklahoma, Wait. Tennessee, perhaps <laughs> in Arkansas. How quickly do fortunes change in politics? Obviously, in the last 48 hours, they have. But two weeks ago, Mike Bloomberg, the night before the debate that <laughs> <That's> <laughs> this right. network hosted uh, and that many of you were at, Bloomberg was leading in North Carolina and Biden was third. Mm -hmm. Hey, you brought up Mike Bloomberg. Kevin Sheeky, who's the campaign manager for Mike Bloomberg, has put out a statement tonight, and he said this. No matter how many delegates we win tonight, we have done something no one else thought was possible. In just three months, we've gone from just 1% in the polls to being a contender for the Democratic nomination. Our number one priority remains defeating Donald Trump in November. That is not a victorious statement, and it's also not a taunting statement to Biden or, or Sanders. This sounds like a guy who's assessing the data. And looking think, forward to what they're going to decide to do as early as tomorrow. The last line is uh, focused on the ultimate goal and not 
the personal goal, and I think that probably speaks volumes. Well, really? you were a former White House press secretary. You used to write lines like that, <laughs> right? So it's, you're the perfect person to interpret. No, I, I think that last line does mean a lot, and I think it's interesting. You've asked, uh, uh, in, you, in these interviews, asked a lot of Biden surrogates, you know, what's your message from Bloomberg? And I think they've smartly said, nothing, see you in the States. Uh, you know, I, I think making sure that these candidates feel good about who they might ultimately endorse is a big, big thing. A lot of these candidates have been looking in the mirror uh, in the morning and seeing the next president, and it's hard to get out. How does it play for the party if the, if the, the narrative here is Bernie versus the establishment? Well, I, um, I, I think in the end, I think you can run against Washington. Certainly Barack Obama did that. I think um, eventually somebody's going to have to lead the party, and that part of that party is going to include the establishment. Part of that's going to be Jim Clyburn, that's going to be Nancy Pelosi, that's going to be Chuck Schumer. I think you're at a point in this election where you want to look at addition and not subtraction. And I think the challenge of the narrative that Bernie's going to have most likely coming out of tonight is he's not growing his vote, right? A lot he's, of 20s. Right. Have you noticed that when we go through the boards, and I would just, and we'll, we'll go through them later tonight, you see a lot of 20s. OK, yeah. um, yes, he'll get a 30 when he wins the 30s in Colorado, some 30s, yeah. but a lot more 26s, 23s, 21s. Those are the same numbers he got in these same states four years ago. And that, that electoral idea of I'm going to bring a wave of new voters out is really hard. And again, if that's met by this suburban surge that you're seeing in these swing states that go to Biden, uh, again, I, th I think you're going to wake up tomorrow and there's going to have to be some recalibration about what the messaging looks like. The answer to Bernie is the voters speak. Uh, yeah. we will, and they are still speaking. We've got a long night ahead of us. We'll Robert, take a quick thanks. break right now. Robert, stand by, stick close to us. We will give you an update when we come back on where things stand. And Todd and Brokaw will pay us a visit right after this. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Oh, we got our very own Today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now.
Welcome back. Super Tuesday rolls on. It's number crunching time once again. Time for Chuck Todd, who's been drilling down. This is what we know so far tonight, this Minnesota race, Lester. Yeah. Now, too early to call, but uh, we can say that Biden is now leading uh, in Minnesota. Yeah. Okay, think about this for a minute. 24 hours ago, before Amy Klobuchar got out of this race, the thinking was Biden needs Klobuchar to stay in the race yeah. to pull off Sanders right. and win Minnesota. And it's flipped completely. Now it's flipped completely. And let me show you this one little nugget from the exit poll. Of all the states where we had time of decision, the only state where a majority of people said that they made their decision in the last three days is Minnesota. Mm. And Biden is winning by more than two to one over people that made a decision in that. You know, he's getting 49 percent among people that. People catching the way. Catching, and, and this is a case, again, Minnesota. He didn't go to Minnesota. He is, he's doing quite well in states he never visited this <laughs> Meanwhile, cycle. I know, but Bernie Sanders went there twice and also crushed it in their caucus oh, four years ago. But this a is caucus. the Amy, a caucus, I know. This, this is, is the first this primary. This is the Amy effect uh, going on. Well, look who just strolled on in. Tom Brokaw, a veteran of many Super Tuesdays. Good to see you. What do you think of this night? Well, what I think is that this is some rodeo you guys have got going on. <laughs> I, think. I was thinking on the way down here that my first convention and year for NBC in covering national politics, 1968. Vietnam, uh -oh. yeah. Chicago, Miami, Bobby, King, Bobby Kennedy and, and Dr. King. It was the wildest year you can possibly imagine. We're not at that point, obviously, here. There's a hell of a lot of chaos, however, in the American political system. If you think about the last 24 hours, we've got this very threatening disease flipping around the country and around the world at the same time. We have at, at today, just today alone, this terrible storm in the south of America where people were terrified about what's going to happen to their families. So we're going through a very difficult time. But at the same time, I think the big thing that we have to remember is that we're also at war. And we've been at war for 18 years in the Middle East, and that's getting no attention. And what stirs everything up are social media. People can go online and say anything that they want to. So it's going to require all of us who do what we do to keep our cool and to kind of concentrate on what's important, make sure that people are seeing what's factual and what's not, and not just abuse the privilege that we have to bring them but Dem Democratic voters keep saying they want the person they believe can beat Donald Trump. So we, we've seen that that, that, that shifting, uh, even as the since the, the Iowa, um, Pete Buttigieg was was the. Well, the other thing I, I do think that's true, and I you know as I said I began in '68 and I've been at every convention and every election year since then, and what is always reassuring to me as I go around the country is that people take citizenship seriously. The fact is you can go into small towns, however often you've been there in the past, and they want you to know that they believe in the American system and they're paying attention to it. Now, some of them are better at taking advantage of all of that than others are. The Republicans have really figured out how to unify themselves. They're a dwindling tribe, and they know that. But the fact is that they stay inside their and inside their lines. And that's where they're going to stay during this time. Can you remember a comeback, though, like Joe Biden's 24 hours? I mean, I'm thinking Bill Clinton from Prospero getting out of the race. Yeah. To, you know, I'm trying to think of moments like John McCain in 08. This feels like it not only rivals it, but might surpass well, it. Bill Clinton in New Hampshire yeah. also in 96. Well, I, I do think that. But I also think that he had something that we didn't pay enough attention to. And that is that he had a corner of all of us to himself, that he was playing to the hard left. And the others on the Democratic side were all right. trying to chew over the same apple at the same time. And then when they began to drop out, it opened up opportunities for somebody like Joe Biden. I must say, though, Joe's been around a long time. <laughs> and I'm, I, you know, we never quite know what he's going to do or say next. But in this time, I think all of this experience that he's had has paid off for him. And people can look at his long, long term in office, both as vice president and yeah. senator, and say, look, there were some issues along the way, but the fact is the guy's been there and he's done that. That's not an endorsement of Biden. He still has to earn his way, but he's in a position to do that. Yeah, well, we've got still a lot to get to in the all-important state of California where Bernie Sanders is expected to do very, very well. When we come back, we're going to be talking to the man in charge, Democratic National Chairman Tom Perez will be our guest when we return right after this.
to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. NBC News than any other news organization in the world. We are watching Texas very closely. The second most delegates up for grabs tonight, and we can tell you it is too close to call there. You have candidates who have poured their energies into this state, and it's going to be a tight one tonight. Sanders at the moment leading, but Biden's in there. Bloomberg at the moment looking that he might have viability, meaning he could get some delegates. So that's the all-important state of Texas and where it stands at the moment. Yeah, when Donald Trump won and Hillary Clinton lost the 2016 uh, presidential election, the Democratic Party was kind of looking at uh, a long road back, and that's when Tom Perez became the party's national chairman, and he joins us now. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure, Lester. A, a week ago, we were talking, a conversation was, gee, can the uh, Sanders train be stopped? We see this big shift today. What do you account for the shift we're watching play out? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, politics is about momentum. Politics is about making sure that uh, every constituency is heard. And South Carolina was the first opportunity for uh, African Americans at scale to have their voices heard in the general election, Lester. And that's why we have four early states uh, voting. And so uh, you saw the momentum that apparently uh, flowed from that. Uh, although, again, we've got 14 states tonight. Uh, we haven't heard from the biggest one yet, California. We still are waiting from Texas. So it's a long evening and it's a long campaign. And uh, you know, I, I played a lot of sports, and sometimes you have a good first quarter and a good second quarter. You know, after tonight, we're about 40% of the way through. So this marathon is about 12 miles through, 
and you got to go through the tape at 26.2 miles. Mr. Chairman, so, I'm thinking about long the way first, to go. Yeah, I'm thinking about the first mile when all of us were at the first debate in June, and you had a mm -hmm. huge you had 20 <laughs> candidates. Yeah. The most diverse yep. <laughs> candidate field the Democrats had ever put forward, and now it looks like perhaps a two-person race between a couple of guys in their 70s who've been in Washington for decades. Does that surprise you? Well, again, everybody had uh, equality of opportunity. We created incredible, uh, I think, very inclusive criteria. We were very transparent about it. We gave everybody a shot, and then it was up to the voters to decide. Right. And, and uh, what's very clear is that uh, you know, African Americans in South Carolina, uh, they spoke, they spoke Tom, loudly, thanks. and everyone is speaking. We'll be right. right back. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose the sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. The state of Maine voting tonight, and it is too close to call. Oh, here we have a race that looks to be between Biden and Sanders for delegates, but this is another example of Biden really sweeping in the last few weeks and seeing his fortunes change quite a bit. Warren's not going to make threshold. That's a Elizabeth Warren was counting on Massachusetts and Maine as sort of a New England, sort of her own firewall mm -hmm. to sort of keep her in. Mm -hmm. and. Boy, the Joe Biden surge, I mean, it, it made it it made it to Maine. It's making it to Massachusetts. Massachusetts is a three-way A couple weeks ago, place. Pete Buttigieg was has polling Warren, pretty high in Maine, yeah. and perhaps has Warren his vote went to Biden. Warren's won a, I she think had, she has, has won I think she has won some delegates, but because uh, I think she's going to get some in Colorado, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. All right, we will be right back as we uh, round the top of the next hour.
we've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to NBC News live coverage of Super Tuesday. Polls are now closed, all but one of the states holding primaries today. And for the candidates, the race is on to rack up as many delegates as possible. Yeah, it's already been a pretty exciting night. There's a treasure trove of delegates to be had tonight, more than 1,300 in all. That's a third of what's needed for a Democrat to be nominated in the party. It's a big night. There's a lot at stake, and the numbers are already rolling in. Let's take a look at what we know so far and where things stand right now. Here's uh, uh, Utah, where the polls have just closed. Too early to call. You can see no vote is in there. Texas, we've been watching this very, very closely. Uh, a third of the vote in there, too close to call in Texas. In Maine, uh, too close to call. 31% uh, of the vote is in there. All right, let's go to Arkansas. It's too early to call there. It, Biden is leading at the moment. Looks like Michael Bloomberg is, is going to be over 15% and maybe pick up some delegates there. It was a huge investment that he made there, so was hoping to do better. Minnesota, another uh, big surprise tonight as Joe Biden comes on strong just one day after Amy Klobuchar dropped out of the race, the home senator, and put her support behind Joe Biden. It seems to be having a different, making a difference there in Minnesota. Let's, let's show you where uh, Biden has won so far tonight. Uh, he's won in uh, three, four, five, six states now. Virginia, North Carolina, Alabama, uh, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and I'm missing one. Yeah. And then they took the map away. And, they took the map away, so. <laughs> and here are the states that Sanders has won so far. But as we keep reminding everybody, it's not about the states you win. It's about the delegates you collect. And here's the overview of where that stands at the moment. As we said, 1,300 at stake tonight. That's about a third of what's needed to clinch the nomination. And, and Joe Biden continues to be the story. Looking ahead, we will get a very important and consequential poll close in less than an hour. California, that's where the delegates are, 415 up for grabs tonight. And Bernie Sanders very much hoping that that is going to be a gold rush for him in terms of delegates. Andrew Mitchell, what are you watching now as we uh, look toward California the next hour? Well, we're looking towards California and what, first of all, there's mail-in votes. So there's going to be a whole section of votes from Sacramento, that area. We're not going to be able to count those. They even count ballots that come in as late as Friday. As long, so as, they, be, well, as, long as they were postmarked today. Ex exactly. Yeah. So there's, there's going to be a delay on that. But what we're seeing now is that the enthusiasm for Joe Biden, who had been counted out so many times earlier, he was a front runner, then he wasn't, you know, did terribly in Iowa and New Hampshire, had really built after South Carolina. South Carolina and what he did with African-American voters, the Jim Clyburn endorsement, perhaps the most important, most consequential endorsement. We talked to him earlier tonight. And it, that showed Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg that they didn't have a path to the nomination without an African-American coalition. Also, that he's doing so well, at least so far, with suburban white voters. The suburban voters that Hillary Clinton failed to get in the general election against Donald Trump, a key part of the coalition. And if he can do that, and if Bernie Sanders is not building on his yeah. uh, movement, his coalition, and adding voters as he had we, promised he could, it uh, I, could spell curtains for the Sanders movement. Look, I think we're, I think we already know how this night's gone. OK, I mean, we, we see it. The results are coming in. California is where Bernie can salvage the night. Um, and it will depend on how many how many of these candidates make threshold will it be more than just Biden that makes threshold. If you're Joe Biden, you need that. But Joe Biden's already had the night he needs. It's more likely now that Joe Biden has more delegates at the end of tonight than Bernie Sanders. That in itself is even not only an upset. Even with the big Sanders winning California. Even with the big Sanders winning California, it is hard to see how it isn't going to turn out that way. And if that is the case, if Joe Biden it leaves Super Tuesday with more delegates than anybody else, it will be nearly impossible for Sanders to stop him. And We've even 24 hours ago, the expectation was the exact, exact the opposite, opposite that Bernie it would be Sanders who would think, have a potentially I think, I think insurmountable we, I think we have a new call. We do from the state, state of Arkansas. Joe Biden, the projected winner in Arkansas. Five Another state he did not visit. 
I mean, this, so this, he is, maybe there's a strategy. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah. apparently, don't visit these states. Yeah. And Mike Bloomberg well. invested heavily there in time and money. He got big endorsements there as well, but it didn't pay off, although he may collect some delegates before the night is out. Yeah, as we've been saying, a uh, big night for Joe Biden as we wait for him to come out and speak, which should be happening shortly. Let's uh, go to Kristen Welker at Biden headquarters in Los Angeles, talk about the anticipation and how they're reacting to all these projections. Well, you can feel the energy and the excitement here, Lester, at Biden's campaign headquarters as they wait for the candidate himself, Joe Biden, to speak. One campaign official telling me just moments ago that these results, these stunning results that we are seeing tonight is a sign that Biden is, in fact, the enthusiasm candidate. That remains to be seen. But what we know, he has exceeded the expectations of even his own campaign, Lester. Okay, Kristen, thank you so much. We're going to cut it short there because Casey Hunt's at Bernie Sanders headquarters in Burlington. Actually, Bernie Sanders is at the podium, so let's listen in. You know, it's a, it's a funny thing. 31 years ago today, we won the mayoral race in Burlington, Vermont. And we won that race against all of the odds. Everybody said it couldn't be done. And when we began this race for the presidency, everybody said it couldn't be done. But tonight, I tell you with absolute confidence, we are going to win the Democratic nomination. And we are going to defeat the most dangerous president in the history of this country. We are going to win. We are going. We are going to defeat Trump because we are putting together an unprecedented, grassroots, multi-generational, multi-racial movement. It is a movement which speaks to the working families of this country who are sick and tired of working longer hours for low wages and seeing all new income and wealth going to the top 1%. It is a movement which says the United States will have health care for all as a human right. It is a movement that says we will bring major reforms in education, making sure that all of our kids can go to college without coming out in debt. Now, what makes this movement unique is we are taking on the corporate establishment. We are taking on the greed of Wall Street, the greed of the drug companies who charge us the highest prices in the world, the greed of the insurance companies. And given the existential crisis of climate change, we are saying to the fossil fuel industry, we are saying to the fossil fuel industry, 
Their short-term profits are not more important than the future of our country and the world. But we are not only taking on the corporate establishment, we're taking on the political establishment. But we're going to win because the people understand it is our campaign, our movement, which is best positioned to defeat Trump. You cannot beat Trump with the same old, same old kind of politics. What we need is a new politics that brings working class people into our political movement, which brings young people into our political movement. and which in November will create the highest voter turnout in American political history. So we're going to beat Trump because this will become a contrast in ideas. One of us in this race led the opposition to the war in Iraq. You're looking at him. Another candidate voted for the war in Iraq. One of us has spent his entire life fighting against cuts in Social Security, wanting to expand Social Security. Another candidate has been on the floor of the Senate calling for cuts to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and veterans program. One of us led the opposition to disastrous trade agreements, which cost us millions of good-paying jobs. And that's me. And another candidate voted for disastrous trade agreements. One of us stood up for consumers and said we will not support a disastrous bankruptcy bill. And another candidate represented the credit card companies and voted for that disastrous bill. So here we are. We have two major goals in front of us and they are directly related. First, we must beat a president who apparently has never read the Constitution of the United States. A president who thinks we should be an autocracy, not a democracy. But second of all, we need a movement and are developing a movement of black, white, Latino, Native American, Asian American, gay and straight. Of people who are making it clear every day they will not tolerate the grotesque level of income and wealth inequality we are experiencing. We will not give tax breaks to billionaires when a half a million Americans sleep out on the streets. We will not allow 49% of all new income to go to the 1% when half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. Now, I don't know what's going to happen later tonight. We're doing well in Texas right now. We won Colorado. 
and I'm cautiously optimistic that later in the evening we can win the largest state in this country, the state of California. But no matter what happens, if this campaign, and I don't know what will happen, but if it comes out to be a campaign in which we have one candidate who is standing up for the working class and the middle class, we're going to win that election. And if we have another candidate who has received contributions from at least 60 billionaires, we're going to win that election. <laughs> and if there is another candidate in the race who is spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, we're going to tell him, in America, you cannot buy elections. So I am excited about where we are. We have come a long, long way. And I want to, once again, thank the great state of Vermont and all of the people in the state. Not only for the victory you gave our movement tonight, but for the years and years of love and support you have given me and my family. So Vermont, Vermont from the bottom of our hearts, thank you all very much. Let's go on to the White House. Thank you. Bernie Sanders in his home state of Vermont uh, addressing his supporters there, not name-checking uh, Joe Biden, who has had a very good night at his expense, uh, but nonetheless uh, making it clear that uh, that is his main competition. He's ready for the two-man race. He's yes, contrasting he, a bit. He was, but you could feel there was a little steam out of the engine there a little bit. I mean, he didn't have a lot to tout. Notice he didn't talk about even winning Colorado. He didn't, it, that, that felt like a Bernie Sanders that, because he gave a lot more of a stump speech than anything else. It felt like a campaign that doesn't know what to say right now. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't very personal either. Yeah. It wasn't the night they expected. No. Uh, hasn't We're not been. even looking forward to California. No, which, which it was a very, like I said, it, 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 you could feel the, this didn't go well. I'm going to speak in platitudes and let's we'll figure out our message tomorrow morning. All right. Joe Biden is expected to take this uh, podium out there in California any moment now. So we'll take a quick break here and be back with our coverage in just a moment. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, and pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. We are going to start with something different tonight. This is one of those things that you have not been otherwise hearing about in the news, but stick with me. Feed your mind with fresh perspective. Get your favorite MSNBC shows now as podcasts. If it's finding clarity in the chaos. Put this in some perspective for us. If it's understanding the history of the moment. It's a very big deal to get Baghdadi. It's a tribute to U.S. intelligence and the special forces. If it's holding everyone to the same standard. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental 
thing about human beings, and we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. It is at 1020 here in the East. We have a new call for you in the state of Minnesota. Joe Biden, the projected winner, 10 delegates awarded to him. Here's how it breaks down right now. Uh, Biden out distancing Sanders and Warren uh, Bloomberg in last. At Lytton, this is a place where Amy Klobuchar, who was in the race until yesterday, was a huge factor in Minnesota. This is a Biden headquarters for the, for the night, Los Angeles, uh, and he's just been introduced. He's expected to take the stage there any minute, and now uh -huh. we see the vice president who's having a very good night. That's his sister still and waiting, wife. Still waiting for, uh, for Texas, uh, for a call in Texas, and of course California uh, coming up in about 40 minutes. But he is, what do we so have, eight states that he's already won? Uh, Seven or eight? Yeah, We're Virginia, North Carolina, Alabama, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and now Minnesota. It's a good night. It's a good night. And it seems to be getting even better. They don't call a Super Tuesday for nothing. By the way, it's my little sister, Valerie, and I'm Jill's husband. Oh, no, this is the, oh, you switched on me. This is my wife. This is my sister. They switched on me. Folks, it's still a long way, but things are looking awful, awful good. For those, for those who have been knocked down, counted out, left behind, this is your campaign. Just a few days ago, the press and the pundits had declared the campaign dead. And then came South Carolina, and they had something to say about it. And we're told well, when it got to Super Tuesday, it'd be over. Well, it may be over for the other guy. Yeah. Tell that to the folks in Virginia, oh, yeah. North Carolina, yeah. Alabama, yeah. Tennessee, yeah. Oklahoma, yeah. Arkansas, yeah. Minnesota, yeah. and maybe even Massachusetts. It's too close to call. And uh, we're still waiting for Texas and California, a few other small states to come in. But it's looking good. So I'm here to report, we are very much alive. And make no mistake about it, this campaign that will send Donald Trump packing, this campaign is taking off. Join us. For those folks, listen, go to JoeBiden.com. Sign up, volunteer, contribute if you can. We need you, we want you, and there's a place for you in this campaign. People are talking about a revolution. We started a movement. We've increased turnout. The turnout's turned out for us. 
That can deliver us to a moment where we can do extraordinary, extraordinary things. Look, our agenda is bold, it's progressive, it's a vision where health care is affordable and available to everybody in America. Where we bring drug prices down under control with no more surprise billing. Access to hospitals in rural areas as well as urban areas. Access to care. A bold vision where we invest billions of dollars to find, and I promise you, cures for cancer, yeah. Alzheimer's, and diabetes. Yeah. Standing up to and beating the NRA and the gun manufacturers. Yeah. And leading the world to take on the existential threat of climate change. Yeah. I'm going to start by rejoining an outfit I helped put together, the Paris Climate Accord, yeah. and we're going to move it along. where the quality of education will not depend on your zip code. Yeah. Where we triple funding for low-income school districts, providing raises for teachers. Yeah. Full-time school for three, four, and five years old. Yeah. And increasing exponentially the prospects of their success. Free community college, providing credentials for every job of the 21st century. and significant reduction in the cost of going to college and your student debt. If you volunteer, you pay nothing. <laughs> Folks, we can do this. And let's get something straight. Wall Street didn't build this country. You built this country. The middle class built this country. And unions built the middle class. And the neighbors we come from, the three... Let Jerry die! Obviously, uh, a few protesters rushing the stage and uh, plenty of security there to walk him away. And uh, Joe Biden will continue. We're gonna go. Look, the middle class is getting clobbered. The middle class is getting clobbered. Too many people in the neighborhoods that Jill and Val and I grew up in. So everybody, they're getting hurt. They're badly hurt. And guess what? They're the places where we come from, many of you come from. It's where we were raised. The people, they're the reason why I'm running. There's a reason why I'm a Democrat in the first place. These are people who build our bridges, repair our roads, keep our water safe, who teach our kids. Look, who race into burning buildings to protect other people, who grow our food, build our cars, pick up our garbage, our streets, veterans, dreamers, single moms. And by the way, every dreamer have hope because I'm coming and you're not going anywhere. And we're going to provide a pathway a pathway for 11 million citizens. If the other guy had voted for the, the well, I don't shouldn't get into that. I won't get going. <laughs> Look, the iron workers, the steel workers, the boiler makers, the plumbers, the electric workers, these are the people that have been forgotten. I agree with you, man. Look, the people Trump forgot, the people I will never forgot, I will always remember. Folks, that's why we need an economy that rewards work, not just wealth reestablishes the middle class, and this time brings everybody along. Everybody. Regardless of their race, their ethnicity, whether their, their gender, their disability, their economic state, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, every strike. Look, like we did in South Carolina, like we did across America today, like we'll do on our all the way to the White House. Look, that's why I was so proud yesterday being embraced by Amy Klobuchar. We won Minnesota because of Amy Globachar. And we're doing well in Texas because of Beto O'Rourke. And that's why, that's why I was so proud, so incredibly proud to have Mayor Pete's endorsement as well. There's a man of character, intellect, and courage. And by the way, I was proud to be endorsed by Jim Clyburn. Man, he is something else. Look, our campaign reflects the diversity of this party and this nation. 
And that's how it should be, because we need to bring everybody along. Everybody. We want a nominee who will beat Donald Trump, but also, also keep Nancy Pelosi the Speaker of the House. Win back the United States Senate. If that's what you want, join us. And if you want a nominee who's a Democrat, a lifelong Democrat, a proud Democrat, an Obama-Biden Democrat, join us. Look, this all starts with a revival of decency and honor and character. Trump has, fla has, has fanned the flames of hate and sought to divide us. He's insulted, demonized, and actually just, just the way he talks about people. He has not a single sense of empathy. He doesn't have any compassion. No regard for the values that made this country who we are. Not the way you were raised by your moms and dads. He looks at honesty and decency and respect, and he views it as a sign of weakness. He doesn't believe that we're the beacon to the world. He doesn't believe we're all part of something bigger than ourselves. That's why I've said from the moment I announced for this candidacy, we're literally in a battle for the soul of America. Yeah. Folks. Joe we Biden need um, 19 Americans. whipping up the crowd there in Los Angeles in, in, a, in a moment, in a role that he's never really had a lot of experience. We now, what a safe, savoring victory. What a difference 72 hours makes. Joe Biden's fortunes have completely turned around. Probably not since getting nominated, not since he asked to be vice president. Has there been a bigger moment in his political career? Yeah, as we were talking That's about, tight. he's run for president yeah. three times, but his first victories came Saturday in South Carolina and tonight, yeah. a Super Tuesday that no one, including Joe Biden, probably expected. Uh, to the point where he was so into, we've been joking, it's sort of like a sports movie ending here for him, like, you know, out of nowhere, out of the ashes. But he seemed to spike the football. He says, in the other guy might not even make it out. You're like, Whoa, dude. And, and, you know, and regarding still got a lot, we still got a ways to go. Regarding the other guy, we should note that while he was speaking, you saw on the bottom of your screen, uh, uh, Sanders picked yeah. up Utah, yeah. uh, the projected winner in Utah. All right. Our special Super Tuesday election coverage rolls on more results from key races. We still await poll closing in California. We've got much more of our coverage straight ahead. Let's give you a quick check. Uh, Maine, Massachusetts, Texas, California. We're waiting for calls in all those races. Okay, tonight. yeah, some big ones. There's still some votes to count. We've got Mayor de Blasio here, who, of course, was a one-time presidential candidate. We know, of course, the mayor of New York City and here as a Sanders surrogate. This isn't the night that, that Bernie Sanders expected. What do you think, and, and um, are you still hopeful that he can pull it out? Savannah, this night is not over. Yeah. Two biggest states in the country yet to come. I feel very confident about what you're going to see from California and Texas. And what we have is a two-person race now. I mean, this is what's definitional about this evening. A two-person race, extraordinary contrast between Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. The next debates, I will predict, March 15th could be just two people on the stage. Mm. And that's going to be a very powerful moment for Bernie Sanders. He's going to have the advantage in that setting, I believe. So a whole lot more to play out. Game on. And as a Bernie Sanders supporter, I feel perfectly confident there's a pathway to victory. Mayor, our, our exit poll shows that those voters who, who for most important for them, is beating Donald Trump, they're breaking, uh, breaking toward Biden today. What does that say about the progressive movement about Bernie Sanders? It says that all of us who believe in Bernie Sanders have to get the message out. Here's a fact. 56 out of 60 major national polls in recent months show Bernie Sanders beating Donald Trump. I mean, that's just an objective 
fact. It is a fact that Bernie Sanders can create energy, younger voters, obviously Latino voters, the crucial constituency of the future in this country. Bernie Sanders proving he can move them, bring back but, Trump but, voters. But he has which not expanded the electorate. You know, yeah, he has not numbers. expanded his base. And look, I, I want to see that too, obviously. I'm be very interested to see what happens in California. But I do think there's a difference between a primary, up till now, a crowded primary, a kind of confusing primary, versus a clear general election. But Mr. Mayor, you look at, and, and we're going to show this in a few minutes, but uh, the state of Virginia against Hillary Clinton, he got 16 percent of the African-American vote. State of Virginia against Joe Biden, he got 16 percent of the African-American vote. But he's had four years to try to, and he has made real efforts to try to make inroads. It hasn't worked. Which, why? OK, first of all, we don't know until Texas and California speak, both of which have very large African-American communities. We don't know. Well, the we difference. see it in our numbers. We are seeing okay. once again, let's Biden's wait. got the African-Americans and that's it's, it's showing in Texas. Too. Chuck, first of all, let's get the votes in and then we can fully analyze. I do think the South has its own character. I think other parts of the country are different. In my state, in New York, I think he's going to do great in the African-American community. There's almost two million African-Americans in New York City alone. I predict he'll do very well in New York City. So I think Bernie's got work to do. That's normal. But look at what he's done in the Latino community, which is revelatory. That's the future of the country. Look what he's doing with young people. And again, the ability to pull back Trump voters. We've seen this in a lot of the exit polling. We've seen it consistently. He can reach the folks that unfortunately we lost in 2016. We never should have lost to begin with. There's a lot more to play out here. And I think we saw that Bernie's been counted out plenty of times. Obviously, Biden was, too. If all the energy is now about, oh, inevitable Joe Biden, you're about to get another surprise as Bernie Sanders now surges in the states ahead. How did you interpret, how did, when, when you saw Buttigieg and Klobuchar and, and Beto rally around so quickly, rally around Biden, what, was, what signals does it, does it send about this race, about the state of the Democratic Party? Lester, it wasn't surprising philosophically. I mean, you're talking about three folks in the end that align themselves much more as moderates than progressives. And that's fine. I, I, I don't buy that the individuals move vast votes suddenly. I think it is a simplified field that gave voters different choices and voters acted on it. But now you're going to have a one-on-one -on -one race, and there is nothing like Wait a one-on-one -on -one race. That Senator changes Elizabeth everything. Senator Elizabeth Warren is still in this race. Uh, do you and think Michael that Bloomberg is still in this yes. race, but let's see what happens in the next few days. Yeah, but, if, but if, so, if Senator Warren is someone who conceivably t draws votes from Sanders, do you feel as a Sanders surrogate that it's time for her to take a hard look at whether or not she should continue? Look, tonight was not a great night for Mike Bloomberg or Elizabeth Warren, although I think the historical amazing phenomenon is a guy who spent hundreds of millions of dollars, got almost nowhere. That actually is a vote of confidence in the American voter. They made their judgments based on facts and information, not just paid media. But look, I think Elizabeth Warren is with Bernie Sanders. They're the two great progressive leaders of the country. I think they should team up. I think they should pool their delegates. But she has to come to a decision like every candidate in her own time. And what should Mike Bloom Bloomberg do now? I know Mike Bloomberg enough to say that decision will be made based on a very personal and I would dare say ego driven considerations, but he doesn't have support. It's abundantly clear. And no one's ever come close to spending this money, this much money ever in history. And it got him almost nothing. It's breathtaking. That first debate, and congratulations, this is actually a, a vote of confidence in the media and in debates. That first debate was more powerful than all the advertising in the world, because he literally could afford all the advertising in the world. The people saw it. They saw it for a few hours. They made a judgment. It's a resounding vote of confidence in democracy that that was even possible. You, you arguably became mayor by running against Michael Bloomberg. I, I take did. It. I, I take it. Arguably, all right. I, take it. I take it you're sort of you're reveling in this a little bit. I do think justice is being served. And I respect. Look, Michael Bloomberg, I will always give him credit for his work on gun control, climate. He's done some good work. But as mayor of New York City, unfortunately, he divided the city. He actually took us backwards in some real ways, and he didn't listen to the people. He was actually aloof from the people. But all that wealth gave him armor. And I think the truth is coming out. And I have to say, as someone who's watched elections for decades, if I had said to you, I'm going to put a quarter billion dollars on the table, am I a sure winner? I, I think we all would say, yeah, that's probably an unbeatable dollar figure. The fact that tonight he's won essentially nothing? Wow, democracy is actually functioning, my friends. It's pretty amazing. Mr. Mayor, good to have you stop by. Thank, Thank you so you. much for your insight and Thank analysis. You. Thank you, Mayor de Blasio. We will be back in just a few moments with more of our coverage. In about 22 minutes, the polls close in the all-important state of California. The biggest delegate hall of the night right there. We'll bring it to you. White terrorism? 
And white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, and pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we got our very own Today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? East Coast, and we await that poll closing in California. Super Tuesday rolls on. It's already been a big night for Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. Not the night he expected, but we just heard one of his main surrogates say it's not over. Another big state in play, Texas. We're still yeah. waiting to, uh, for a call on that. Absolutely. Chuck, we love it when you go to the board. You like numbers? Do, yes, we love it. I made a little test. Do you remember the percentage that Bernie Sanders won New Hampshire with? Do you remember that percentage, everybody? You said there would be no math for us. All right, Chuck. but you only have to know the percentage here, right? Let's go, let's see. It, it, we'll go back to New Hampshire. I want to remind folks of something. That is the New Hampshire number, 26%. Big crowded field. Okay, 26%. Keep track of that number because there's an interesting phenomenon tonight as we're watching things uh, move around. Let me take you to the Bay State over here in Massachusetts. 
Um, oops, that's Connecticut. Apologies there. Massachusetts, let me show you a number. 26 percent. All right. Let's go down the coast here a little bit. See, I can mess around with the map a little bit. All right. I think this should give us Virginia. All right. What's that number? Oh, 23 percent. Let's go down to North Carolina. What's that number? Hmm, 24 percent. Let me go over to Tennessee. What's that number for Sanders? 25 percent. Let me take it to Alabama. Now, that's not so good. That's 16 percent. Um, I think if I, I think I move over here to Arkansas, we'll show you what we got going there. 21% for Sanders. Let me move over here is Oklahoma. 25%. Do you see a pattern, guys, no uh, as we're sitting here? No 30s, lots of 20s. More importantly, these are almost identical to some of the numbers he got before. He has not expanded his coalition. It's so interesting. And you're seeing it. It's just, and the field we can get smaller. We just heard him say, he, that was, I mean, granted, it's his stump speech, but he was just talking about how are we going to win by turning out new voters, by getting the Latinos to the polls, by getting the youth to the polls. We haven't seen those big Latino-rich states in yet, Texas and California, in fairness, but and you, saw, you see look, a ceiling. They want to sit there and say this is a Southern thing, but we're seeing it, you know, he's the ceiling somewhere between 25 on some good days, it can get up to 35. In some states, we're seeing them in the 30s. I mean, we are going to see tonight, Joe Biden's going to get over 40 and 50, and even in, in, in Alabama, over 60 percent, multiple states where he will get north of 40 and 50. I don't know if there's a single state tonight other than Vermont that Bernie Sanders is going north such, of 40. You know, he's worked so hard for four years. He's got the best fundraising operation in American political history, online fundraising. Mm -hmm. so, and so what, what is the failure to connect? Uh, look, I think the biggest thing, obviously, has been the African-American vote, number one. But it's been older voters. And I think there's two things here. Number one, the African-American vote is not nearly as liberal as, as it may be a very uh, devoted Democratic constituency, but it's not an ideological liberal constituency. And then the older voters, older voters, they hear that S word, socialism, democratic socialism. Young voters are not scared of that. Young voters, I mean, you know, think of the average 30 year old, go back 30 years, okay? You're, you're in the 90s, right? So we, the Bolshevik, we weren't even talking about the Bolsheviks the and all of that. The wall is down. Yeah, the wall is already <laughs> down and all of that stuff. But for older voters, you know, these are the ones that grew up uh, in the Cold War era. So, Two important constituencies in primaries, older voters in general, African-Americans, and, and Bernie Sanders hasn't been able to get over. There's these reservations, and I think with African-American voters, it is ideology, and with older voters, in some ways, it's that. But it's that you social. also hear a lot about people describe him as consistent. His message tends to be very focused on income inequality, and it's very much the same thing we heard in 16. And I want to defend something Bill de Blasio said. It is true, Bernie does better with this slice of voter that voted Obama in, in 12 and voted Trump in 16. Sanders has a better shot at winning those voters. The problem is, what number? What do you give up to get that voter? To get that voter, Sanders suddenly puts some suburbs in play that a Joe Biden doesn't. And, and, and the problem, when you look at these, he's right about these general election matchups. But in all of these places, it assumes this youth turnout that, that is just not ever shown up. And there's in a any larger election. suburban vote. That's a bigger vote, probably, than the Trump-Obama vote. It, it, it may be. Polls closing in California in about 13 minutes. We will have that and show you the rest of the numbers and where we stand on a number of states still outstanding as we continue our coverage on this Super Tuesday.
Welcome back. 14 states uh, in play in, in on this Super Tuesday, but a lot of other states watching along, including Michigan, one of the places we've been focusing to try to get a sense of where things may go. Uh, Kate Snow is with a group of voters in Michigan uh, to see how they might be influenced by what we're watching here tonight. Kate? Yep. Hey, Lester, we're in Grand Rapids in western Michigan. They vote in Michigan next week, a week from tonight. I'm with Bridget. Bridget, you used to support Pete Buttigieg, now Biden, Joe Biden, right? Mm -hmm. And you were telling me that this is a lot around moderate Republicans here in your town. You think that they might actually swing over to Biden? I do, because we had a lot of future former Republicans, these Jerry Ford Republicans that were coming towards Pete because they, they, it, he, his values really spoke to him. So I think that with his endorsement, of Joe Biden, we can easily sway those future former Republicans and back was, over to Joe Biden. it was really tight here last time. Trump won it the was. county by 9,000, 9,000 votes. So let me go over here. Okay, Ahmad, real quick, Bernie Sanders is your guy. Yep. Why? Because I believe that he's going to bring in new voters into the uh, Democratic electorate. That he'll bring more people into the tent. And Austin, also Sanders? Yeah, I just believe he's going to bring a social change, and I'm ready for change. Oluerio, you used to support Julian Castro, right? Yes, and now right. you you told me you're looking at this field and you're not not real happy. I'm disappointed. We have two people that are eight years old. We don't have diversity. We don't have women. We don't have minorities. So um, I'm going to have to make up my mind to see who's the best candidate left. You got about six and a half days to I make will, up your mind. Is it going to be last minute? I will make a decision. Yeah, we're good. But you think it'll be last minute? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let me go over here. Um, you're with Next Gen. There's a few of you here tonight trying to sign up voters, trying yes, to get young voters out in Grand Rapids. Yes, ma'am. Why is that so important right now? I mean, obviously, it's going to, if you get more people out, more Democrats out. Right, their voices need to be heard. We are the largest voting bloc in this year's election. Um, we matter, and our voices matter. And people of color matter, youth of color matter. We have youth all across West Michigan registering young people, young people out. We're also going into the detention centers, registering young people out, too, because they matter, too. And so this is our opportunity to let our voices be heard. And you think that could really make a huge, it will make obviously, a, it a huge will make difference a huge in this county, which could make a difference in Michigan, the state, it which could make, make a, a difference, difference. We, in went, the we went blue in 2018. We have a progressive governor. We have a progressive state attorney general. We also have a, a progressive um, uh, here in West Michigan. We have a progressive um, uh, state rep here as well. What, what about you personally? Do you, have um, you made up personally, your mind? Personally, I'm undecided still. Um, I'm more of a progressive, but I do not know. You I were know. talking about Elizabeth Warren earlier. I was. I was talking about Elizabeth Warren or Bernie, but I don't know. On the looks of tonight, it looks like um, Elizabeth Warren is not doing too well. So my decision will be made in the next few days. And will, will you, you'll calculate it based on how yes, she does tonight? I will calculate yeah. it based on how she does right, tonight. Thank you so much. Lots of different voters here tonight. I, I got to tell you, the, old, the one campaign we really haven't heard support for is Mayor Bloomberg. Guys, um, no, uh, there's a couple staffers here, but not paid staffers, but not uh, people showing up saying that they're for him. But other than that, it's kind of been a divided camp between the other three candidates. Yeah, it's interesting, though, to hear people say they're going to decide down the last minute, and we saw some of that uh, tonight. Yeah, we've already seen it tonight. In, in, in many yeah. cases. Chuck, the late breakers have been going for Biden, which speaks to the momentum that he had. But it also speaks to Democratic primary voters. Again, if you want proof that all they're focused on is electability, they're holding their ballots for a reason. They're waiting to the last minute because they're trying to figure out. This is We saw it in Iowa when there was this paralysis at these caucuses. Well, it, you know, these voters just want to know, tell me not, who it is. It's not the issues. Tell me who it is. It's not the issues. They're not voting on issues. Yeah. A lot more to come as we uh, watch uh, more calls and more states. And we'll be back with more coverage after this. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, and pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. 
This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we have our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Well, in about three and a half minutes, we will have a poll closing in the mighty state of California, 415 delegates. It's a big one. It matters a lot to Bernie Sanders. He's expected to win there, but the question will be by how much and how many delegates can he bring home on a night that has turned out to be Joe Biden's night. It has, you know, look, and one of the things that also hurts Sanders tonight is that he's not dominating in Texas. He was counting on Biden and Bloomberg to split that vote, and he would be able to have a huge delegate lead in Texas, but Texas is really... It's going to be a nail biter all night. And, and you really see the different strengths and weaknesses of both of them here. You know, let me go by age in Texas and look, it can show you. Here's people 65 plus, And it'll tell you here. Guess who dominated there? There's Joe Biden, 46 percent. Bloomberg's in second. Sanders there in third. But look at young voters in Texas. And we will go here and show you that. Not as big of a part of the electorate, but a massive victory for but Bernie Sanders. Are you Sanders saying there here. wasn't the turnout of the young? I mean, the, well, obviously, he's winning, he's, vote, he's winning the youth vote, but it's not turning vote. out. 16 percent of the electorate is 18 to 30, which actually is one of the higher totals we've seen in any state. And guess what? Sanders is, in the, is getting close to 30, you know, when that number is up there. But that is you're seeing that big uh, difference there. The other part here, I believe there's an ideological uh, aspect to this that's kind of uh, that's been interesting here. Look, this is Sanders. He dominates very liberal and he's doing there and he wins this big 52 percent Biden Chuck, and gonna, Warren a distant we're gonna, second. We're going to uh, cut you off just for a oh. second because we've got a call in the state of Massachusetts. And it's Joe Biden. Joe Biden is the projected winner uh, in the state of Massachusetts. 19 delegates. That awarded. means Elizabeth Warren did not that win her stunning. home state. And that is not a result that was expected. Bernie Sanders from the neighboring state, in the, the Northeast is supposed to be their territory. And here you have Joe Biden going to be the projected winner there and going to pick up delegates and there. But you will look at you have the three of them will Sanders share because you got to go either. over that viability. Let me show you why this happened in Massachusetts. It's very quick. This is just among all liberal voters, two thirds of the electorate. Look at this. Sanders, 33. Warren, 28. They split it. Yes. Got Biden, 27. He dominates among moderate and conservatives. And guess what happens? Yeah. He wins the Massachusetts primary. Yep. And you don't see Bloomberg. And obviously, Klobuchar and Buttigieg are out. So Biden's got the field to himself as far as the That's the, right. The, the split in Massachusetts right. benefits well, Biden. Yeah. For those of you uh, in the eastern and central time zones, your local news is next. In the west, we continue. And for all of you, there is continuing coverage on our streaming service, NBC News Now, which means you can't escape us. That's right. We're there. <laughs> we'll see you in a <laughs> <All right. laughs>
Good evening, every night, everyone from New York. This is Super Tuesday, a big night, 1,400 delegates on the line, and already it's been an unexpected and positive night for Joe Biden. We await California results. The polls have closed there now. It is too early to call, so this is going to be a number we continue to watch as the night rolls on. Massachusetts, we just called that last hour, and it's an unexpected victory for Joe Biden. Uh, Sanders and Warren dividing the progressive vote there. They'll pick up delegates, though. Texas, this is going to be a nail-biter. This one could go late into the morning in terms of the vote there. A two-person race at the top. Maine, Biden, uh, is it's too close to call there, so we don't have a result there either. Sanders scoring a trio of victories. First in Utah. There he is, a commanding lead over uh, uh, Mike Bloomberg right now. Uh, in Vermont, uh, Sanders will, uh, I'm sorry, Colorado. Uh, Sanders is the projected winner, as well as Vermont, his home state. All right, let's look at the night that Joe Biden has had, and it's been a big one, winning in North Carolina, Virginia, Minnesota, Tennessee, Alabama, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. So he's sweeping the South, posting some huge margins there, which will make him rack up the delegates. And it's all about delegates tonight, not just about the states you win, but how many delegates you go home with. And right now, Biden is leading in that regard. And as we kind of reset here, 8 o'clock Pacific time, California polls just yeah. closed, Chuck. But that is clearly what Sanders was hoping would be his firewall. The question is, will it be? Well, it has to be. We've done Mark Murray. Uh, it's done our, we've done our sort of projections of what we think the delegates are going to look like for all the states, not named California, as it looks like. And this is a semi-conservative estimate here. But we have Biden going into California, assuming everything plays out the way it is in every other state, with about a 100 delegate lead going into California. So then there's three different scenarios to be watching for tonight as this number comes in from California. First of all, how many candidates meet threshold? We expect Sanders and Biden to definitely meet threshold. Okay, the question here is, if you're Bernie Sanders, you don't want anybody else to make threshold. If you have it as two, he should be able to, he can possibly come out of tonight with maybe a 150, 200 delegate, you know, something big like that, and he can grab the delegate lead narrowly, but grab the delegate lead back from Biden. But right now, Elizabeth Warren looks like she's going to be really close on threshold. If she meets threshold, that's going to bring that Sanders number down. And, it, and the possibility of, of it, it almost as if Biden may not, it may not matter what happens in California. He could have this delegate lead regardless of California if you have a three-way race the way we see it and Sanders is held sort of under that 40 percent. Good time to redefine our terms when you say meeting threshold. As we mentioned, 15 percent. You have to get to 15 percent to get any delegates at all. And so if 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 Senator Warren is able to get above 15 percent in California, she can start getting delegates and that would diminish. Bernie Here's the Sanders good news tonight. Hall. Here's the good news tonight. Um, I think we will know everything in California sometime by the end of the month. <laughs> right. I mean, unfortunately, yeah. I mean, I hate to set everybody up. We're going to be watch it come in, and we, you know, we're going to watch this vote come in. But it's going to take forever. Uh, you, Lester, you're, you, you've, uh, you've been a California native. It, 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 you mail in your ballot. It, it can be days later, though. It, 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 it right? takes a while. And uh, Andrea, let's talk about something that came up in, in, in the debate that we did recently. This idea of whoever has the most delegates leading up to the convention, and it was... Interesting, interesting fact here. And, and it was Sanders who said the one with the most delegates, even if they don't well, get Chuck the majority... Well, Chuck Todd asked the question of all the candidates at the debate in Nevada, uh, you know, will you all pledge that you will follow the rules at the convention and uh, you know, you know, support the nominee who has the numbers or goes through the second ballot to get the numbers? And it was only Bernie Sanders who said he would not, that he would support whoever has a plurality of delegates. And he was Case speaking as a front-runner at that moment. Of course. Time. Uh, he was speaking as a front-runner, and it was exactly the opposite of what he was arguing four years ago against Hillary Clinton when she was in front. And well, just in case people don't under, understand exactly what this, this has to do with the question of how many votes you have as you go into the convention, whether you should be the nominee if you don't have a majority, but you have more votes than anybody more else, the so-called yeah. plurality. And the party rules are that you have to have 1,991 delegates going into the convention or else it would go to a second 
ballot. And that's when members of Congress, governors and others that are, used to be pejoratively referred to as superdelegates can weigh in and they are not bound by any. You're right. Jim Clyburn hates that term. He's like, we're unpledged delegates. Mm -hmm. It's not a superdelegate. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't like, like how that, that sounds. Sort of it's the only time label. super is not a good word to be associated with. <laughs> we heard no, that. I would want to be a delegate more powerful than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> we heard from Joe Biden in the last hour and he said, uh, understatement of the night, it's been a good night. Uh, let's go to Kristen Welker, who is now uh, in Los Angeles with more from the uh, headquarters there. He has made in the state. Lester, this was a fired up Joe Biden who took the podium earlier tonight and really energized this crowd, touting these results which have exceeded his expectations, his campaign's expectations. And he tried to make the case tonight that he is the candidate to bring out a more diverse electorate and, frankly, to get people excited and energized and enthused about this election. Take a listen to what he had to say to the audience tonight. Just a few days ago, the press and the pundits had declared the campaign dead. And then came South Carolina, and they had something to say about it. And we're told, well, when he got to Super Tuesday, it'd be over. Well, it may be over for the other guy. Tell that to the folks in Virginia. North Carolina. Minnesota, and maybe even Massachusetts, it's too close to call. And uh, we're still waiting for Texas and California, a few other small states to come in. But it's looking good. So I'm here to report, we are very much alive. Now, we should mention that Biden's speech was briefly interrupted by a few protesters who took the stage. They were quickly ushered off the stage. No incident. No one was harmed. But I spoke to some supporters here to try to get their reaction to what they heard from former Vice President Joe Biden tonight. And they said they liked his energy. They liked the passion that he showed tonight. They say, look, they saw this in South Carolina and they want him to keep it going. They believe this is the way to not only win the nomination, but ultimately to beat President President Trump. While we're resetting our terms here, just a reminder, all of this does come after Biden had that big victory in South Carolina over the weekend, exceeding expectations there, driving out African-American voters in his campaign, making the case that this does prove that he's the candidate to bring together a more diverse electorate. Then, of course, you had this coalescing of moderate candidates, Pete Buttigieg dropping out of the race, Amy Klobuchar, and then quickly endorsing him, this remarkable coalescing around uh, the the moderate branch of the Democratic Party in a way, frankly, that we have never seen so quickly or completely before. Want to know just how energetic and confident Biden is feeling? His campaign added an event right here in Los Angeles tomorrow. So he's going to speak and he's going to try to capitalize on this momentum tonight. Lester and Kristen Savannah. Welker in California. Thank you. Well, let's go over to Casey Hunt, who's at Sanders headquarters in his home state of Vermont. Not the night they were hoping for, but they're looking to California now to make up some of that the deficit. Casey, what are you hearing behind the scenes? It has, in fact, been a rough night so far for Bernie Sanders. His campaign aides acknowledging that they were disappointed with the results on the East Coast, particularly in North Carolina, which was a state uh, that Bernie Sanders had put a lot of effort and energy into. So uh, a notable uh, loss for them and kind of the, the thoroughness with which Joe Biden uh, has swept to victory here is something that doesn't necessarily bode well for them going forward. That said, they are still holding out for these critical large states, Texas and especially California. They really need that to come in big for them. Still, it's clear that this is becoming a two-person race, and that's how Bernie Sanders framed it when he talked to his supporters tonight. He didn't necessarily say the name, but he was going after Joe Biden. And it is our campaign, our movement, which is best positioned to defeat Trump. You cannot beat Trump with the same old, same old kind of politics. 
What we need is a new politics that brings working class people into our political movement, which brings young people into our political movement. It's pretty clear that while Bernie Sanders is counting on a huge turnout among young voters, it doesn't seem to be enough at this point to take him over the line to show that he's expanding his coalition. And one question I have going forward, uh, all of the candidates, uh, except for Bernie Sanders, had been on the record saying that the Democratic National Convention in Milwaukee should play by the rules it wrote, which meant uh, that if no candidate had an outright majority, uh, it would potentially go to a second ballot and somebody who did didn't come out on top of the pledged delegate pile could win the nomination. Bernie Sanders was the only one who said, no, whoever comes out with a plurality of delegates should definitely be the nominee. That, of course, partially because uh, they viewed him as the most likely to be in that kind of a scenario. But now, with this delegate race closing and Joe Biden potentially finishing ahead of Bernie Sanders in the delegate race tonight, uh, I'm interested to know if those words come back back to haunt Bernie Sanders. Savannah. Yeah, yeah. we were just talking about that very thing, Casey. It could be interesting to see how it plays out now that the shoe is on the other foot, potentially. Yeah. Polls uh, closed in California about 11 minutes ago, except for those who were still in line, and there are still lines, right? Joe Fryer from uh, L.A. County. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Polls might be closed, but it certainly doesn't look like it. If you look at me here, I'm in southern part of L.A. County. You can see this is the front of the line here in this gymnasium. How long does it go? Well, it stretches here. And just before 8 o'clock, the line actually went outside of this door here and extended outside. But at 8 o'clock, all the people who were outside were brought in. Why is that? Well, the registrar said if you got in line, if you showed up at the voting center by 8 o'clock, you'd be able to vote. So they brought all of these people in. How how many people are there? Well, the line just keeps wrapping around the gymnasium here, all the way around the corner. And you can see that is the end of the line wrapping around here. It's hard to know how long these people are going to wait to vote. I would guess at least an hour and a half, if not longer. Long lines have been a big story today throughout California. Here's one reason why. In L.A. County, they have these new voting machines. They're touchscreen voting machines. We've spoken with people who like the technology, but there have been reports of malfunctions throughout the day and other issues that have really slowed things down. You take a look right here. We've got 15 voting booths. Most of them are empty right now. And it has looked like that. You maybe see five, six, seven people filling these 15 voting booths at any time. So it has been a slow go today. Here where we are and in other parts of L.A. County, we've heard reports of people waiting two hours or even longer. And even though the polls are closed now and have been closed for 12 minutes, you can see we've got a long line of people. If they wait in line, they will be able to cast their votes. But they could still be waiting quite a while. Back to you. Certainly a good side of interest in this election. Thank you, Joe. We knew it would take a long time to vote, <laughs> to count <laughs> votes in California even longer now, Still given those them. lines. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's go to our Vote Watch segment. Senior legal and investigative correspondent Cynthia McFadden joins us now. At look, at, at look at some of these voting issues in California, Cynthia. I know you've covered some of the, that technology that Joe was just talking about. Yeah, there are some problems with the voting machines that we knew uh, a couple months ago that when they went through their paces, these machines um, clogged up in the print five times more than is allowed in California. So some of the problem has apparently been with this new voting system, which the state, the, the city of Los Angeles paid $300 million for. Another issue has been that Los Angeles went from your sort of your neighborhood voting station, your polling station, to these big vote centers. And the bigger vote centers have had real problems. They promised in L.A. County alone there were going to be a thousand of them. As of Friday, there were only about 244 up and running. They added a whole lot over the weekend. But but there have been enormous backups uh, because, in part, these vote centers were just not equipped to be able to handle the volume that was coming in. Uh, in addition, it's kind of interesting because the other big state tonight, Texas, has also had tremendous lines. Um, and also, one of the jurisdictions that had, has had such large lines went to the same kind of vote center. That may be something to look at as we, as we go into the general in the fall. Um, you know, 
uh, it is worth pointing out that the Department of Homeland Security briefed reporters tonight, and as you know, they're in charge of the security of the voting system, and they said things were essentially going well, that when it came to cybersecurity, there were no incidents of major significance reported across the country. So that is good news. But these long lines are not good news. You know, it's a way of disenfranchising voters. You know, if you're going to stand in line for another two or three hours tonight, and we've had reports from around Los Angeles County, from around Texas, that people are standing in line for two to three hours. This you're seeing right here is just next to the UCLA campus. This is at the Hammer, uh, Hammer Gallery. Uh, a two to three hour line wait. And that was just taken a few hours ago. Well, we can only hope that the, in eight months they'll get it together. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> yeah. And in eight months, those people will get to the line. You know, it's such, we haven't talked about it, but in, in California has never been so early in the political calendar before. It's never been part of Super Tuesday, not in recent memory. Yeah, they put you, the Super in Super Tuesday. They really did. Uh, now, the, a third of the delegates that'll be awarded tonight come from California. Usually it had been at the end of the primary season. So it's really playing a role tonight. Uh, so the pressure's on yeah. to count those votes. All right. Uh, we've got eight states in the Biden column so far tonight. Three for Sanders, but the two big ones, we've been talking about them, Texas and California. We have not called those yet. We will continue to dive deep into those numbers. We'll be back right after this. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this <laughs> time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we have our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. 
We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? minutes after eight o'clock on the West Coast. And here's the overview of what's happened so far on this Super Tuesday. Joe Biden cleaning up so far. Got a big delegate lead over Bernie Sanders. And we await the votes to be counted in California. And we could be waiting a while. It is too early to call this race. However, NBC is uh, projecting that Sanders is leading the race at the moment. You see Bloomberg, who has uh, put a lot of money and time organization into this state. It's paying off at the moment. He looks to be above the threshold of viability, as does Joe Biden. And we're watching Texas very closely, where you've got almost half the vote in. Uh, we're still characterizing this race as too close to call. Uh, Sanders and Biden duking it out there uh, in uh, Maine. Uh, also too close to call. Looks like 65 percent of, of that vote is in 1,300 vote difference. Just Biden leading in Maine there, even by a percentage point, all that's, that, that's already, I mean, it's, it's yet just part of it. I mean, he was nowhere. In Maine. Maine was a two-person race between Sanders and Warren. Well, we're seeing, him, and Warren. we're seeing him win and lead in places, as you pointed out, he didn't visit. To, at all. Yeah. To go back to California a, a second, uh, you know, Sanders is likely to win the state tonight. What we're all watching all night long is going to be, and, and we're pretty confident that Biden is going to get viability, what you want to watch all night long is going to be Bloomberg and Warren in particular. I mean, right now, this is very early vote, so Buttigieg might pop in, in some places here or there. But keep an eye on those numbers, 15 percent, because, and this is, Biden needs it tonight. If Warren or Bloomberg hits 15, hits viability in California, it'll really put a, a, a damper on Sanders delegate hall, and it probably then would guarantee that, that Biden would win the night on delegates. Yeah. Michael Bloomberg uh, not having a great night, but but scoring viability. He did win some, American Samoa. American Samoa and, and showing some viability. Let's go to uh, Gabe Gutierrez, who's got a little more on uh, what the thinking is the Bloomberg camp as they watch these numbers. Gabe? Uh, hi, Lester. The convention hall here has cleared out. The lights have literally gone off here after an extremely disappointing night for Michael Bloomberg. The candidate himself is now heading to New York overnight, and his campaign officials tell NBC News that they will reassess whether to stay in this campaign tomorrow once all the data is in. Again, an extremely disappointing night. The big question right now is what will Michael Bloomberg do after his campaign spent more than $500 million of for the last few months, there's been a barrage of TV ads, and as you mentioned, his only decisive victory tonight so far was American Samoa. Lester. All right, Gabe, thanks very much. And uh, his, his campaign, you could argue, turned on the debates. Uh, Bloomberg. A ab yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I mean it, it, is, it is one of those things that's remarkable. We were wondering this great political science experiment. I know a lot of academic friends of mine, you know, you've always wondered, what happens if you have all the money in the world? <laughs> to run a campaign and you can do everything that you want to do, all the polling, all the get out the vote, all of the early vote, all of the TV advertising that you want, but it, no matter how good your marketing campaign is, how does the product? Right. Well, and, and, you know, and it's the product was at the debate. But look, he spent two hundred million dollars on television ads. He was in every Super Tuesday state. And for a while, it looked like it was paying off. Here he was suddenly in double digits in some states above Joe Biden. And then comes the debate where people got to actually see him. We saw Elizabeth Warren confront him uh, over some issues in his past. And the, and the air just went right out of his. He, he met did. the voters. It did. He got and he got dinged by his competitors. Mm -hmm. Look, we want to talk a little bit about California and about why we expect Bernie Sanders to have a good night there. And there's just a simple explanation. Let me just show you the makeup of the ideology. It was amazing here tonight. 
I believe this is among the highest that we've seen all night. 30 percent very liberal. And as we've shown you before, very liberal Democrats, those that identify as very liberal, we split up. It's about, you know, as you see here, and look in California, 66 percent of the party describes itself as liberal. But there's a big difference between your somewhat liberals, that's your rank and file Democrat, and your very liberals, the ones that, that issues motivate them. Just to give you a comparison, all the other states together, this number is 24 in the very liberal column. But look at here, it's 30. That's why Sanders is overperforming. The moderate conservative in California is just a third of the electorate. Everywhere else combined tonight, it's 41. And this has been the powerful Joe Biden uh, part of the electorate. This is the powerful Bernie Sanders part of the electorate. And this is why California is such a good state for Bernie Sanders. But you got to ask yourself, and I'm, I'm curious what other Democrats think of this. California is less like the rest of the Democratic Party than any other part. So it's sort of like what even though it's the dominant state in the Democratic Party and it is, it, you know, the Speaker of the House, it powers the congressional majority. Ideologically, it's actually the out of step with the rest of the Democratic Party in the country. Are you surprised to see Texas so so close right now? Well, it is close right now because of the Michael Bloomberg fade. I will tell you this, without Michael Bloomberg, this wouldn't be close, and this would be a huge state for Joe Biden. The fact that it is this close is because of Bloomberg. Uh, and Biden could still end up winning the state, but at this point, it doesn't matter. The delegate, that, that number is so close, and this is why we keep talking about they'll, they'll, they'll split, essentially split the delegates, it'll be a net zero mm -hmm. uh, on delegates. So that part of it doesn't, it doesn't matter, and that's already a victory for Joe Biden. Do, do you think that maybe California should be back in June at the end of the process? It's uh, not look, representative. If the whole point is you go small states to big states, California and Texas. We're going to a quick break and be back with more after this. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are going to winnow the field. They're probably going to create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now.
from Las Vegas. From Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway! Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Oh. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Good evening, everyone. Breaking news tonight. Lester Holt. From Washington, from Las Vegas, we begin tonight with the most trusted TV news anchor in America. That's Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt. We are back. We are watching Super Tuesday results as they roll in. Let's go to Texas. And there's an interesting story developing there. First, let's just show you with 47% of the vote in. We're saying it's too close to call. Michael Bloomberg, a factor there, as Chuck was just talking about, eating, taking a big bite out of Biden. But it may well be that Biden uh, can get some delegates and it may, uh, oh, I think it may Biden, be a wash. I, I, and not only that, I mean, you know, and it'll be more for symbolic purposes, but You'd rather be Biden right now as this vote count's coming in than you would Bernie. Well, uh, the Bernie way. may hold on, but 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 uh, you'd rather be Biden We're right now. We're coming back yeah. to Texas in a moment with something very interesting yeah, unfolding uh, right it, there. But let's do to, let's go do California real quick just for folks on the West Coast who are watching. It's too early to call there. In fact, folks are still voting there. But here's how it looks uh, with eight percent of the vote counted. And let's go to Maine. Uh, too close to call in Maine, and. Here is another one where you've got Joe Biden suddenly in contention and potentially ahead at the moment. And uh, here's the list of what uh, Bernie Sanders has won tonight, Colorado, Utah and Vermont. We compare that to uh, Joe Biden's great night. Uh, there you see Alabama, Arkansas, Massachusetts, Minnesota. You can read it yourself. Uh, a very good night for Joe More Biden. More importantly, though, it's the size of those victories. And, and, and size of the victories, and here's the delegate, how they break down. Because remember, it's all about the delegates tonight. Biden with 240, Sanders uh, at 188. Uh, Michael Bloomberg has, has picked up some delegates here tonight, as has Elizabeth Warren. All right. Uh, we want to go to Texas because Garrett Hake is down there in the Houston area. And we just got word, Garrett, that there are still folks in line waiting to vote there. Can you explain? Polls closed several hours ago. Uh-oh. That looks like I don't someone, think he was reacting to That looks to like you. someone who didn't get his IFP. We've had polls closed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Savannah, we've had polls closed for three and a half hours here in Harris County, the biggest county in Texas, and folks are still in line. And I can tell you, this is not an isolated incident of 802 polling centers here in Harris County. 360 are still open. Nearly half had lines of people still waiting to get in at 7 p.m. Central Time when the polls closed. Those folks are still waiting for their chance to cast ballots. It's happening all across Harris County, which, by the way, is a county that's been working really hard to expand voting access, including by letting people vote at any polling place in the county, not just their home precinct. So this is going to continue to be an issue into the night. It's the biggest voting block in the state, the largest single county in the state, uh, where votes are just going to continue to dribble in because they are still being cast late hey, into the night. Garrett, I'm curious, how much of this, were, are they struggling at the polling locations tonight? Because they're usually so used to so many people participating in early voting. And because so many people held their ballot this year in Texas, I mean, we got word there was even a, it became a meme on Twitter, hold your ballot, I think, you know, don't send it in. It seems like they're overwhelmed on Election Day because they didn't expect this many voters. Well, there are a number of factors. Absolutely. The number of voters has increased in part because the early vote, which has been growing in Texas over the last several years, people might have held back a little bit on waiting to see uh, which candidates would still be around. I certainly met a lot of voters today for whom that was the case. They wanted to wait and hold on to their ballots to the last minute. Uh, the other factor here is you've got a surge in turnout in places that didn't typically see significant Democratic turnout. You know, some of these Houston suburbs were very much George Bush. Pick your George Bush uh, counties back in the day, they're becoming increasingly blue. Some of them have flipped in 2018. Some of them are, are targeted battlegrounds for Democratic voters who are getting involved in major numbers in places where they're just not used to seeing this many Democrats this interested in this short of a time period. All right, Garrett Hake, where the vote counting and the voting yeah. goes on. And we're watching some of that in California as well. Now, they granted, the polls closed in California about a half hour ago. Let's go to uh, Blaine Alexander, who is in, uh, I'm sorry, Morgan Ranford, who is in Sacramento County, I believe. Morgan? 
<laughs> That's right, Lester, Savannah, Chuck, good evening. We are at Sacramento State here in Sacramento, California. And you can see, if you look just past me here, the end of the voting line is here. These polls closed about 35 minutes ago. And so the people you're looking at here were in line. This line was all the way outside into the darkness an hour before the polls closed. And there's a mix of people here. We have some students who are in their late teens, early 20s, and then some community members who have come here to cast their vote. I want to introduce you to some of them. Mikkel, you're a student here, right? Yeah, yeah. So tell us, I have to say, about 98% of the people I've talked to here on the ground told me they're voting for Sanders. Who did you vote for? I voted for Biden. And what about you? Who did you vote for? Bernie. You voted for yeah. Bernie. You voted for Biden. Now, Mikkel, yeah. you are the first person I've talked to here at Sac State who said they're casting their ballot for Biden. Why? Uh, I'm just kind of thinking more about the uh, country in total. And uh, what are the issues that really kind of get you going, that make you say Biden's my guy? Um, experience. And also, I just don't think uh, Bernie Sanders is kind of the guy. You, he's not it. your guy. He's not my guy. No. Okay, so you are part of this broader coalition. I don't know yeah. if you heard Bernie Sanders speak earlier tonight. When he got to the podium, podium, he talked about the energy that his campaign was seeing. Why did he capture your attention? He captured my attention because I feel like he's speaking to a lot of the younger voters, and especially with environmental issues. I feel like he capitalizes a lot on that, and so that's something I'm really important. And what about your friends here? What are they saying? Have you talked to them about my this election? are all voting for Bernie. All voting for Bernie. So yes. you're the lone soldier here, huh? Yeah. Oh. I just kind of, I'm not kind of going into the whole vibe thing. I mean, Bernie's like a career politician. Like, I kind of just see his battle cries as just battle cries, like, just empty promises. Which is interesting because Biden's also been a career politician. So what is yeah. it about him that you think? Oh, uh, well, the experience in the White House already. All right. I'm, I'm kind of just fighting it. You know what? If we're going to have one guy in there, I want to have some guy with experience. Okay. So what these people are telling us is radically different from what we heard earlier in today where some people said those endorsements for Biden were causing them to switch their ballots, especially in those places where there were more moderate voters and more conservative areas here in Northern California. Back to you guys. All right, Morgan, right now let's uh, head down down I-5 now to Los Angeles County and Joe Fryer. Are you still seeing those huge lines? Yeah, similar story here. So the people who are right behind me here say they've been waiting about two hours so far, and they're still not at the front of the line. The front of the line is down there. So here's the story of what happened here. The line was clearly building all night long. For a while, it actually went out this door and into the outside there. But at 8 o'clock, they had to close the doors and say, anyone who was in line, you can still vote. So they brought everyone in and closed the doors, and the line keeps extending and is still extending. The polls closed, what, 36 minutes ago, and you can see these are all the people who were already in line at eight o'clock all of them wrapping around this gymnasium here they will all get to cast their ballots no matter how long it takes and it could still be a good hour and a half two hours for the people who are waiting at the end of the line as we've been telling you la county is one of those counties that this time around had new voting machines use these touch screen voting machines some folks we've talked to have used them to say that they like them. But as you can see right now, you've got 15 machines here. I think I see one person voting at one of them right now. There have been a variety of problems in some of the places throughout the day. There have been malfunctions and just other issues with resources that have just been slowing down the vote and causing a lot of longer lines throughout much of this area. We've heard people saying they're waiting two hours or even longer. Of course, a lot of people in California also vote by mail. So keep in mind, many people were able to avoid these lines here today by actually casting their ballots by mail. Back to you guys. True, but it takes longer to, to count those uh, mail-in ballots. So uh, we'll be back with you, Joe Fryer, as we continue through the night. Let's bring in Robert Gibbs, who was the White House press secretary under former President Barack Obama. And now, I mean, we're still counting the votes. We may be counting for a couple of weeks in the case of California, <laughs> but we kind of move on and we look ahead in the political calendar. And now Joe Biden wakes up tomorrow facing a very different reality. Absolutely. I think he uh, may end up the co front runner. It may be down to two people. Uh, and I think the real question is going to be uh, back to him and his campaign is how does he perform as a front runner? How does the campaign perform? What are, what are the organizational and structural things they need to do now? Uh, it, it won't be it'll be a different campaign starting tomorrow. You saw that well, the money's going to come, which will be a help. And they'll be able to advertise on television. They'll be able to fund um, a real organization in places they'll need to over the course of the next three weeks. Um, there's some good states for him that are going to come up. Uh, but again, you know, in less than two weeks, there'll be another debate. And, and again, a, a very different dynamic if they're just has, two or three people. Has Biden been a good candidate in your view? 
Uh, even in, even? In the, give me a time period and I can give you a better grade. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that, that, look, I think in many ways what you're seeing over the course of the last sort of 72 hours is vote that wanted to be with Joe Biden, that fell away from him based on the performance of his campaign over several months, that came back to him. Well, it goes to the Jim Clyburn criticism after yep. South Carolina that he needed to make some changes in the team and the staff. And we've seen, you know, some shifting around. But the question is, can they now rise to this level? Uh, will they listen to Mike Bloomberg, considering how poorly Bloomberg did, aside from money? Does he have organizational skills and people to continue? And don't absolve the candidate of that. Don't absolve the candidate of that. I mean, you know, when, when you watch Joe Biden on that speech Saturday night, it wasn't as good as, wasn't, that speech was better than tonight's speech. But the question is, you got to go out every day and prosecute that case. Bernie Sanders started to make that case tonight. Uh, and it's going to be a distinct case. What I was just going to say that balance. Sanders is going to is going to make the bright try to draw bright lines between mm -hmm. him and Biden. The question I have is how much should Joe Biden's eye be on November and trying to think like the unifier of the party? And how much does he still need to prosecute the case against Bernie? Well, I, look, I, you can't worry about November until you're the nominee. And I think he's got to press the case to do that. I think the way he does that will be important for both candidates. The truth is Not somebody's- Meaning don't scorch earth it. Exactly. Yeah. Somebody's got to put that coalition back together. I mean, it, it, it is impossible that the only the supporters of one of those candidates, if they're the nominee, gets them to the White House. Well, the that's, Monday that's night obvious. event was really the tone the embracing tone that he needs to continue to have. The and Monday night speeches were really excellent. And, and I think when you see the personal Joe Biden, the empathy, exactly. the character, and, and you don't have to make that as a contrast, but I think that helps. But clearly, again, Bernie Sanders is going to prosecute the issues that he thinks gives him uh, an advantage. Well, and we all know that Donald Trump likes to weigh in on politics, <laughs> our pundit in chief, and he will, Joe Biden will once again be in his crosshairs, and he's certainly. Um, oh, he's already been there today. Oh, okay. He's already <laughs> there. <laughs> but, but, just, uh, just Donald did. Trump has Bill de Blasio disease. He's really excited about the Bloomberg thing. It does feel as if, like, both. Yeah. Both de Blasio and Trump love the fact that it's one thing that maybe those well, two What's an old on. New York thing, I yeah. guess, It's right? a bunch of New Yorkers it's, having yeah. a fight. I yeah. would just add also one thing, just a, as a personal thing. I think watching those protesters rush that stage tonight, if there's a conversation that happens in Washington tomorrow, I hope it's with the DHS and the Secret Service to— the. the Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden need U.S. Secret Service protection. They need it within the next 24 want it, to 40 do they? hours. I mean, you know, the campaigns have been hesitant. They've been able to ask a long time ago. They've been hesitant for the reason that you know why they are. Everybody is hesitant to add that extra layer, but we get to a point where you're looking at one of those two people as being the major party nominee yep. with a 50-50 chance of being the president of the United States. And, and the idea that a protest, the idea that Jill Biden was essentially uh, with some private security, the protection for Joe Biden tonight, just isn't that's the, the second kind of time thing that's right. happened, by the way. This yeah. time. It, it was, happened with Bernie Sanders. I saw it in New Hampshire. It was an alarming moment. Uh, we're going to take a break and continue our coverage. We continue to watch Texas and California and some others waiting for some calls, and we'll be back with more. Oh, we got our very own today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now.
let's bring you up to speed where we are on this Tuesday, uh, Super Tuesday, and the number of delegates uh, awarded tonight. Uh, Joe Biden with 243. There's Sanders, 197. Elizabeth Warren, 11. Bloomberg, 10. Uh, and we look at the uh, California race right now. Uh, 415 delegates at stake. They've only got about 13 percent of the vote in, and there it stands. Too early to call is our characterization of that Interesting race. story unfolding in Texas tonight. It's too <laughs> close to call with half the vote in, but guess what? Down in Harris County, they're just still waiting to vote. People lined up several hours after the polls were due to close there, but there's the, the race as it stands at the moment. It's a tight one. And in Maine, too close to call. Uh, not an outcome that many expected we're before not. tonight. For what it's worth, we're likely. This is one of those. We'll probably wait until we count all the vote because it has been it has been seesawing like this yeah. back and forth all night. 266 yeah, yeah, yeah. vote good difference. Yeah. Wow. And a good night for Donald Trump. He's running virtually <laughs> unopposed in the Republican primaries. Those are all the states he has won, every one that he's contested in. And that brings us to Hallie Jackson, who's at her post at the White House for us. And the president, of course, has uh, weighed in from time to time on this Democratic primary. He's got his favorites. Uh, have we heard from him tonight? And his least favorites, you could say, Savannah, as well. I think before the commercial break, you called him the political pundit in chief, and he is certainly playing that role tonight. He is going after actually two people who are not on the graphics that we're showing a lot tonight, Mike Bloomberg and Elizabeth Warren, in essence, calling them both essentially losers, saying that they had rough nights, basically. We know the president is engaged. He is tuned into this. He earlier today, when I was uh, on the South Lawn of the White House, trying to pepper him with questions on this, said it was going to be an interesting evening of television. And in that, I think that prediction certainly ended up being true, given the results that we're seeing come in. Now, as far as the two people who are still emerging as the front runners here, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, these are two people who the president has gone after frequently. His campaign tonight is talking about the chaos and trying to sort of push that as a bit of a narrative moving forward, as they are looking to seize upon what they see as a splintered Democratic Party and the possibility of a contested convention moving forward. I can tell you this, though, despite the public bravado about, for example, Joe, in the words of the, the president's campaign manager, Joe Biden being just as bad of a candidate as he was a few days ago, I can tell you that privately behind the scenes, there has been longstanding concern about Joe Biden's potential as a general election matchup come, you know, September, October, November, particularly in those rust built, built states. That has been a concern for people in and around the president's orbit for a long time. And based on my conversations tonight, that certainly remains a concern. I've heard some caution from folks saying, hey, you know, don't get ahead of California. It could still end up being sort of this very splintered picture, which is, is what they are, again, essentially hoping for as we move forward. And as you talk about next steps, there's something interesting here, too. President Trump, has acknowledged doing what he has called trolling the Democrats uh, in the run-up to Super Tuesday in places we started at Iowa, kept going to New Hampshire, did it in Nevada, did it in North Carolina for Super Tuesday and other places as well. Uh, there are no rallies or campaign events scheduled right now. I imagine that'll change, but as far as what's next, this is a bit of a new phase for, for Team Trump, essentially. The president isn't is sort of having a, a very hectic schedule of travel moving forward. He's dealing, obviously, with this crisis on the coronavirus back home in Washington, has been really focused on that messaging as well, uh, but does enjoy the political rallies. And we've been seeing him do a lot of those uh, in the course of the last six weeks or so. So for the Trump campaign, this is sort of an interesting moment for them as they're looking to see who, who their person will be, guys. All right, Hallie, Maine, Texas, California, outstanding. Still waiting for calls in those states, providing a little drama tonight. Yeah, we're back with more of our coverage right after these messages. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, and pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War.
Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are going to winnow the field. They're probably going to create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we have our very own Today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Well, look, this is, uh, I want to get us a little update on Texas and about how long we're going to be here for Texas. Look at this. 28.6, 28.2, the margins now 5,200. As you can see, a lot of gray space here, which means we have a lot of unreported votes. Uh, but here's what everybody needs. There's two things to watch here. Number one. Mr. Bloomberg sitting at 17.4. His number was at 20. As, as more same-day vote has come in, his percentage has gone down. But as more same-day vote has come in, Biden's percentage has come up. I will tell you this. We don't know what the mix is of early vote to same-day vote. But if there's more same-day vote, Biden is going to win Texas. If there's more early vote, Sanders is going to win Texas. But guess what? Harris County is still voting. So we don't know. Yeah. Maria Teresa Kumar is here now. And I mean, Texas is a place where Sanders worked hard, especially for the Latino vote. For a long time. And he and Warren have done a really fantastic job of the South. So as those returns come in, it's, I would predict it's going, to be per, it's going to be split between not only Sanders, but Warren as well. But I think the story of the night is the fact that Texas, deep red Texas, is almost flippable. It is looking much more of an a California electoral politic than the rest of Virginia or even Arizona. If you're the Trump campaign, what are you taking from concern, those numbers? That concern, concern, concern. So basically, by, um, Obama lost Texas by 1.9 million voters. Hillary lost it by 900,000. Beto lost it by 200,000. You have 2.6 million unregistered Latino youth in Texas alone. It's responsible for 25 percent of all Latino electoral possibility. If I were Trump right now, I'd be super concerned. You're saying Texas could be a battleground Flippable. state. Mm. Look, you've been saying this to me for a while, and you're saying that all it does is figuring out how to register those voters. And Beto O'Rourke didn't spend that money. It's something that you've been a little bit frustrated he with. He hasn't, but it was interesting. The fact that he was one of the first people out of the bat when it came to consolidating and said, I'm actually going to tip my hat and I'm going to endorse Biden, is because he sees a pathway to the White House through Texas as well. 
All right. Teresa. Maria, Kramer. great to have you here. Thanks Thank so much. You Thank much. you much. Thanks for hanging in there, guys. I know. <laughs> Two more hours. Let's go. I know. I know. Wait, look, exactly. it's California, energy. Texas. It's almost, the two biggest states. Almost midnight on the East Coast, but just 9 o'clock almost oh, in California. Right. This stuff happens votes time. there. Fun time. Yeah, we're at West Coast. It's exactly. It's almost show time. It's almost, <laughs> it's almost morning. Buddy of mine always calls it Pacific time. It's fun time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll be back right after this with more of our Super Tuesday coverage. Today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. So still waiting on uh, on uh, Maine, Texas, and California. I'm sorry. Yeah. Look at that Let's difference. Look at, look Lester, at look right at it. Nine, this is the state of Texas. So how we, many gazillions of people live in the state so, of Texas? So at this point, 55%, <laughs> and no matter how this goes, they're going to split the delegates. Well, we already have Texas. allocated 20 to each of them at this point, okay. uh, Sanders and, and nobody else. The real question really will, will be that Bloomberg number. Yeah. And does it keep saying, I mean, I've watched them all night in these early voting states. They sink as the numbers come in. Yeah. Does he dip below threshold or not? In some of these places, he has. Do you know right. Bloomberg spent $52 million on television and radio ads in the state of Texas alone? Well, People are going to do the delegate calculations, but that's okay. There's nothing like So far, he's been $50 million a delegate. All right. For those of you in the Mountain Time Zone, your local news is next. In the West, we will continue. And for all of you, there is continuing coverage in our streaming service, NBC News Now.
Welcome back. We continue to track the numbers and the results on this Super Tuesday NBC News coverage. It's 9 o'clock in the West. Polls are closed in all 14 Super Tuesday states. It's been a big night for Joe Biden with wins in eight states and a lead so far in delegates. But in the two biggest races tonight, there is no call yet. That's right. Texas remains too close to call. Tight race there. California too early to call. Bernie Sanders is leading there at that this hour. There's Texas and well, there is Maine. There's actually a small, bigger difference between Biden and Sanders in Maine than there is between Biden and Sanders in Texas. It was down to a 400 vote. But by the way, that what is happening in Texas, we said you'd rather be Biden right now than Sanders. Biden is slowly picking up. And I think as these numbers come in, you're going to see Biden. Here's what uh, Bernie Sanders has earned tonight. He's earned victories in Colorado, Utah, and Vermont. And here's Joe Biden with the big night. And you can see all those states We're there. And try just, to fit it on the screen. Yeah, and just think about this. There are states on that list that Joe Biden won where he didn't spend one cent, didn't have any paid staff, and did not put one ad on the air. And yet he is the victor. And remember, this, this. these are the numbers that it's all about. These are the delegates won. And, uh, 278 for Biden, Sanders uh, behind, and then Warren and Bloomberg. All right, let's go to Kristen Welker. She's in Los Angeles. That was Biden headquarters for the night. We heard from the candidate a few moments ago. Kristen, what's the latest there? Well, Savannah, Joe Biden struck a victorious tone when he took the podium here in Los Angeles and addressed his supporters. He said it's not called Super Tuesday for nothing. He tried to make the case that this is proof that he is the candidate to bring out a more diverse electorate and to really try to energize voters. Campaign officials are trying to make that point tonight, that it is, in fact, Joe Biden who is going to be the enthusiasm candidate. Of course, that remains to be seen. But we have seen tonight what his campaign is calling Joe Mentum. Here's a little bit more of what Biden had to say. My Lord, this is the United States of America. And it's time for America to get back up. And once again, fight for the proposition that we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men and women are created equal, endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. We say it so often in school, we don't realize how profound it is. We've never lived up to those words, but until this president, we've never walked away from it. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe with every fiber of my being, that's who we are. So let's get back up. We are a decent, brave, resilient people. We can believe again, but we are, we are better than this moment. We are better than this president. So get back up and take back this country, the United States of America. Biden also noted that just a few days ago, his campaign had been left for dead. Of course, all of that changed after South Carolina, after Biden won that state with a resounding victory, driving out African-American voters and then seeing the other moderate candidates coalesce around him. Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, Beto O'Rourke, and really getting a number of endorsements from the moderate branch of the Democratic Party. And we are seeing this epic clash, really, right now between the moderate and more liberal leaning branches, Bernie Sanders. So this increasingly looking like a two person race. If you want to know how confident Biden is feeling at this hour, his campaign scheduling an event here for tomorrow. He clearly wants to continue to try to capitalize on what has been an incredibly strong night for him. What has exceeded even his own campaign's expectations, Savannah and Lester. All right, Kristen, thank you so much. And Bernie Sanders just spoke just before we saw Biden. Let's go to Casey Hunt, who is in Vermont, to tell us a little more about the mood in that camp after uh, what has to be a disappointing night. Yet, yeah, Lester, uh, good evening. Uh, how this race has changed for Bernie Sanders in just the last week and a half. There were conversations about how it was a real possibility that Bernie Sanders could use Super Tuesday tonight to build a potentially insurmountable delegate lead. His supporters, as he calls them, his movement, uh, really uh, taking that uh, 
as, as an incredible statement for a candidate who has campaigned as an outsider, who has been seen as somebody who is not able to win. And uh, everyone was saying, look, it would take something dramatic to really change that reality. And in fact, something dramatic really did happen for Joe Biden. And that left Bernie Sanders uh, here. Instead of celebrating at reveling in a victory of state after state, you heard Joe Biden tick through all those places that he won. Uh, instead, he was left to give uh, the speech that we hear from him on the campaign trail uh, when he goes out to campaign uh, at his rallies. Here's a little bit of what he had to say tonight uh, in Vermont. But we are not only taking on the corporate establishment, we're taking on the political establishment. But we're going to win because the people understand it is our campaign, our movement, which is best positioned to defeat Trump. I did think it was interesting as I listened to him give this speech. You heard him use the word movement there. He said it over and over again tonight. A word that was not front and center was the word revolution, which has been a hallmark of now both of his presidential campaigns. Uh, it says to me that they are at least aware that they uh, had, had a need to try and move a little bit to the center in a way, or at least to incorporate more people uh, into uh, this campaign. Uh, but of course, at this point, you know, unclear how uh, they are going to come out. Uh, guys, we're still, of course, waiting for California. They really need that to come in big for them tonight if this is going to be a night that they have anything really uh, to talk about. All right. Case, Casey, thank you very much. Let's go to Blaine Alexander. She's in El Paso. Texas polls closed hours and hours ago. It's a tight race. And yet, Blaine, the vote goes on because people are still lined up. Yeah, Savannah, I just actually spoke to the county elections board and they told me that, yes, the polls closed now more than three hours ago and there are still people who are in line waiting to vote. Now what you're looking at right now are actually poll employees. They are coming in. They are bringing ballots and materials from their polling locations to turn back in. And I want to talk to you, Carmen. You just left your polling location, but you said despite the fact that it was raining, you saw a steady stream all day long. Yeah, and when you guys closed at 7 o'clock, there were still people in line. Oh, yes, definitely. There were still people in line and we didn't have, we had our last voter at 8.30. 8.30, yes. Yes. An hour and a half after the yes. polls closed. Yeah. Wow. They were determined to vote. They were determined to vote. Carmen, thank you so much. Well, guys, that really just kind of gives you a sense of just how many people are coming out. And we just, within the past few minutes, got the latest numbers from here in El Paso County. And we've learned that they have eclipsed what we saw during the primary back in 2016. So far, between early ballots and the ballots cast today, we've seen 96,000 people come in to vote. Back in 2016, there were only about 85,000 or so, and the numbers are still going, guys. So that lets you know just how many people came out to vote today. Yeah, Democratic voters uh, turning out in force in Texas and a lot of states tonight. Yeah. We're joined now by Rich Lowry, an NBC News and MSNBC political analyst. Good to have you here, Rich. Hi there. Just looking at the uh, the delegates earned so far, not just tonight, but in the race, uh, Biden at 331, Sanders at 282. Extrapolate where this race goes after tonight. Well, a uh, big question, obviously, is California. And can Bernie save the night by getting a lot of delegates out of California? And as Chuck's pointed out, big element there is who qualifies. You know, does Elizabeth Warren get over 15 percent and cut into Bernie's delegate lead? But just as a political observer, though, I, I just this moment is so amazing. It's one of the most astonishing political comebacks of our lifetimes. Fourth and fifth in Iowa and New Hampshire, left for dead, a pitiful uh, early exit from New Hampshire to go to South Carolina and give what seemed a, a woebegone speech there. And three weeks later, he is sweeping the country. It's truly extraordinary. Can, and you, also, pick the, can you pick the moment that it, it turned on? Um, the, well, Jim Claiborne's endorsement, yeah. clearly. Also, I would say the most consequential endorsement probably of our lifetimes. We think a lot about the Ted Kennedy endorsement of Barack Obama. Say, this is bigger, but that, isn't it? Yeah, but that was, a validating, that was yeah. a validating endorsement of someone who was already on his way. This is the patient is on the operating table, and I'm taking the paddle <laughs> to his chest endorsement. Yeah. And, it, and it worked. And within four days, he is now well, back the front runner. And there's so much campaign. about Jim Clyburn's yeah. gravitas. It did. And, but and then the stars really aligned, Rich, because right away you had two of the 
of the candidates from the right. moderate lane who would have been drawing votes from Biden right. tonight. You had them not only drop out, but then immediately endorse and go to Texas, battleground Texas, to do it in, in big fashion. Yeah, and endorsements that mattered. Apparently, Amy Klobuchar just took the entirety of her support in Minnesota and transferred it over to Joe Biden. By the way, what do you think Ted Cruz is thinking? after watching the last yeah. 48 hours, yeah. because I think one of his uh, people who worked on his campaign four years ago said, geez, if this had happened two months sooner, the same period of time, first week of March, in, in the, the Republicans around Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz is the well, Republican I was nominee. Because, Rich, you're a conservative. You're the editor of the National yeah. Review. This, what was happening with the Democrats was very much like what happened in 2016, where you had Donald Trump and then you had the rest of this big field. Right. Nobody got out. You right. never saw the party coalesce a, a right. non-Trump vote and Trump goes on to win it. But the Democrats seem to have yeah. done that very thing. Yeah, there's just an inability to coordinate on the Republican side. I think a difference, a lot of people make an analogy between Bernie and Trump. Um, Trump, though, he pulled from different elements of the party. He was kind of ideologically diverse character. Um, Bernie's a little bit more like Ted Cruz winning the first three contests and then the entire establishment going to Jeb Bush <laughs> and creating what is still, I think, going to be a, a really trench warfare in the Democratic Party between the establishment and an element of the grassroots, between the moderates and the left. And, you know, we heard it, a little bit from Bernie tonight. He is going to have to take the wood to Joe Biden. And the, the worm has turned in this race a couple times, and it could still yet again. I'm glad you brought that up, because I do think we all, <laughs> if it's changed three times in three weeks, I mean, literally, we were 1.3 percentage points away from Bernie Sanders being knocked out of this race, not being able to imagine him not winning the New Hampshire primary and where we would be. Pete Buttigieg having won the first two in a row. That was an extraordinarily close proposition. Yeah. And then we turn a week later, it's, oh, Bernie Sanders, this is going to be, how big is his delegate lead going to yeah. be on Super Tuesday? We're, we have the humility yeah. and punditry platform. Yes. Yes. That's yes. where we can all Absolutely. be. And, so, so and that's why if you're Elizabeth Warren, why get out? I, I, in a weird way, I get And if you're... How do you know this worm but, doesn't turn again? But even if Sanders saves it in the delegate count tonight, th there is no exaggerating how bad a night this was, because the crucial crutch for Bernie tonight is the early vote, yep. which is like the light, light from a different galaxy. You know, it's all pre-South Carolina. And if there were an early vote, are we right. certain he'd win any, any state tonight besides Vermont? All right, we've got to take a quick break and be back with more after this. Day family getaway. Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now.
Welcome back. We continue to watch the numbers in Texas. Let's put them on the screen for you. Uh, it is uh, officially, we're characterizing this as too close to call. 59% of the voted, but you can see uh, Biden sneaking ahead right now on the, on the count. But uh, here's Maine, 87% in, a very close 2,000, almost 2,100 vote difference. Too close to call in Maine. California, 25% uh, in now, too early to call. You can see Sanders uh, out in front right now on, on the basic count. And right now, and there's uh, delegates won tonight. Right now, Biden at 288, Sanders at 229. It looks like Biden will uh, will meet the, the threshold in every state he's competing. Uh, no, Chuck's walking away right now, guys. <laughs> Chuck's on the phone. <laughs> but let's go to uh, Jose Diaz Ballard right now, who is watching all this and uh, with a special focus on the Latino vote. Jose? Yes, Lester, good evening. Let's talk about California, because when you break it down to the Latino vote, it's a very different situation. It's more lopsided, and it's more pro-Bernie Sanders. If we look at California, for example, where Latinos make up about 28% of the vote, 55% are going with Sanders, 21% with Biden. And take a look at the breakdown there, 28%. And here, here's where you break it up, 55 to 21. So it's, it's really two over one for that. And if you break it down to some of the people and who the voters were, 55% of the uh, Latinos there voted for Sanders. Look at the African-American vote, 18%. Um, and the white, uh, 33, and Asian, 37 percent. And then as we break it down further to the favorable opinion, take a look at that. Sanders gets almost 80 percent favorability. Biden, 58 percent, same as Warren. Bloomberg at 35 percent. And then the unfavorables are also interesting to take a look at. Maybe no surprise to some, Bloomberg with 49 percent unfavorables, and Sanders with only 17, Biden with 33. And here you break it down by age for the folks that voted for Sanders, 74% under 30. Look at that, 62% of Asians and 55% of white voters in the state of California. And here are some of the issues that you can see where well, also a little different. Support for free college, much higher among the Latino voters. So it's a very interesting kind of a microcosm of what in California Latinos, that as I say, make up about 28% of the vote, came out to, and tonight they supported Sanders overwhelmingly. Yeah, an important part of his coalition, Jose, thank you. And I turn to Andrea Mitchell. That has been one of the storylines is whether he can hold that coalition together. Clearly in California, a good part of it's intact. And he did it in Nevada. That was the first time we saw him really building right. the first diverse state after Iowa and New Hampshire. This is a really important improvement in what he had achieved before. And we may see it in Florida. We may see it in some of these other states to come. I think the question is how he will read the entire uh, evening, if you will, whether this will uh, force some sort of a change in the, in the approach of the campaign or they just continue well, on. Well, it's, you're hard pressed to say how, after all the work he's done to try to expand his African-American support and failing to do that, failing so, so demonstrably in North Carolina, in Virginia, how, in, in some of the southern states, how he can manage that as well as expanding on his suburban white vote, which he did not manage to do. So and where is he, where is the growth potential in Bernie Sanders' coalition, given that he did not expand his electorate tonight? And of course, he will, he will continue to run, he has continued to run on this notion that he's been treated unfairly and that uh, uh, the establishment is out to block uh, his momentum, and that will continue to be a storyline going forward. Well, the, the pushback against that is that Buttigieg and Klobuchar were not really establishment, they would argue, and Beto O'Rourke, but he would say that they're not progressive enough. All right, we will take a short break and continue to watch uh, Texas and California numbers when we return.
White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway! It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Good evening, everyone. Breaking news tonight. Lester Holt. From Washington, from Las Vegas, we begin tonight with the most trusted TV news anchor in America. That's Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt. 922 in the West. California polls uh, close, but people are still voting. Same thing in Texas, believe it or not. And that has led to some complaints. Cynthia McFadden, who is uh, watching some of the voting process unfolding tonight, uh, has the latest on that. Cynthia, are you somewhere there in the newsroom? I'm somewhere here. This is our big uh, NBC Vote Watch team that you're seeing behind me uh, that's been following up on complaints and concerns about voting systems around the country uh, all day today. So, uh, Texas and and California are but two of the eight states who have significantly new voting system changes since 2016. You see them there. Interestingly, of all the complaints that we've run down, probably the most significant are these long lines in both California and Texas, which, you know, effectively is a is a restriction on people's right to vote. I mean, standing in line for two and three hours, sometimes after the polls have closed, is a problem. Um, also want to point out that Bernie Sanders' campaign, uh, Bernie 2020, has filed uh, a complaint and a demand for injunctive relief uh, tonight against the L.A. County Registrar. Uh, and it's it's a very damning uh, complaint about the way the system in Los Angeles County has rolled out. I'm just going to read you a line. The new technology has resulted in problems because of check-in stations not working, machine failures with insufficient or overwhelmed tech support and an inability to implement backups. They then go on for nearly two dozen 
particular complaints about polling problems today. Uh, it, it shows both the, uh, the level of frustration and maybe the depth of the Sanders campaign. I mean, coming up with all of this really required uh, uh, vote watchers in uh, a wide variety of jurisdictions tonight. Uh, I want to just say two more things that we've noticed. Uh, clawing back your vote. We have heard from people all over the country tonight saying that they wanted to re-vote because they voted for candidates that are no longer on the ballot. Um, Savannah, the legal research says basically can't do it. No, you, you say you vote early and often. No, vote once and that's it. You don't get to claw back the vote. All right, Cynthia, very fascinating. Bernie Sanders not pleased with how things are unfolding in Texas and I'm and sure California. some of those voters aren't happy on a school night being uh, you know, late in line uh, trying to vote. Absolutely not. Uh, we will continue our vote watch tonight as our Super Tuesday coverage rolls on. We're back in a few. Today, family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. in Texas remain to be called tonight. Too close to call in Texas. Too early to call in California. As I turn to you, Chuck Todd, at the beginning of the night, we laid it out. You said it's not just about who wins the states. Mm -hmm. It's about who gets delegates. And you have to get 15 percent in a given state to get any delegates at all. We call that viability. So let us have it. Who made viability where tonight? Well, most importantly, Biden and Bernie made it everywhere. Biden was, you know, even the made viability in Vermont. Bernie made barely, but made viability in Alabama. Those are the two extremes for the two of them, but they made it everywhere. But in the Bloomberg versus Warren, who is going to make more, more thresholds right now? Warren made it in Maine, Massachusetts, Colorado, and Utah. Uh, in Bloomberg, California, Tennessee, Arkansas, Colorado, Minnesota, Texas, Utah. So he got right. six to Warren's four. Short okay. break. We'll be right back. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. White terrorism, 
And white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Oh, what a night, Super Tuesday. A lot of delegates at stake. So let's see how it's all shaking out at 12.30 Eastern Time, 9.30 in the West. And it's been a big one for Joe Biden. Not a lot of people saw this one coming, but he's really run up the margins in some states in the South. And his delegates uh, count it's definitely shot up tonight. Bernie Sanders hot on his trail, hoping that California and Texas perhaps will pay off with some delegates. These are the states that Biden won tonight. Sanders is on the map as well with Colorado, Utah, and Vermont. Let's uh, take a look at California. California again, it is uh, still characterized as too early to call. About a quarter of the vote is in. Uh, Sanders has been uh, expected to do well in California, but we'll see how these numbers uh, bear out. Texas, uh, too close to call, and you can see it right there, a difference of uh, 31 a thousand votes close to call uh, in Maine. Also too close to call. Ninety percent of the vote in here, but uh, a twenty seven hundred vote add difference. Two more states. I mean, look, we've been following Maine and Texas all night, guys. And his lead is creep, Biden crept up. to creep up in Texas. By the way, so you need so folks know about the way this delegate split works in Texas. So right now it's very close. And what does winning mean? It's basically the difference between getting an extra seven delegates. So out of 200, look at it, 228 because delegates. Because it's so close, they're going to share so them. It's so close, they'll split a lot of the delegates in a lot of. <clears throat> but basically, winning does give you a few extra. And in this case, by our math here, if Biden hangs on to win, it, it, it'll allow him to net a seven extra. If, if Bernie got in there, he'd net an extra seven out of it. But it, it that's what winning and losing a primary means in this. Um, in this uh, proportional system. The bragging system. rights are priceless. It looks awfully good on that map, yeah. right? If that turns blue for Biden, look at how that blue gets really blue over there. Uh, that's a powerful statement, uh, a blue Texas, especially if you're going to have a, a purple California or a fuchsia California, whatever color we're going to call the Sanders. Name. All right, so a good night for Biden. What does he do with it now? Let's go to uh, Kristen Welker in Los Angeles. What's the plan for the campaign after tonight? Well, they need to capitalize on this momentum, Lester. There's no doubt about that. And I just spoke with one Biden advisor who said that is exactly what they plan to do. Look, since South Carolina, they have raised $15 million in donations. So just in about three days, they're expecting that type of energy and momentum just to build on itself. Before the votes were even cast today, they had announced an ad buy in the next states to vote, including Michigan. And so they are looking to those types of opportunities. They expect to have a robust fundraising hall overnight. But look, as one advisor said to me, it's really about the narrative. You cannot buy the type of momentum that happened inside the Biden campaign since that blowout we all witnessed in South Carolina when you then had those other candidates, Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, dropping out of the race and then moving to endorse him quite quickly helping him to net these victories tonight in places like Minnesota. And so that is the type of momentum that the campaign will try to build on. As I mentioned earlier, they did schedule an event tomorrow here in California. You can expect more of them in the next states to vote. One ally of the campaign said to me they were expecting Biden to do well tonight, to basically survive. And this has exceeded all of their expectations. You saw that in the victory lap that Biden took himself. He said this campaign is very much alive, despite the fact that we've been counted out. And just in talking to his supporters, they think that's the key, Lester, that Biden himself needs to continue to have this type of energy and fire moving forward. Lester, All right, Savannah. Kristen Welker, as they continue to dismantle the uh, set behind you there. Thank you. But they're not dismantling the voting because uh, it's still going on. The polls closed in California about an hour and a half ago. Joe Fryer's in L.A. County as well. But people have been lining up. And if they were in line in time, Joe, they can still vote. And so that's what's happening. 
Yeah, that's right. The polls closed over an hour and a half ago, but not really because they're still here. You can see there are people still in line. The folks who are at the front of this line here, I'd say have been here about two and a half hours now are finally getting a chance to cast their ballots, and they're not the only ones. Even though the polls closed over an hour and a half ago, we still have a line here. Before 8 o'clock, the line went out the door, but at 8 o'clock, they shut those doors and brought everyone in. And you can see here's the end of the line. These are the folks who made it in just before 8 o'clock, so they're able to cast their votes. What is going on here in L.A. County? Well, you can take a look at what all these people are looking at, and that is the voting booths here. It's this new technology they're using this year. It's the touchscreen technology. But you can see of the 15 booths here, not all of them are full, and that has been the seed throughout much of the day. There's been various glitches and malfunctions with some of these machines throughout L.A. County. That's been one problem. It's also just taking a lot of time to check people in so they can actually get to those machines. We've had high voter turnout. And there's another issue going on today in L.A. County, and that's that last time people voted, there were thousands of options, thousands of polling locations, and you'd go to the one in your neighborhood. Well, this year they tried something new. They created these sort of larger polling centers, these voting centers, but there are fewer of them, just shy of a thousand of them. The thing is, you could go to any one you want, though, in the county. That's the pro. The con is that there's fewer of them, so that might be another reason why we're seeing so many people waiting here to cast their vote well after the polls closed. Back to you guys. All right, Joe Fire, thank you very much. Blaine Alexander is in El Paso, Texas, where we're seeing a, a very similar issue with people still waiting in line uh, long after the polls closed. Blaine? Three hours almost, Lester. That's how long some people were waiting in line. The good news is I just spoke with an official here at the elections board, and I found out that all of the people in El Paso, El Paso County have boasted, voted. What we're looking at right now is the aftermath. This is the processing center, people coming in from the polls and essentially bringing in all of their materials, bringing in ballots, different things like that. So we already know that early voting numbers are far above what we saw in 2016, and it looks like in-person numbers are shaping up to be that way, too. Um, I want to talk to you guys because I know that you were actually working at some of those polls, and you said that the number, the turnout, was much higher than you expected. Yeah, um, we had a good uh, rush after 5 p.m., and then it continued up to 7. Yeah, we had to stay late. A lot of people were patient enough to hang around till about 8, 8.30, till we got the last voter. 8 or 8.30, and that's when the last people cast their votes. Yes. Yeah, I really appreciate that, that. So that really, again, gives you a sense of just how many people were waiting in line. But again, we were hearing reports, seeing reports reports, again, of people waiting three-plus hours after the end of voting, after polls close. Now, just to give you a little bit of a snapshot, we know the early voting numbers were at about 42,000. That's higher than we saw last time. And keep in mind, guys, it was a very rainy day outside, storming. There was some question over whether that would affect turnout. But as you can see from the people who were coming in here with the materials, certainly a lot of people have come out to vote. It just doesn't appear that, again, those new systems were expecting quite a big turnout, guys. All right, Blaine Alexander and Al Pass a lot of dedication of people to sit there and wait in line and really wanting to cast their votes. Let's turn to David Pleff. He was the architect of Barack Obama's victory in 2008 as his campaign manager. And we're still on Super Tuesday, but I can't help it. I'm looking at the calendar, David, and I know you are, too. The, where the, the next states are that vote, is this favorable terrain for Joe Biden? I do know that in two weeks, 60 percent of the delegates in this party will be chosen. Well, after the last 72 hours, we should be careful about overly predicting things. But yeah. if you're just look at the results today, the demographic strengths the candidates showed and weaknesses. States like Florida, uh, states like um, Georgia, uh, states like Mississippi could be the types of states where Joe Biden wins by, if not landslides, big margins. And Chuck was talking earlier about, you know, the winner in Texas gets seven extra delegates because it's close. Right. But if you win by 20, 25, 30 points, that's how you make big delegates. So the states where I think, let's say Bernie Sanders were to win a Washington state, which is now a primary, not a caucus, uh, Michigan, where he won last time, the margin will be. So, yes. The other thing I'd say is now that the dust is settled on this, you're going to try and win as many votes and delegates as you can in the primaries. But. Let's say Michael Bloomberg gets out. The pledged delegates he got tonight mm -hmm. from American Samoa and a few other places are free agents. What if this is a thing that goes to the convention? These candidates have to start working superdelegates. So the complexity of the campaign, actually, we had to get superdelegates in 08, as you probably remember. Oh, to get. I know. I can't believe real, you said the word superdelegate. It's kind of a pain in the rear because yeah. it's easier in a way to run the election in can, states. Can I just yeah. follow up yeah. on something you Brent mentioned? We talked about the move. You just talked about some states, oh, that's now a primary state. 
This has hurt Bernie Sanders. The move from caucuses Absolutely. primary. Big time. Minnesota was caucuses. Bernie ran him going, uh, won him going away last mm-hmm. time. He loses Minnesota tonight. Maine, caucus state for years. Tonight it's a primary. Looks like Joe Biden may Colorado. sneak it out. Colorado. Colorado is a state that basically, had they voted today, I don't know if Bernie wins it. I mean, you see a lot of evidence. You see a lot of evidence. Colorado shows you where the race was a week ago. It's actually a fascinating little sort of frozen in time Mm -hmm. because it was an all-male ballot. But the point is, this entire move, the the move from caucuses to primaries in particular has hurt Sanders. Which is going to be accelerated after the Iowa experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So so, so if... Let's walk through if Bloomberg decides to get out of the race right away. What's the immediate impact? Well, if I were to, again, we should be careful about predictions, but I think it's fairly safe to say 75 to 80 percent of the Bloomberg vote goes to Biden. So as you look at the rest of the states, if Bloomberg were to get out this week, March 10th, March 17th, March 24th is the critical primary of Georgia. If you kind of roughly approximate what Biden got today and apply it to those states and add 75 to 80 percent of what Bloomberg got, um, he looks even stronger. So that's where I think when this there's a question, would this be better for Biden or Sanders to get to a two-person race as quickly as possible. I think Biden's got a much higher ceiling right now than Sanders. So if I were the Biden campaign, I'd want to get to a two-person race as quickly Quick as question. possible, including more. Does it hurt Biden to be embraced by Bloomberg? He was so helped by Amy Klobuchar, by Beto, Beto O'Rourke, by Buttigieg. But does it give him the more of the establishment label, the billionaire label? Does it help arm Bernie Sanders in his... And his support? It might, rhetorically. But if you look at the math, the votes Biden would pick up in states for Bloomberg not being in the race are worth whatever is happening and he there. Needs the money. I think the other question going forward that's fascinating is so Biden, 72 hours ago, uh, we weren't sure he'd survive. Now I think it's hard to argue that he's probably not. If not a clear national front runner, you'd rather be him than Sanders. And how does he wear the mantle of front runner in the next well two or three weeks? Time. That's exactly right. Now yeah. it's back on. And the target's back on as well in terms of, the, yeah, you know, Sanders, but also <laughs> President Trump, you know, who's already racing to get the general election yeah. underway. David Fluff, always good to have you with yeah. us. Our coverage continues right after this. Oh, we got our very own Today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Oh. Universal We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now.
down to a handful of states right now. We're looking at Texas, where uh, uh, officially we're calling it too close to call. 65 percent of the vote in uh, Biden has uh, uh, worked out to about a 37,000 vote lead. Here's what it looks like in California right now. Remember, 415 delegates. This is the huge prize of the nice night. Too early to call. A little over a quarter of the vote in in California. All right, let's go to Maine. That's the other one we're watching and aren't able to call yet. Too close to call with 91 percent of the vote in. But this is another one of those states that turns out to be a surprise as Biden comes roaring back. And here are the delegates won so far tonight, as you can see, Biden in the lead. But California was what Sanders was really counting on, hoping to run up some margins there. And as Lester just mentioned, we do await the vote there and maybe waiting for weeks. Well, we oh, in, in California, we're going <laughs> yeah. to wait for weeks. But, you know, one of the things we want to do that, we, we've got, we're worrying about the winners, but we keep talking about, you love the 15% of Anadine. I do love the 15%. Dove. So there's ways to watch this still, even as we've called a race. In Alabama, we are waiting to see. Sanders is sitting at 16.1%. 60% have reported. There's still more vote to come in. He drops below 15. Guess who wins all 52 delegates if that potentially happens? Not quite all. He is going to get a delegate or two in a congressional district, but that just shows you there. Let me take you back to Maine here. Let's get over here. In Maine, I want to show you a viability watch here. Elizabeth Warren, we round it up, but it's 16.9. She should hang in there above 15, but we still have vote to count there. So that's something to watch. Let me move to Tennessee. This is a Bloomberg viability situation. He was closer to 20 when this when the early vote came in. We've been watching him sitting at, at 16. He's been dropping. Does it drop below 15 when it comes? We're seeing a similar situation here in Arkansas. Bloomberg sitting at 17. We still got a quarter of the vote out there. I'll take you up to two more spots here where this viability thing matters a lot. Minnesota, Warren, look at this. She is right on viability there at 15. Obviously, she falls below. That just adds more delegates to Biden's total there. And then let's go to the race we've been watching all night. And it's We've been curious here between Biden and Sanders, and that's close, and that's going to remain close. And I told you that's a seven-delegate swing. However, it's the Bloomberg number sitting at 17 percent. And this is another one. He overperformed. Basically, he did not make threshold with today's vote. He is below threshold in today's vote, somewhere around 13 percent. But he was way above threshold in the early vote. Mm -hmm. We have seen a massive turnout in Texas. All night long, this number's been sinking with Bloomberg. Again, this would add a, a big chunk of delegates, you know, a good chunk of delegates to the winning side. And right now, that would be Biden if Bloomberg doesn't make threshold. You know, it's interesting, the volatility of this race, because even though there is early voting and in, uh, in February it started in uh, California, so they've been voting for weeks, but more than is common, a lot of voters were holding on to their ballots. By the way, they didn't want to vote because they weren't sure by the way, good for who the to voter. vote for. Good for the voter, but what's the Democratic Party thinking about having these early vote like this? I mean, we've been hearing this complaint. Cynthia talked about, you know, I want to get my vote back. I think this... Well, the theory is to have more people yeah, vote, isn't but, it? But in, in a presidential race where people can especially can drop out at any given time and suddenly you throw your vote away, they, they probably ought to limit the amount of early vote and absentee when it comes to presidential primary. Well, but then you have people in Texas and California still waiting in line. So maybe that's an argument yeah, yeah. for, for mailing in your ballot. I yeah, don't know. I don't know. And we continue to watch California and Texas uh, as those numbers come in rather slow. We're going to take a break and be back with more of our coverage of this Super Tuesday. Actually, it's Wednesday where it's we Wednesday. are. But let's not, let's not get to technicalities. We'll be right Wonderful back. Wednesday. <laughs> White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al-Qaeda or ISIS. 
It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we yeah. have our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Almost 1 a.m. in the East, but who's counting? California, that's who's counting. The delegates are up for grabs, 415 of them, but it is too early to call with a, a little over a quarter of the vote in and Michael Bloomberg at 19 percent, but we'll see if that holds. Can we remind people it is going to be two weeks on California. We're not making that up. That is going to take that long to get all this. Is vote this in. when I tell Chuck it, we're going to stay on the air for two weeks? Yeah, yeah. Is, it, is that for the, the, the vote or for the action for the delegate yeah. allocation? Everything, because you got to get all the all the vote in. And, you know, one of the reasons why don't forget California is voting on everything today. Their congressional primaries are today. So there's a there's more than if it were just the presidential primary, you get in and get out. Yeah. But there's a whole long ballot today yep. that they're voting. A lot, a lot of pundits weighing in on this, including the president and Hallie Jackson <laughs> has, uh, has that for us. Hallie. Yeah, and it's it's uh, a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B here. In the last couple of minutes, we had seen the president earlier in the evening go after the people who clearly were not having the best night, right? Mike Bloomberg and Elizabeth Warren. Now he's he's going after Joe Biden a little bit. He's retweeting this moment that happened uh, at at the former vice president's speech earlier this evening, where he, in a lighthearted way, mixed up his his wife and his sister. They had switched sides, et cetera. The president sort of retweeting that video uh, with some question marks around it. He is also retweeting some supporters who are trying to sow divisions here between Senator Bernie Sanders and Senator Elizabeth Warren. Why might this be? Because, listen, for Donald Trump and for his campaign, democratic chaos is a good thing for them. So the longer that President Trump is able to raise these questions about Senator Sanders and continue to do as he's been doing, which is to say that the Democratic establishment is rigging yet again this nomination against Senator Sanders, the better off it is for President Trump and his team, they think. 
I called it pundit. You could say trolling also. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's a late night for the president on the Twitter machine. Maria Teresa Kumar is here. It's good to have you back. And, uh, you know, we we talked a lot about Bernie Sanders, his efforts to recruit Latino voters. What else are you watching tonight? I'm also interested to see where do the folks that Elizabeth Warren, where she's actually bringing in, and I believe that she's going to be the bridge candidate. And I believe that because she's the one that is the few of the folks that could actually expand the electoral base for Joe Biden that he's going to need. He's the she's the one that a lot of women, regardless of race, really, really like, but are a little afraid to vote for her. So in California, I want to see how many delegates that she gets and how are people going to start courting her? Because I think that that's going to be an interesting piece for Biden specifically. And quite frankly, why Bernie wanted her to drop out, because he thought that he would coalesce that vote. And Savannah, of mm-hmm. course, asked, asked Klobuchar this morning on Today, or yesterday morning on Today, <laughs> you know, how did we end up with two older white guys in their 70s? <laughs> the most diverse. I did say what, that. You know, what happened to the women that we use? Right. You asked it much nicer. You know, I hope so. I know. My Early morning, too. Yeah, there's two guys in their 70s, and... Right. Uh, no women think, left. But I think what this Other is demonstrating, yeah, but I think what's demonstrating is is that the that at the end of the day, these voters are pragmatic. They want to, they don't want a revolution. They want to say, who can beat Trump? And that is what they're actually no. going to do. We get to have our very own Today Family Getaway. Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Yeah. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. in the East as we continue our coverage of Super Tuesday. Andrea Mitchell, uh, so many storylines tonight. What what has stood out for you so far in terms of what tomorrow's headline will be? Well, first of all, Joe Biden winning in states like Alabama where he never even campaigned, didn't spend a dime. Uh, Mike Bloom, Bloomberg spending, you know, $500 million and so far 10 delegates, so $50 million of delegate. That's a pretty high price to pay and most likely having to get out tomorrow. Bernie Sanders, uh, with a speech that wasn't as aggressive as might have, been, might have been, he didn't name check Joe Biden, even though he criticized him for, you know, his vote on trade, on NAFTA, his trade, his vote for the Iraq war. Mm. So we, it's now a two-person race. And what kind of race is this going to be? And the decline of war. Yeah. We'll continue to discuss it and uh, look at the numbers as they continue to come in after a break.
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, and pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Ten p.m. Pacific time as we uh, continue to watch results trickle in on Decision 2020 Super Tuesday. Yeah, it's going to be one for the record books. People are going to be talking about this for a long time because of the big comeback of Joe Biden. And let's go right to the numbers. We've got California in a race that it is is just too early to call, but Sanders is leading as expected. The question for him tonight, Chuck, how big is that margin going to be? How many well, delegates, delegates will he walk away with? You know, look, we are a long. The, this has all been early vote that got dumped in first. You can tell because Bloomberg started off in second and ever as more vote gets added in, as you see more same day vote get in, you start to see Bloomberg's numbers sink. To watch is to see, will Bloomberg or Warren, one or both of them make stay above 15%? That's key to whether Biden can keep Sanders from getting a delegate hall of more than $100. If, they, if Bloomberg and Warren get up to 15%, they start digging into taking Bernie. a bite out of Biden and Sanders. Let's go to Texas. Too close to call in that race. There have been some but, polling issues there. Yeah. And folks still voting, I mean, almost four hours after the polls closed. I'll I tell you, though, this is, an, this is another one, the early vote versus the same-day vote. The early vote, uh, Sanders won by 11 points. The same-day vote, Biden won by 11 points. And the question all night has been, what pot was bigger, the early vote or today's <laughs> vote? And it appears it is today's vote, which is why Biden's ahead. Um, with what's remaining, look, it's, it's still pretty close. But, you know, I would say stay close to your television if you're interested in figuring out who's going to win Texas here, because that's, a, that's been one we've been watching all night. The other thing to watch out for there is Bloomberg, 16 percent. There it is, Savannah. He's at 16.1. If it's 30 percent of the vote still out, he could very easily dip below 15. That would be a little bit of an accelerant if Biden holds on. That'd be good news for Joe Biden. And let's go to Maine. This is the, the last three states that we're hoping to get a result from. It's too close to call there. Uh, is this a state you think you might be able to call tonight? Um, the, the all depends on if they're still up counting their vote. Our friends in Maine. <laughs> 91% uh, right now. It, it's been at 91% for a long time. Okay. Trust me, I've been looking at that. I think we've been at 91% for about an hour or so. Uh, Warren is the only one you wonder. She's technically at 16.6%. I don't think, we think there's about 30,000 more votes to be counted total. So, you know, I guess if they all went to Biden and Sanders and not Warren, she could dip below the threshold there, which would be uh, an additive to either Biden or Sanders. Whoever. Let's take you through some of the, uh, the, the races that have been called earlier. Uh, North Carolina, uh, Biden, the projected winner there by a large margin. Uh, Virginia, that was uh, one of the, if not the first call of the night uh, for Biden. Uh, he wins. You can see Sanders, though, certainly is, is viable. Um, moving on to Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren's home state. She uh, comes in third as Joe Biden uh, picks up Massachusetts. Let's go to Minnesota. Here is a result that Joe Biden should send a card to Amy Klobuchar for. She dropped out of the race yesterday, immediately endorsed him, and looks like she brought him over the finish line in Minnesota. But uh, Look at that Elizabeth Warren number. Yes, That's what we're watching, actually. She is teetering on viability, teetering on whether or not she'll get delegates. And if she does get delegates, I guess people presume they'll come from Bernie Sanders, but we never can be sure. No, but if she dips below, that obviously becomes uh, added value for Biden. I hope people are noticing, by the way, as we go through this, Look at these winning numbers. The, the Biden has got more places where he's been 40 or almost at 40 or above 40. We're going to see one of those next here when you guys go to the boards here. Yeah, Tennessee. Now, they, they obviously have had a very rough day there. A tornado tore through Nashville. There's been widespread damage there. They actually kept the polls open an hour later so that people could vote uh, Biden the projected winner there. And again, Bloomberg. 
right at viability with 15% of the vote still to be counted. And Alabama, now here's a place where uh, Biden's really running up the score and getting a lot of delegates. Uh, Bloomberg spent some time, some money there, uh, but it did not pay off. This is Sanders' worst showing where he made viability. He's made viability everywhere. But this was his worst showing. Joe Biden's worst showing was in Vermont. Let's walk you through Oklahoma numbers now. Uh, there were 37 delegates there, 87 percent in uh, Biden, the projected winner at 39 uh, percent. You're right. We're seeing a lot of consistent numbers in that range. Bloomberg falls below threshold already there. That's a big bonus for Biden. Arkansas, uh, Biden, uh, the projected winner there with uh, 40 percent, uh, Sanders at 22. You showed it. I want to show the you, map. Yeah, can you show that map? Because there's it, a little pink mark on it. It does. It just sort of shows this. you everything you need to know about Sanders. I mean, that little, <laughs> that, the future there. OK, if, if you know uh, Wu Pig Suey. You know your University of Arkansas, you know your hogs there. When you know, well, you that's know it's Bernie's late County. now. That, yeah, <laughs> Pig Suey. Uh, that, that's your, there's, that tells you everything you need to know about Bernie Sanders. Well, there's a lot South. of vote there because it's accounting for 22%. It, it is, and he does well in these college towns I in general. I lived there for a year in 1992. Arkansas is a classic case where there's yes, just not enough college towns for, for Bernie Sanders. OK, right. let's look at Utah. Uh, Sanders wins there. Wait, wait, oh, Colorado, wait, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, Colorado. Jump the gun. Colorado. Uh, Colorado. Uh, Sanders, uh, the projected winner with 36 percent. Biden at 23. Bloomberg. It looks like all four of them oh, right wow. now. This was a primary that did not take place today. OK, meaning it was, all mail. it was all done in the mail. And this is the frozen in time. Where was the race oh, about five days ago? There you're looking at it. And, and Sanders freight train exactly. nearly unstoppable. This is it, it, it is Bloomberg above threshold. Yeah. Warren still above. It, it's funny how had Colorado voted today, and they've been a sort of a traditional primary where you go to the polls and they've went all mail. This is probably a, a, a little bit of a different result. I still think Sanders would win Colorado, but you'd probably be looking at a more of a two-person race. Okay, and as I just gave away in Utah, Sanders won there, but Bloomberg did get above the threshold. So far, it looks like Biden, Warren, all in contention there for some delegates. So the you know the impact of Utah may not be great. Well, that's what you're bummed if you're Bernie. Here's a state you won. But everybody made threshold. Yeah, so everybody gets a piece of the pie that we talked about all about six hours ago. <laughs> and let's go to Vermont. No surprise here. This is one of our early calls, Bernie Sanders cleaning up in his home state. So it all comes down to delegates. Who gets what? We're still counting. We're going to be counting for a long time. But this is the latest we have tonight on Super Tuesday when a third of the delegates needed to clinch the nomination are being handed out after this election today. And Biden's at the lead. Let's go to hey, Welker. Hey, you know what that says? We've got a race. Yeah, we've we do. Got, we've got a real race here. Yeah, Kristen Welker in Los Angeles, Biden headquarters, where we heard from the vice president a little bit earlier. Uh, and, and they're planning on another event there. They're feeling good. They're feeling good, Savannah. They want to build on the momentum tonight, so they are holding an event here in Los Angeles tomorrow, one that they just announced late this evening. The former vice president declaring victory after an evening that exceeded really his own expectations. He acknowledged the fact that a lot of folks thought his campaign was dead. He said, we are very much alive. They don't call it Super Tuesday for nothing. He was fired up. He tried to energize his supporters. I've been talking to campaign officials who are trying to make the case that tonight proves that it is Joe Biden who is the enthusiasm candidate, that he was able to drive out the vote today, to drive out African-American voters, suburban voters. Take a listen to a little bit more of what Joe Biden had to say to supporters tonight. Just a few days ago, the press and the pundits had declared the campaign dead. And then came South Carolina, and they had something to say about it. And we're told, well, when he got to Super Tuesday, it'd be over. Well, it may be over for the other guy. Yeah. Tell that to the folks in Virginia, yeah. North Carolina, yeah. Alabama, yeah. Tennessee, yeah. Oklahoma, yeah. Arkansas, yeah. Minnesota, yeah. and maybe even Massachusetts. It's too close to call. We're still waiting for Texas and California, a few other small states to come in. But it's looking good. So I'm here to report.
report, we are very much alive. One Biden ally telling me that tonight is so encouraging because it looks a lot like 2018 and also the Obama years when there were big victories fueled by African-American voters, by suburban voters, that coalition. So the former vice president will try to build on all of this momentum. His supporters say the way to do that is to continue to show the fire and energy that he had tonight and that he had after his big night in South Carolina. Savannah and Lester. All right. Kristen Walker in Los Angeles. Thank you. Casey Hunt is with the Sanders camp. We heard from the candidate a short while ago. Actually, it's been a couple of hours. Are they talking about uh, tomorrow and, and what, what, what happens next? Well, Lester, the Bernie Sanders campaign is one that was built from the beginning to go the distance. This was a campaign that always expected to be fighting all the way to the Democratic convention in Milwaukee. And so uh, that is still their posture tonight. They are uh, framing this now uh, as a race essentially between two candidates. And Bernie Sanders did put uh, significant wins on the board tonight. He is in this delegate fight. Uh, but, of course, it's not uh, what they thought it maybe could be just a week and a half ago when they thought it was possible that he could build uh, a delegate lead that would be insurmountable. Uh, that is clearly something that they're not expecting uh, any longer, despite the fact that they still are waiting on some better news, they hope, uh, out of California, where they have really uh, invested quite a bit. But uh, this already uh, being framed, the candidate himself, Bernie Sanders, appearing on stage with his family. Uh, and while he didn't mention Joe Biden by name, he did make uh, some points and contrasts that I think you're going to hear from him uh, as this unfolds. He talks about uh, how a candidate uh, from the uh, present, not the past, is required, that the politics of the past are not going to be what it takes uh, to beat Donald Trump. I think you're going to see him contrasting his own judgment with what he says is Joe Biden's uh, different judgment on major issues for Democrats like the Iraq war and trade. Savannah Lester. All right, Casey, thank you. Let's turn to Chuck, who's got a deep dive into Texas. What, what are you doing over there? Oh, we got some fun toys and we're, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a too close to call and we've got some fun toys here, right? So here you have, you've got an idea of, of where, and can give you a sense of where the big leads are for each one. So these blue bubbles here where Biden's doing better. This doesn't surprise people. Houston, the suburbs, right? Dallas, the suburbs. Here's a shock. Austin is where Bernie Sanders does well. More liberal area, right? San Antonio has been doing well. Latino voters. El Paso, again, Latino voters. You see these little bubbles here on the border there. So you, you sort of see that. So now let's go to missing vote. Hmm. You got to feel pretty good. Look at all the San Antonio missing vote, as I showed you before. Again, this is an area that Sanders has overperformed and, and missing voters from there. That might be good news for Sanders as things go. We shall see. But you see these pockets of missing votes, too. Some of that stuff looks like it's in good Biden I'm glad territory. You mentioned there. the Houston so. area because Garrett Hake is actually there, and this is really astonishing. But it because is. of some, I don't know, crowding at the polls, Garrett, you can explain what's happened here. But even though the polls closed literally hours and hours ago, there were people lined up still waiting to vote because if they were in line when the polls closed, they were then permitted to vote. Yeah, Savannah, the polls have been closed here for five hours. I've talked to voters who've been here for six. They were in line when the polls closed. We're on the campus of Texas Southern University. It's a historically black college in Southern Houston. This is a new polling place. And basically everything here went wrong today. I was told machines broke down. There were not enough volunteers to check IDs. And it turned into almost a war of attrition to get people to stay. I'm going to bring in Marcia. You were here all day. Day. You said it was almost like working a like whole a shift. Yeah. You're smiling. I'm like furious for you that this happened today. What went on in there? I really don't know what went on. I just know we came because we were determined to have the opportunity to vote and make our voices heard. We stood in line and we kept hearing, you know, there's machines coming. We didn't know if there were things were broken. We weren't given a lot of details. We were given lots of pizza, lots of cookies. That's probably part of the reason I'm smiling. But um, I really don't know. We started out with the understanding that there were 10 um, Boots, mm -hmm. and then someone came around and said we have 14 more coming, um, and 
but no one ever said anything was broken, but there's only two people in there who could receive us. Have you ever had this much trouble voting in Houston, Texas in your life? Never. I mean, Never. You said something to me earlier, the idea that this is what voter suppression it actually looks like. Looks like this on the is, it made me think this, is, this must be what voter suppression looks like. That, that's the only thought that I could come up with. Um, it's kind of sad that, you know, that people would go to, that, to those kinds of lengths. I don't know that that's the case, but it certainly looked like voter suppression to me from my experience. Here. Six hours in line is almost like working a shift. If exactly. you had a child at home or a job to go to or literally anything else pressing to do, well, your I vote goes go away. Go home and pack like I have to. Yes, exactly. But that's the, and that's the thing. It's, a, it's, it's um, sort of a way to discourage the voter. Mm -hmm. It could be very discouraging. We were really fortunate that the climate here that was created among the people did not allow us to be discouraged. But you told me people really banded together in the room, like, we're not going home, we're right. sticking this out. Right, right. It's like homecoming, because we keep seeing all of our neighbors, people keep popping up, and people we haven't seen in years, you know, mm -hmm. it's better than seeing them at a funeral, you well, know, at least it's... Thank you as a Texan for like sticking it out here. Absolutely. What happens if this does not get fixed by November? I don't know, but I do. I am determined to be a, an early voter, right. which is always my intention, but didn't happen this time. Thank you very much. So, guys, there you hear it. A, a horror story told with a smile here. This is not the way this is supposed to work in Texas, a state that has tried to expand early voting and try to make it a little bit easier to vote. That was not the case here tonight at Texas Southern. You know, I'm, I'm with you. I, I feel her frustration, but at the same time, I, I find myself just admiring her determination. Absolutely. You know, it's it's a right face. to vote, and <laughs> doggone it, you know. And that the whole community right there saying, look, yeah. we're going to do it no matter what, to wait in line five, six hours for anything. But I saw Robert's face smile there. You know why? She said, I'm early voting next time. Yeah. You love the bank votes, don't you? You do, but think about who might she have voted for five days ago. Yeah. I mean, again, I think your point about Colorado was oh. that frozen in time yeah. primary. And if you think about it, uh, when we sat in here, Chuck Laston did meet the press. The Texas poll was 34 uh, Sanders, 19 Biden. And like combined Biden Bloomberg was ahead of Sanders. Yeah. So, it, I mean, just it shows you when you vote makes a big difference. Robert, sit tight. You're yep. not going anywhere. We got a lot more to talk to you about. We got to get a break in here. We'll be back right after these messages. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al-Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are going to winnow the field. They're probably going to create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now.
from Las Vegas. From Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we yeah. have our very own Today Family Getaway. Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Yeah. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. It's all about the results, all about the numbers, and all about the delegates. We take a look at uh, some of the latest results. Let's take a look at California. 35% now in. We're still calling this one too early to call. You can see Sanders as a sizable lead. Uh, Texas, that's another one that we're watching very carefully tonight. That's about three quarters of the vote in. 40,000 vote difference between Biden and Sanders. Too close to call. All right, Maine's keeping us late, uh, up late tonight. 91% of the vote in, but it's too close to call. And here is the bottom line. So far tonight, delegates won Biden. 331 earned tonight. Sanders lagging behind a result that I dare say no one saw coming 72 hours ago. Even Chuck Todd. Who knows everything? We did a first read this morning, Carrie Dan, Mark Murray, and myself. We did our projection, and we talked about the really good night for Biden would be down by less than 50 delegates when all is said and done. So we've done some back of the envelope math here. And so right now, it appears that before California, when all is everything allocated, we think Biden is basically got 127 delegate lead going into California. So the question is, what does Sanders need? to cut into that lead or overtake it. And there's sort of two estimations where we're going. So if you, you buy, if you buy a three people make threshold, so let's say Sanders down here in California gets 38 and Biden gets 25 and Warren ends up with 15, all right? Sanders will net 67 delegates over here, okay? He will, he will net 67, cutting in, basically cutting that lead in half, all right? Now, I wish I could just erase everything, but I'm going to do that. So I'm going to put up here, we've got our plus 127. Now, let's say Sanders wins 38, Biden gets 25, but Warren does not make threshold and sits at 14. Well, that would add an additional 15 delegates to Sanders, and it would mean at the end of the night, 27 plus 17, help me out with that number, oops, 27 plus 17 tonight, is 44, I believe. Yep. And so our projection tonight is, at a minimum, worst case scenario, depending on what we see out of California, is that Biden will end up with a 44 delegate lead. And that's, that's, a, that's the best that we think Sanders can do out of California, is hold Biden's lead to less than 50. But Biden would have a delegate lead and that's what we're projecting at this point. Biden's going to have the delegate lead after everything is counted when the night is over. Wow. That in Even though we haven't called Texas and Maine. Haven't called them yet. But you know what the delegate where we think will it's be. going. And what if Sanders win. is winning Texas when you when San Antonio and Austin come Well, in? if he wins Texas, so, you know, you, that, and he gets that seven would, more. you put down, net it 14 down the other way. So then Biden has a 30 delegate lead. The point is, is that Biden's going to have the delegate lead tonight. And, and apologies, none of us answered your math question there. So that's okay. Yeah, I, I noticed know. that because we you know what? It was one of them where you're like, let, we, let, we let, the, let, 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 let the meet the press nerd guy try to. Try to <laughs> so we are watching, uh, you know, certain bellwether counties ab about this election, and and Michigan is is a place that has been uh, uh, is voting next week, and we sent Kate Snow there, who is with voters. They've been watching the same results you've been watching here, and we've been watching to see how it may impact their vote. Here's Kate. Hey guys, we're at Brewery Vivant in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's a really cool brewery built in an old mortuary chapel. Uh, the place was full earlier, filled with Democratic voters. And what was interesting was how divided they still are, even after the results coming in tonight. I can tell you that this county, we're here on purpose because Kent County traditionally has been Republican, a real Republican stronghold. But in recent years, Democrats are gaining here. If you look at the last election, Donald Trump won the county by just nine 
9,000 votes. Compare that to Romney, who won by 22,000 votes. So Democrats gaining ground and looking at tonight's results, trying to decide how to vote next Tuesday. DeAndre's a big Sanders supporter. You're watching the results come in tonight. What are you thinking? Um, I'm just very excited to see the presidential debate. I support Bernie Sanders because he's about criminal justice reform. He's about Medicare for all, um, getting rid of student loans. And those are just matters that are very important to me because we don't see that too much in presidential candidates. What about Joe Biden? You and I were talking earlier about his candidacy and how he won South Carolina, was talking about voters of color. Um, I just don't. Uh, Joe Biden just isn't appealing to me. And I don't like that just because he worked with Barack Obama and he was vice president, that he thinks that black people are going to vote for him just because he worked with Obama. Like, I don't like that. And so I'm just about just fair equalness. And I just like presidential candidates that's actually about all people and just not using the old credibility just because this is a new race. And so we actually need to know that you stand for all people and just not trying to use what you've done in the past to try to bring yourself more credibility to black voters. Thank you, DeAndre. Let me walk over here to Ryan. Um, we got a whole room full of people here in Grand Rapids. Ryan, you've been a Biden supporter, you were telling me, for, yes. for a while now, yes. from the beginning. Yes. So as you watch what's happening tonight, and we seem to be coming down to two candidates, sure. why Biden over Bernie Sanders? Um, I mean, he's had a quality start to, to his campaign, and I think a return to credibility is something that the presidential office needs and that our country needs, and that's something that he can offer, uh, especially going into a debate season with a national campaign and playing that game with Trump, right? We have to see that. Are you excited about a Biden candidacy? Um, I am to an extent. um, I I know that the Sanders campaign has a lot of excitement to it, and I understand that, and the platform that he's running on has a lot of new ideas uh, and can kind of radicalize some of the the party, but um, I think a lot of what Biden stands for and his experience of doing this can help to kind of reunite some of the moderates in this country that feel like they don't have a voice. You said to me before that you're not really looking for excitement right now because you've had enough yes. with President Trump of excitement. <laughs> yes, what you said. Um, Karen, let me go over here. Karen, you're not decided. You've got a week. You're in Michigan. You've got right. to figure this out. What are you looking for? What, I mean, what's going to sway you? I'm not sure. I'm hoping that no one else drops out and I can open up my ballot next Tuesday and vote for somebody who will take it home. We is have is to the get, take it home the key thing? Is it? Is it? Are we, you worried about beating Trump? We need to get rid of him. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 <laughs> who are you most interested in? Being that we're in, we're in Western Michigan here, we're in a, a pretty red county that Trump won by 9,000 votes last time. Who's going to beat Donald Trump? At, if you had to guess today, I don't know. But Grand Rapids is a blue city. East Grand Rapids is a blue city. <laughs> Kent County is actually blue. And I think we can do it. You're hoping. Yes. (laughs) Karen, thank you very much. Mm Interestingly, Elizabeth Warren is already in the state. She's in Michigan tonight. We do expect Michael Bloomberg to come here on Thursday. That is his schedule as of now. And we expect that uh, Biden and Sanders would show up here in the coming days as well. Again, they vote on Tuesday. Back to you. All right, Kate, thank you. Thank you very much. We are joined now by Robert Gibbs, former press secretary to Barack Obama, and Rich Lowry, editor of the National Review and a leading conservative thinker. So there you all sitting together. Peace in in the gallery. (laughs) Right here. Robert, I mean, when you think about how this race is shaping up after tonight, Bernie Sanders isn't going to quit tomorrow. No reason why he should. Can the Democratic Party, looking ahead to Milwaukee, come together because they're facing a real race in November with Donald Trump? Well, I think, and I think that will be a galvanizing factor. Uh, No doubt about it. That, That will ultimately make it easier to put warring factions back together. But I think, uh, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, I think how this campaign is prosecuted over the course of the next few months, um, whoever wins the nomination, how do they include the supporters for the other side uh, uh, in that race into their There's team? There's still is some bad key. feeling from 2016, well, if you talk to Clinton Sanders folks and, about and that. And I think the, the real key is you can't simply expect that because you're the nominee, they're coming over. Right. The the Trump factor will certainly help in that. But there's effort that has to be done in that campaign. uh, Whoever wins it to put that back together to to forcefully heal whatever breach there is, because 
as I said earlier, none of these campaigns are going to be able to do it alone. They've got to unify eventually uh, to be a strong nominee. Rich, this has all been about so much of the conversation has been about electability. Um, you know, the president early on seemed to suggest that it was going to be Biden. And then he's, you know, the, the thought that uh, could be Bernie Sanders. Where do you think they stand right now on who they'd rather take on? Um, most Republicans would rather run against Sanders. Uh, there, there are a lot of insiders, though, who think it's, it's a closer question over which Biden or Sanders is, is more electable or not. I, I'll have to say, though, this could be a real bitter irony for Bernie Sanders. If Chuck is right that Biden's going to come ahead in the delegates, no one's going to vouch for your math at this, okay. this hour. <laughs> this hour. And remember, it, it's back of the envelope. It could be after four years of running continuously since 2016, Bernie's going to be right back in 2016, yeah. where he's a step behind an establishment front runner and probably can't run him down, but is going to get into, if not a contested, at least a contentious convention where he's not going to exactly come, right. come out Rich, the winner. What, is, what does Trump do now? Because in, in, a, in some ways, I think he did write Biden off. I think they mm -hmm. thought, geez, they, 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 they tarnished him up. Now he's this Right. durable guy. And it's like, well, they tried this Hunter stuff. Yeah, you know, maybe it didn't stick. Well, you're going to see fierce mockery of all the gaffes. You've already seen some of that, but it'll even be more intense. And then I think thematically, a big element of the case against Biden, if he's a nominee, will be Washington insider. And if he says anything's wrong about this country, why didn't he fix it the decades he's been in this town? And they're going to investigate to death. The, the Hunter Biden thing is going to, it's already today. I'm not, I'm not as convinced of that. I'm not as convinced of that. We'll leave it there for the moment. Our coverage carries on. We still got three states outstanding. We will give you the results we've got when we come back right after this. White terrorism? And white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we have our very own today family getaway. The 
It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? NBC News Super Tuesday coverage. Let's show you where things stand in the delegate count. Remember, that's what it's all about tonight. It's nice, nice to finish first, but the delegates are most important. Uh, Biden right now with 331 for tonight. Sanders, 241. You can see Warren and, and Bloomberg uh, just behind there. Now, the states that Biden has won, uh, Alabama, Arkansas, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and Virginia. As he said when he spoke earlier, it's been a good night. Uh, Sanders has won three, Colorado, Utah, and Vermont. Let's show you where things stand right now in California. We're far from a call here, too early to call. 35% of the vote in Sanders with a sizable lead there, but that's how they stand. 415 delegates at stake there, so viability is, is huge. Uh, let's, and let's, uh, here's Texas right now, uh, uh, Biden right now. Uh, maintaining a, a lead has actually grown a bit to 50,000. Uh, too close to call is the official characterization. Uh, in Maine, the same story, uh, too close to call. They've got 91 percent in, but as Chuck noted, it's been 91 percent for I quite some time. I think they went time. to bed. I think they went to bed in Bangor and Portland. They God bless them. Well, I think they did. 3,000 <laughs> votes separating the, the, the leaders there. Uh, one of the other big storylines has been the difficulty in voting and people having to stand in long lines long after the polls close. Our Cynthia McFadden has been covering this whole situation for a very long time and can <laughs> kind of hone in on what's been happening. Cynthia? Well, you know, Lester, what we've seen is in both Texas and California, this really serious problem has developed. And if you look at both Los Angeles and Houston as examples, there, there may be some insight of something that they share. Both jurisdictions have changed from those precinct-based systems of the old days where you, you voted at the local school or perhaps uh, a local community center to what they call a one-stop voter cent uh, center, which is a place where you can register to vote and do more services, and anybody can vote in any one of those voter centers. So that's a really uh, a significant change. They've closed a lot of local uh, polling stations in order to create these big voter centers. And if you miscalculate, if you put those big voter centers in the wrong place, if you don't staff them appropriately, if you don't anticipate how many people are coming, you can run into a mess. And a mess, I would argue, is just what we've seen tonight. Let me tell you, in Los Angeles County, we have now had police called uh, this evening to two uh, voter uh, uh, polling locations um, because of disputes about um, precisely what uh, the rules were as regards ongoing uh, voting. People who were in line at 8 o'clock who say that they were told they had to go home and could not vote, police called in two locations. And finally, Maine, my home state, let me tell you, we were told early in the evening tonight that they ran out of Democratic ballots, Chuck. That the <laughs> the uh, Secretary of State said you could photocopy the ballots and vote them, uh, but they'd have to hand count them. That may account for why we've been holding a 91 percent, at least part of it. It shouldn't be this hard. There you go. To vote. No, but you know what? The more technology you introduce, and if we think we streamline it, then, you know, we've there's, got, there's we, extra problems there, right? We, uh, we've got some late word coming in. We're going to break away uh, to Texas. And there it is. Uh, we have done it. Right here. It's just too close to call, but Nothing my understanding more. is uh, NBC News is now projecting that Joe Biden will uh, uh, has won the state of Texas or will win the state of All Texas. Right. Uh, 20 delegates awarded. How big a deal is this? This is, look, I, we said this earlier tonight, right? The symbolic sort of exclamation points on winning or losing the night was, for me, Texas, in particular, Texas was that one where it was the, the Sanders power in the West. You have Biden's power in the South that was meeting in Texas, and Biden pulled it off. You know, and to think he did it with a terrible early vote, uh, an organization that didn't exist, it, it, is a, it is a 
it is an amazing comeback story. Obviously, last night in Dallas, that is that 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 certainly mm -hmm. didn't hurt. But to add Texas to what is already an impressive night, you throw in Maine. I mean, he he, he has. This is a more impressive Super Tuesday than I can think of. It's it's more impressive than. Um, than what Barack Obama put together in 2008 when he you know, used Super Tuesday to sort of grab the delegate lead. This is, this is as consequential of a, of, a, of a night as we've had in any nomination fight. And I, th I think the, the Monday night uh, endorsements in Texas were so critical. Um, the fact that it was in Dallas that Beto O'Rourke was added and they sort of staged it so that he was the surprise at yep. the end. Everyone finally had, had gotten used to the fact that it was going to be Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar. That was a big event in Dallas. A lot of local local press. Um, I misspoke earlier when I said he hadn't been to Texas. He had been to Texas a number of times, but he was locked down in mostly South for, Carolina. Mostly for fundraising. For the, for the last yeah. week because South Carolina was so important for him when the others All were right, there. so Biden adding uh, Texas to his portfolio on this uh, Super Tuesday. We're going to continue our coverage after a break. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to al-Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we have been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway! Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to al-Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like 
something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. So the big headline in the last couple of minutes, uh, the results from Texas, where NBC News projects uh, Joe Biden will win the state of Texas. That's a that's a potentially a big delegate hall. Uh, as we see, Mike Bloomberg still uh, teetering. still teetering, but in the uh, in the viable. so it's 15.6 percent is the actual percentage there. So he's he's sitting at that 16 has been rounded up. So it's 15.6. I'll tell you, our our boiler room, I think it's 50 50 whether he remains viable here, which would then just be a, an extra chunk of delegates for Biden. All right. Joining our little uh, merry band here, uh, Adrian Elrod, who is a Democratic strategist and former senior advisor for Hillary's campaign in 2016. Great to have you with us. Thank you, Lester. Uh, give, give me your thoughts. I mean, uh, is Bernie Sanders feeling a little deja vu here? Um, perhaps. I mean, this is a huge surprise tonight. For many of us who have been watching this race on the outside as strategists, strategists not working on campaigns, um, I've never seen a turnaround like this. I've been working in politics for 25 years. Um, to see where Joe Biden has come, right? And also to see that Bernie Sanders has effectively not grown his base, not grown his coalition since 2016. Um, it, it is truly surprising. This is not anything that we expected. Do you think he retools uh, based on that idea that he hasn't been able to grow his grow the base? Well, you know, I don't know how, how much you, retooling you can do at this point. You know, you may recall, Lester, about six to eight months ago, a lot of us were speculating, what is Bernie Sanders ceiling, right? Is it is it 12 percent? Is it 15 percent? Obviously, we know it's higher than that now at this point. Um, but, you know, when he had the heart attack and then, of course, AOC endorsed him, all of those factors, you know, came, came into play and helped him um, sort of solidify and coalesce the liberal progressive base. But we are now seeing the fact that endorsements matter. Party unification has coalesced around Joe Biden. The event that we saw last night where you saw Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar and Beto O'Rourke come together. And I think you're probably going to see more endorsements for Biden over the next few days. It's quite incredible. And by the way, Jim Clyburn should get whatever job he wants in a <laughs> Biden administration if he ends up, if, of course, if Joe Biden becomes yes, Savannah the Savannah said he'll be getting flowers president. on a regular basis. Exactly, uh, from, exactly. From, exactly. From the Biden camp. Adrian, good to have you here. Uh, we're going to take a short break and be back with more coverage after this. White terrorism? And white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are going to winnow the field. They're probably going to create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. 
Why Is This Happening? with Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Las Vegas, Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. We get to have our very own Today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Welcome back in the Super Tuesday. Here is the delegate count uh, where the uh, the candidates have earned their delegates tonight. Biden uh, well out in front with 346 Sanders behind at 248. Let's take a look at the uh, the By the way, just, come. Yeah. just so people know, we are projecting that Biden is going to have more delegates when all the votes are counted. No matter what happens. No matter what hap happens in California. The question is just how big is his margin? It could be as high as close to 100 as it is right now, or as low as about 44. The graphic you're looking at on the screen, this is a breakdown of the states that will be voting on March 10th. Uh, and you can see, uh, and then March 17th, Arizona, Illinois, Let, Ohio, Let's go. Florida. Can we go back? Let's just go back to the March 10th states, if we can, guys. And then let's go through these very quickly. As a two-person race, and it's going to be the same thing, west to east, north to south. And where you see where Biden is weak versus Biden strong versus Sanders weak, Sanders strong. Sanders will do well in Washington state, will be a very competitive in Idaho, the North Dakota caucuses. But Michigan's going to be an interesting battleground. Missouri and Mississippi should both be strong Biden states there. This could be a wash on delegates on March 10th in those March 17th states. Florida and, Ohio and Illinois should be big potential states for Biden. Arizona and Ohio will be fascinating. Sanders needs to win those states badly, I think, uh, if he's going to keep this, keep Biden from having. Let, a me, uh, let me bring in uh, John Meacham, presidential historian, who joins us now from uh, from Tennessee. First of all, John, uh, we know you guys have suffered a real tragedy there with this uh, tornadoes last night. I hope everything's well with you with your family. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we were lucky and uh, cities resilient and best people in the world. So everything's going to be OK. Well, everyone there in our thoughts, John, uh, let me get your thoughts about what we have witnessed tonight. This is a this is a remarkable turnaround. I, I among many people on the air talking about uh, Biden and do or die Super Tuesday. Um, you know, could he get new life in his campaign and look at what he accomplished today? Yeah. Remember what William Goldman once said about Hollywood, nobody knows anything. And I think that's a, an essential truth. Uh, it's almost Aristotelian uh, in, its, uh, in its power. I, I think this is a, a big night for normalcy. Uh, and that may not be sexy, and it may not fill as many arenas as uh, either the incumbent president or uh, Senator Sanders. But it's an interesting data point in terms of a country for a country that for five years now, really since Trump entered the presidential race in, in 2015, has been on this high speed chase, uh, often running off the road. And I think whatever uh, Vice President Biden's vices are, uh, however conventional it seems, his performance over the past uh, couple of days suggests that there is a desire in the country, and not just in the Democratic Party, I think this is a, a broader message than that, a desire to tap the brakes, try to get our bearings again. Uh, I think enough of us believe in the institutions of government and in the conventions that have governed our politics that we're not quite ready 
to veer from extreme to extreme. All right, John Meacham, always good to talk to you. Thanks for spending a few minutes with us. And Thanks, we'll, we'll take a break and be back with more in a moment. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are going to winnow the field. They're probably going to create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway. Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? We had the call for Texas. Uh, still a couple of states outstanding. Uh, too early to call in California with 36 percent of the vote in. Sanders uh, with the lead there. But this one, uh, this one may take a while. When I say a while, we're talking weeks. Uh, here's the story in Maine. Too close to call. It's been sitting at 91 percent. Uh, 3,000 vote difference between Biden and Sanders, but Biden just uh, barely in front. And here's the delegates won tonight. Biden uh, with a commanding share, 347. I think it's fair to say that the Democratic uh, race for the presidential nomination has been fundamentally reshaped tonight. Uh, Biden, who many had uh, had counted out or certainly thought that his campaign was on life support, uh, making a miraculous recovery tonight. I want to get the final thoughts of uh, Chuck Todd and Andrea Mitchell. Andrea first. Oh. The entire rationale for Bloomberg getting into this race was that Joe Biden was too weak to be the nominee against Donald Trump. That no longer exists. Joe Biden has been resurrected, revived, uh, starting with South Carolina, and he now has to prove himself, now that he's not the underdog, has to prove himself as a front runner, that he can be disciplined, give good speeches, not make mistakes, not give... Uh, Donald Trump more ma ammunition to ridicule him as he was, you know, eagerly trying to do tonight. But it really is a two-person race, and Elizabeth Warren has some tough decisions to make. Bloomberg, I suspect, will be getting out tomorrow. John? Yeah, I do too. I look, I, I, obviously, the, the the big story is is the Joe Biden recovery, but Biden is now the front runner. I mean, you know, we can sit here and say this is a race, but 
grabbing the delegate lead, I mean, it doesn't get easier for Sanders. These states get more conventional Democratic. They look more like states that a conventional Democrat like Biden um, can do, can win. We're talking Illinois, Florida, Georgia, Ohio. I mean, we've talked about this. The fact that Biden, I mean, this is why Bernie had to have the delegate lead coming out of Super Tuesday. He had to be in the lead tonight. The fact that he lost Texas, it's a bit symbolic. They split the votes, but he was hoping to net delegates out of there. And not only is he not going to net delegates out of there, he's, he's, he's lost ground there. So Joe Biden's a front runner, and I don't think Bernie Sanders can catch him. Well, this story will continue to play out. We are going to sign off uh, for now. Of course, there's more coverage on the Today Show and continuing on MSNBC. For Chuck Todd and Andrea Mitchell, I'm Lester Holt, NBC News, New York. Good night, everyone.